Growing Pains by Azure Blade A Scion warrior wakes up on final approach to the planet Earth with some extra memories in her head. Rather than carry out her mission, she decides living by her own rules would be much more fun, only to discover that this Earth was not the one she was expecting. Yebevet, DC Comic Crossover Chapter 1 It was a fairly normal Tuesday for the people of Metropolis or rather what had rapidly become normal after the sudden debut of a man that could fly through the air unassisted, catch bullets, and lift an airplane on his own a couple of years ago. Since then Superman had become a relatively common sight to the citizens of the city of tomorrow, proving that the human race could truly adapt to anything given time. It also helped that the caped Man of Steel had proven friendly and polite to just about everyone, helping with everything from firefighting to catching robbers. The small spherical spaceship crash landing in the middle of the street was decidedly less common and sent people running for cover. When nothing happened for a few minutes, the braver, or more foolish, in the crowd risked getting a better look at the crater and the ship inside of it. The spaceship was rather oddly designed, perfectly round with no visible means of propulsion and only a few lines where the door appeared to be and an opaque purple pane of glass for a window. It was also rather small. It barely looked big enough to fit a single adult. The growing number of spectators flinched back when a hiss of air signaled the ship was opening to reveal. A young child looking curiously around her surroundings. She obviously wasn't human. The fuzzy brown tail twitching behind her proved that, and no one had hair quite that spiky or gravity-defying naturally, but the rest of her looked shockingly similar to a human girl around 12 years old. Her appearance, and the lack of instant hostility, prompted one of the bystanders to call out to her. Excuse me, are you alright? Do you need help? The girl startled like she hadn't noticed the people gathering to stare at her and blushed heavily. Oh right, the natives. She quickly darted back inside her ship and rummaged around until she reappeared with a sheaf of what looked like paper. Ahem! She coughed into her fist and started reading. Greetings people of Earth. I am Califa and I will be conquering your planet today in the name of the Scion race unless you can produce a champion to defeat me. If you cannot then resistance is foo foom Ah, resistance is futile, and I will accept the surrender of your leaders now. She looked around at the stunned faces of the bystanders and smiled widely and innocently. Did you get all that? Silence stretched for a few seconds before a police officer in the crowd decided to act. He strode forward and pulled his gun before hesitantly pointing it at the young-looking girl. Declaration of conquest aside, she still looked like a kid. Get on the ground now. Oh, there's already a champion here? Lucky me! The girl chirped and raised a hand. Faster than the cop could react, an orb of yellow energy formed in her hand and shot forward. It slammed into his handgun and turned the entire thing into a useless mass of molten metal he needed to throw to the ground to avoid getting burned. Everyone looked from the ruined gun back to the alien girl, and then back to the gun. Then the screaming started. Ooh, sometime before, in Earth atmosphere. Waking up in an attack ball after a mental download wasn't an experience I thought I'd ever deal with, and it certainly wasn't one I'd recommend. Brains just weren't meant to handle that much new information that fast, or at least mine wasn't. It didn't help that most of the information, I just didn't care about. Yeah, knowing my new name and race was useful, but I didn't need to know about her childhood or how her father sent her on mission after mission alone, fully expecting her to die at some point because old me didn't meet his expectations. I certainly wasn't going to go back to that abusive asshole. So the first plan after finding out I was an anime character was to hide out on Earth, get strong enough that I could do what I wanted, and then just go exploring. Seriously, Earth was boring. Even DBZ Earth despite the animal people, cyborgs, and random future tech, because outside of the handful of beings like Cell or Bu, nothing really happened there. That changed when I started scanning radio waves looking to see what music was like on the way to my new home and found a talk show being hosted by someone called Vicky Vale. I didn't care about her, but I did care about what her topic was. She was going on about how the appearance of superheroes like Superman, the Flash and Wonder Woman were affecting the world and what it could mean for the future. That meant I wasn't in the DBZ verse. Mashup verse? Who cares? That meant I didn't need to bother with Frisia. Let the space cop Green Lanterns deal with him. Ah, 
That meant Piccolo probably wasn't around. I wanted to meet the grumpy green slug man. It also meant Earth was going to be infinitely more interesting than what I was expecting with at the very least Themyscira and probably Atlantis to explore. And it meant a bunch of people I could fight against that could actually push a scion pretty far. Too bad the strongest of them were heroes and probably wouldn't fight me for real because they were heroes. Unless I was a villain. A plan started coming together in my mind and I didn't bother hiding the grin stretched across my face as the alert for final approach beeped in my pod. Ooh. Metropolis was a really pretty city, I noticed. All the cities I remembered had at least some kind of trash in a corner somewhere, but I didn't see anything like that here. That, and the bright tan stone and glass buildings, made the entire place feel bright. I also managed to catch my reflection in one of the windows, spiky black hair that hung around my shoulders except for a few locks that stuck upward, black bodysuit covered by white armor thankfully without the stupid shoulder pauldron thingies, and rather cute. Even if I didn't like suddenly being a kid, I would grow though, so that was fine. Excuse me, are you alright? Do you need help? A voice suddenly broke me out of my thoughts and I could feel my face heating up. I completely forgot about the people watching me. Thankfully, I already had a plan. Oh right, the natives. I quickly went back to the attack ball and dug around for the troubleshooting manual. Not that the people around me would know that and made my way back and gave my I'm here to conquer you speech, deliberately flubbing a few words to make it seem like I really was as young as I looked. I wanted to fight the heroes a bunch, and having them not hold back or lock me in a hole somewhere meant I wouldn't be able to do that as often. So I planned to be a reoccurring villain that popped up constantly, but wasn't that big of a deal as long as I got what I wanted. And since that would mostly just be a fight it should be pretty easy to give. But I couldn't look like a pushover, or they would start ignoring me. So when the cop pointed his gun at me, I didn't waste a second before turning it into scrap. Then the screaming started, and people started running for their lives. Which was actually kinda annoying given my new, more sensitive ears. I flew around the area a bit, getting used to the fact I could fly, and idly blasting the guns of the few cops brave enough to stand their ground. Don't you have anyone stronger? This is boring. I called down at the masses and fired a few more weak key blasts. That's enough. I think you've caused more than enough destruction. A firm voice demanded from behind me. I turned and felt my heartbeat speed up at the sight of the man flying there. Arms crossed, with a stern expression on his face. It was Superman, right in front of me. A smile of pure happiness split my face. And I was going to fight him. Chapter 2 Superman, though he really preferred to think of himself as Clark Kent, had seen a lot of different reactions to his arrival since he decided to reveal his powers. Hope, fear, resignation and the like were fairly normal, but it was weird to see pure joy from someone who had been attacking the city moments before. Oh hey, you look way stronger than the other guys. And you can fly too. That's great. The young alien chirped, making Superman wish he could talk her down somehow. Fighting children didn't exactly sit right with him. So if this could be resolved peacefully, who are you and why are you attacking the city? Oh, did you not hear? I'm Califa and I'm here to take over the planet. Take over the, was she serious? So you're gonna have to beat me if you wanna stop me. The tailed child suddenly flew forward and punched him in the face, sending him flying backward. Superman winced at the hit and quickly stopped his momentum before he ended up going through a building. Contrary to popular belief, he did feel it whenever someone hit him, at least a little. It just usually never did anything to him. He was also glad that the child, Califa, had only used those orbs on everyone else. That punch would have done some real damage to a normal human. Ooh, I just punched Superman. I just punched Superman. Oh, it did absolutely nothing, and I wasn't holding back so I knew I was screwed, but I didn't care. This was like getting the chance to fight Muhammad Ali or George Foreman, or Mike Tyson in their prime. Even though I knew I was going to lose, just the opportunity was enough for this to be the best moment of my life. I was also so distracted by my thoughts, I failed to follow up after that one hit I almost missed Superman flying back towards me. Weird, I would have thought my key sense would have. Key sense wasn't a natural scion ability. My eyes widened as I remembered that. Huh, wonder how I'd go about learning how to. Thoughts for later. Superman was back. You're kinda tough, huh? I pretended like I didn't know he was a Kryptonian. 
No need for awkward questions later. Just a little. The man of steel replied. Any chance we can talk this out? Come to an agreement? Blah. I knew my physical age would make him hesitate, but I didn't want to just float around talking. So I was going to move this along a tiny bit. Sure. You have to beat me first though. Then I blasted him in the chest with a solid beam of key. That did about as much damage as me punching him, meaning none at all. But it did send him rocketing out of the city where I followed as fast as I could. No need to trash the city during my introduction after all. I caught up to him just when he was recovering and punched him again. Straight into the ground. Superman ended up in a crater while I just hovered overhead. I still couldn't keep the smile off my face. Flying, super strength, and shooting lasers from my hands? That was just way too cool. And an opponent I could give it my all against and not worry about hurting? I couldn't ask for a better introduction to my new abilities. A blue and red blur burst out of the crater and a completely unharmed, if slightly dirtier, Superman was suddenly in front of me still wearing a stern expression. I didn't want him talking more so I flew forward with the intent to punch him in the face, but he caught my fist before it hit like I was a normal human 12-year-old. Then he caught the second one just as easily. I think that's enough of that. I beat you, so let's have that talk now. You didn't beat me. I immediately protested. You didn't even hit me once. He raised an eyebrow and pointedly wiggled my still-captured hands. I didn't need to hit you to beat you, and I'm not going to fight someone that, despite causing a panic, hasn't really hurt anybody. Now then, who sent you and why just you? Internally I was fuming. This was how my first fight was going to end? A few good strikes and then captured like some little kid? No way. So I did something Superman wasn't expecting at all. I poked him in the eye with my tail. He reeled back enough that I was able to bring my foot up and kick him in the jaw, both freeing me and putting a little distance between us. Fine. If you aren't going to fight me, then I'll just have to wreck a few buildings until someone who will fight shows up. With those parting words, I turned back towards the city. I wasn't actually planning on wrecking the place. Maybe blow up a few decorative bits, get Superman to take me seriously, then take things from there. But I didn't even get that far. Instead, I barely heard Superman mutter behind me. Ma always said you had to have a firm hand with children. Huh, wonder what that was Abu. Mac. I yeep. I yelped howled in outrage. He, he just, he spanked me. Do you give up? I turned to face him with fire in my eyes. No, I don't give up. I'm going to dash. He vanished in a blur. Mac. Do you give up? I flew at him ready to pound him so far into the ground they could use it as a well. Mac. Do you give up? I shot key blasts everywhere I thought he would move. Mac, do you give up? I mined the area with tiny orbs of key ready to explode at the slightest touch. Mac, do you give up? I erupted in an omnidirectional surge of key that reduced everything around me to rubble. Mac, 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 do you give up? I, I tried flying away as fast as I could. Mac, I give up already. I cried, screamed, tears flowing out of my eyes and holding onto my butt. Superman appeared in front of me again, this time looking at me with something like sympathy and regret in his eyes. Something told me he had gone through something like this before and didn't like that he was forced to do the same. That look reignited the fire inside me. He ruined my first fight, spanked me like some misbehaving child, and now he felt bad about it? Now that we got that out of the way, I have some questions and you are going to answer them, young lady, he said firmly. Do you want to answer them here? or do you want to land on the ground first? I answered that the best way I knew how. I reared one leg back. Then I kicked him in the balls as hard as I could before sticking my tongue out and flying away. This isn't over. I'm gonna get way stronger, and then I'm gonna beat you up. I promised as I flew into the distance. Superman didn't say anything. He just remained hunched over midair holding himself, but I figured he heard me anyway. Chapter 3 Lightning cracked through the sky as rain poured down steadily, providing the perfect backdrop for my nightly activity, one that any aspiring supervillain would treat with utmost seriousness, plotting how to beat their nemesis. Superman had revealed himself to not be the paragon of truth and justice he pretended to be during our fight. No, instead he was some kind of spank-happy sadist hiding behind the mask of a hero. 
Clearly I had landed in one of those bizarro universes where Superman was secretly evil, and it was up to me to take him down. I blinked as I realized I had gotten a bit excited, and then sat back down to continue cooking dinner in my newfound supervillain lair. Okay, it was a random cave I had found and moved into, but it was a start. Thankfully my attack ball had included a remote that allowed it to autopilot to my location, so I wasn't forced to sleep on the floor even if it meant everything else was just rocks repurposed into furniture and my stove was a campfire. It was still fun though. Camping is way away better when you are tough enough to ignore small sticks and stones poking you constantly. I shook my head. Enough getting distracted. I needed to think of a way to beat up the big blue bully. The problem was, Superman was just too fast for me right now. I had gotten lucky with my cheap shot sneak attack, but otherwise nothing I had tried got close. I hadn't managed to figure out key sense on my own yet either. So I needed to get faster, or get better at hitting things. I thought about the heroes I could potentially train against. The Flash was slower than Superman, right? Ooh, Central City was fine I guess. After Metropolis I had kinda hoped that all the new cities I checked out would be cool and interesting. Gotham was probably going to be filthy, but it at least had a cool aesthetic. But from what I saw of Central City so far was that it was normal. At least the Flash Museum would be pretty neat. Was that built yet? Probably not. Everyone seemed pretty new. Meh. I kinda just wandered down the streets hoping to catch a glimpse of the Flash, but I wasn't getting much luck. So I tried multitasking by practicing sensing other people's key. I wasn't having much luck with that either. Whoa, watch yourself, kid. A hand stopped me from walking forward just as a car passed by in the street. Had I been zoning out that much? Oops. You gotta be careful crossing the street. The man who stopped me continued. And where are your parents? Central is pretty safe, but kids shouldn't be walking around by themselves. Did my entrance not make the news? An alien spaceship attacked Metropolis. I should be famous. Although come to think about it, I didn't see a bunch of cameras around when I showed up. Maybe they didn't have a good picture of me? I can take care of myself? I told the man. Besides, I'm here looking for someone. Oh, going to a costume party? It's a really cool outfit. The tail looks pretty real too. My tail is real. I waved the thing at him for emphasis. And I said I'm looking for a person, not a party. We were starting to draw attention. Pedestrians were whispering between themselves and pointing. While I didn't mind it at first, the longer it went on, the more annoying it got. Crash. Oh hey look a distraction. The sound of something large crumbling to rubble grabbed everyone's attention and I felt it was a perfect excuse to leave. I'm gonna, well, that's just rude. The man I had been talking to vanished before I could ditch him, ignoring that I lifted off the ground and started floating towards the sound from earlier. Good news is I found the flash. Too bad he was fighting that ice villain of his. Shoot, what was his name? Commander Chill? Private Popsicle? Something like that. Anyway, the villain had just robbed a jewelry store and had frozen then shattered a wall during his escape. Now he was taunting the Flash while blasting the ground around him with some kind of frost gun, causing Flash to slide right past him when he tried getting close. It was neat to see a real superhero fight, but I wanted to start training soon. So when Flash slammed into a nearby parked car, I floated over until I was in front of him. Hi there. I'm Califa. I need you to help me. The speedster seemed surprised and kept looking between me and checking up on the villain. Ah, sure mysterious floating monkey kid. But I'm a little busy right now and it's dangerous. So why don't we talk once I take care of Captain Cold there? So that was his name. I knew I was close. Hiding behind kids now. Flash? Not very heroic of you. The ice villain taunted while twirling his cold gun. I'm not hid dash. Look, can we wrap this up already? I've got things to do. I interrupted Flash. So just give up already so we can get going. I think I might have made Captain Cold a bit angry. You know what? I don't want to deal with some random superpowered kids, so why don't you cool off and time out for now? The next thing I knew, I was suddenly covered in some kind of weird ice. Weird because, yeah, it was cold, but I could breathe through it? I don't think you can breathe through normal ice. Still, Captain Cold had trapped me in about an inch of ice, so that meant he attacked me. And that meant he was fair game. I focused my key and exploded it outward shattering the ice and freeing me to both Flash and Captain Cold's surprise. My turn. 
I pitched a sphere of key into the ice villain's chest hard enough to knock him off his feet and into a parked car. If the key orb didn't knock him out of the fight, the cracked ribs from denting the vehicle's doors probably would. He would be fine though. It was only a few bones at most. Okay, now you have to help me. I ordered Flash, grabbing him by the wrist and starting to lead him off. Ugh, sure. He's gonna be okay though, right? He'll be fine. I barely hit him. Unfortunately, Flash refused to leave until Captain Cold got picked up by the cops and an EMT. He was fine just like I promised. His ribs would heal in a few weeks. Ooh, so you want to explain what you need my help for? I don't mind helping, but you've been kind of light on details. I need you to help me get faster. We were in the middle of some random field outside the city limits because I didn't want to be tripping over random people while doing this and frankly, I was surprised the Flash didn't ask sooner. Get faster? I mean I appreciate the thought, but you know not everyone can just do what I do, right? Yeah, but if I'm working my way up to Superman levels of speed, then it just makes sense to train with someone a bit slower, right? And you could help me just get used to keeping up with people faster than me. The speedster opened his mouth to say something when I could practically see the moment his train of thought latched onto something I said. Hold on, Superman is fast but he is not faster than me. I'm the fastest man alive, he protested. Are you sure? I tilted my head doubtfully. I mean Flash was fast but, yes, yes I'm sure. You know what, fine, I'll help you get faster. And we'll do it the fun way. I perked up. Fun way? The Scarlet Speedster nodded sagely. Yep, using the best way there is to get used to moving fast. He walked over to me and slowly reached out one finger, poking me in the forehead. Tag, you're it. I smiled widely and flared my key. It was so on. Ooh, ah, ah, ha. Hey, you're doing better. You almost got me that time. Hours later I was tired, sweaty, exhausted. Not only had I not come close to catching the flash, he hadn't run out of breath the entire time we were training. And this was including the times he had to run back into Central City to help break up a crime while I took a break to recover. It was working though. I was already able to move much faster than when we first started thanks to all the practice I was getting controlling my key. Flash had also given me pointers about my running form when I got too tired to fly. And the biggest improvement was that I figured out key sense. No idea how I managed that last one, but I think it had to do with me constantly trying to find Flash when he sped away and something just clicked. I didn't even realize I had done it until Flash mentioned something. One, one more time. I panted, wiping sweat off my forehead. Sorry, kid. I gotta head back to the city. I've got another appointment. He waved his hands in front of him negatively. But keep up those exercises we started on, and you should be way faster in no time. BFFT, fine. I grudgingly accepted. I was getting hungry anyway. Great. Now take care, and don't do anything dangerous. Don't want a newbie hero biting off more than she can chew too quickly, right? Flash had the audacity to ruffle my hair before vanishing back towards the city in a blur. Wait, hero? I did tell him I was working my way up to take on Superman though? Meh. Oh well. He'll figure it out at some point. Chapter 4. I had a problem. It wasn't even a fun problem like how to get faster so I could punch Flash, or get strong enough to take down evil Superman. It was a boring problem of, I'm sick of eating fire-roasted deer and almost nothing else. Sure it was tasty and when I swung by a lake, I was able to easily grab a few fish. But there was no flavor. It was just boring meat and boring fish. And I already didn't like fish that much. So like I said, a problem. I couldn't exactly go around clearing out restaurants either. The amount of food required to satisfy a scion was far more than a normal person would allow a child to order without either asking where my parents were or at least demanding that I could pay in advance. And I didn't want to have a meal interrupted by someone trying to arrest me. That would be dumb. I guess there was always the option of getting stuff from a supermarket or something and making it myself, but there was another problem there. I had no money. That tended to be a major issue when trying to buy things unless you were a politician or businessman. Then you just took out a loan or asked other people to pay the bill for you. Anyways, I had no money. And I sure as hell wasn't going to rob a grocery store of all things. That was like bottom D tier villainy at best and I had more class than that. So that meant I needed some kind of plan. Ooh, planning didn't go very well. 
I either made them too complicated, like trying to figure out how to manipulate the resuppliers to put everything I wanted on one truck so I could steal that, or just silly once I let my imagination run wild. Not entirely sure where I was going to get a mariachi band with flamethrowers to act as a distraction while I stealthily walked away with everything, when I realized another very simple flaw in my process. I still had no money so I couldn't bribe or hire people, which made my plans useless. That was okay though. I was a smart villain. If I didn't have enough money to complete my plan then I would just have to steal more. That would work. And then I could spend all I wanted finding a flamethrowing music band to help me. Or I could just use the stolen money to buy food. That would make much more sense. I thought about it for a bit before shrugging and leaving that decision to future me. I had a robbery to plan. Ooh, man, I was bad at planning robberies. Well, no, I was great at planning them. It's just when it came to making them realistic, I got a little too enthusiastic. That was fine, though. So what if reality was unable to appreciate my genius? Everything was possible somehow. I would just have to keep working at it. Next, please. I mentally shelved my plans for a volcano fortress and walked up to the teller with a winning smile. No, I wasn't nervous. Why would you think that? It's not like this was my first actual robbery and I had no idea what I was doing. Hello, sweetheart. How can I help you today? The teller asked kindly. A oh, man, why did she have to be nice? And I guess she couldn't see my armor or tail with them covered up by a jacket I grabbed on the way here. Hi, sorry I've never done this before. I said nervously. I'd like to make a withdrawal. Sure thing. Do you have your account number? Um, no I don't have an account number. This is a robbery. I'm robbing you. The teller frowned. I see. Then the door burst open as five men in masks with machine guns rushed in screaming for people to get on the floor. Ooh, she's just a little girl. The teller pleaded with the robber, pointing a gun at my head. I wasn't upset by that. By all appearances, I was indeed a little girl. Wasn't even upset about the gun to the head. It was a good way to motivate the nice teller lady to open the vault. Also, she was apparently one of the people in the bank that could get into the vault. Not sure why she was working a station then. No, I was annoyed because, somehow, someone else decided to rob the same bank I was going to, at the same time. In Metropolis of all places. You might think robbing a bank here would be stupid with the blue bully ready to pop up at any point, but the thing about knowing his secret identity is that I could plan around his absence. I totally didn't get lucky watching the news skimming for something to watch and seeing him standing next to Lois Lane in a conference in Florida yesterday. I don't give a fuck, lady. And unless you want a new hole in her head, keep your mouth shut and keep moving. At least let her go. And it wasn't like these idiots knew Superman was out of town. So they decided, yeah, we can totally rob a bank in Metropolis and get away, despite being totally normal humans with some guns. You listening to me, brat? The jerk jabbed me in the shoulder with his gun. I said get in the vault. Oh neat, that was open now. Not really. Got distracted by how stupid this is. You calling me stupid? That's not what she said. Please. The teller begged again. Shut up. I think she called me stupid. The hell's the world coming to when brats talk back to their betters? I ought to beat the shit out of you to teach you respect, just like dear old dad. He swung the butt of his gun at my jaw, but I was done with this guy. My fingers closed around the plastic-like material and shattered it with a light squeeze. While the two humans were standing slack-jawed at that, I punched the robber in the stomach, lightly, so I didn't kill him. But yeah, he wasn't getting back up. Oh my god, you're a metahuman, teller lady exclaimed once she got over her shock. I frowned. I'm a scion, not a human. Wait, you mean that alien that crash landed in the middle of the city and said you were here to conquer Earth? That's you? Yep. The lady went quiet and looked at the robber face down on the floor. You aren't working with them, are you? She asked softly. No. Why would you think that? Because you said you were robbing the place right before they broke in? She pointed out reasonably. Yeah, no. Not working with them. Kinda mad they ruined my first robbery. Why were you going to commit a robbery in the first place? Because I wanted more food and wasn't going to taint my supervillain reputation by stealing from restaurants. So, the internet said I should. Elite proudly. The internet? Yep, 
I wanted to get more supplies since I wasn't expecting to take more than a couple days taking over your planet. But you need money for that. So I found out from your internet that illegal aliens need to steal your jobs, your women, and your money to get more stuff. I have a job, I'm too young for a wife, but I needed money so I looked up how I'm supposed to steal money. And one place said that most people rob banks for more money. That's. The poor lady had no idea how to deal with my logic. But she shook herself and refocused. Ignoring that for now, there are still four more men with guns out there. We need to hide until the police show up. I shrugged and walked into the vault where I started stuffing random bills into various pockets. You can do that. I'm just gonna take this and leave. You're still robbing us? Well, yeah. I still want food. You can't just take things that belong to other people. Sure I can. Science do it all the time back home. Probably. By then I had loaded up a few thousand dollars and walked back out. The teller made no move to stop me, but she was looking pretty distressed. I you. She sighed. This is not how I expected today to go. What's your name, sweetheart? Same here, lady. I'm Khalife. Nice to meet you. Her lips twitched in a hint of a smile. I'm Semanfe. We both know I probably can't stop you from taking that money. But do you think you can do me a favor? A favor? I cocked my head to the side, interested at what she could possibly want a favor for right now. You're pretty strong, right? And fast, too? I saw some clips of you fighting Superman, even if they weren't that good. Yep. I'm training to get faster, too. So the next time we fight, I'll win and take over the planet. Training to never mind. Do you think you can beat up the other robbers on your way out? In a way no one else gets hurt? She asked. I shrugged. Sure. I was going to beat them up anyways for ruining my first time. Oh good. I didn't feel like there was much else to say to Samantha at that point. So I made my way back to the main lobby where the other robbers were still shouting at people. I introduced myself to the first one by kicking him in the stomach, flipped in the air to blast two of them with a key attack and turned to the last one just in time to catch a bullet in the mouth. Then the guy decided to just mag-dump me and kept firing. The bystanders began screaming at the sound of gunfire, and everyone panicked when my head snapped back. They only calmed down a bit when my hands kept moving after the first shot, and the gunman's weapon clicked empty. While they were all staring, I brought my head back forward and spit out the bullet I had caught and brought my hands up to eye level. With a slow, deliberate motion I opened them, and let the flattened pieces of lead pour out of my hands and clatter on the floor. I am so fucking sorry. The gunman whimpered as I started floating towards him. You're going to be. I promised. Then I punched him in the nose. The other robbers were dealt with, I had my money, and no sign of the cops or Superman. I could call my first robbery, despite some setbacks, a success. Now then, off to buy groceries. In another city, of course. I wasn't an idiot. Chapter 5. Have a cold front moving in from the north, so expect temperatures to fall into the high 50s, low 60s for the next few days. That's it for the weather. Now back to you. Hey, what are you doing here? The weatherman exclaimed as he spotted me walking onto the set. In fact, multiple people were surprised to see me walking in. I always thought news stations had different rooms for things like weather and all that. Turns out they are just off to the side. Huh? Neat. I gave myself a mental shove. I needed to focus. This was a crucial step in the plan for my continued training. Hi there. Is this the newsroom? I need to send a message into the city. I said cheerfully. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see whispered conversations happening among the crew. Apparently a few people knew me on site now, but plenty of others had no clue who I was. That would probably change after today. You can't be in here. We're in the middle of a broadcast. One of the crew said in a hissed whisper, moving towards me and trying to shove me out of the room even as others tried to stop him. So this is the right place? Good. Some people screamed when the light yellow key ball struck the man in the chest, knocking him over. I mean, in their defense, they had no idea I had basically just pushed him over from a distance. But still loud. Oh relax, he's fine. Now then which one of these is on? I looked around until I spotted a camera with a red dot on it and realized the crew hadn't stopped filming since I showed up, so it was still on the weatherman. With a little push, I kicked off the ground and floated around him. Hey, do you mind stepping away for a sec? I need to say something. The man was backpedaling away before I even finished my sentence. Thank you. 
I turned to the camera and smiled widely. Hello future subjects of the Scion race. As many of you know I'm Califa and I've been tasked with taking over your planet. I was doing a good job too until I, uh, kinda sorta lost of Superman, but I've been training. I skipped over the unimportant stuff. Now I'm ready for a rematch, but since your buildings are super fragile I'm moving the fight outside the city so we can go all out from the beginning. So, Superman, I will face you 50 miles south of the city tomorrow at noon. If you fail to show up then I will take that as your forfeit. Ah, uh, um, excuse me, Ms. Califa? A young man nervously called out from behind one of the cameras. What happens if he doesn't show, or just see your message? I blinked. Wait, you can't just keep repeating what I said to make sure he sees? Uh, well, this is live so no? Oh, that wasn't part of my plan. If Superman didn't even know we were supposed to fight, how could I test how much stronger I was? I mean, sure, I could attack the city again, but that would mean getting spanked again, holding back too much, and not giving it my best. I couldn't decide what to train next if the fight ended before we got going. Maybe I could come back every hour to make a new announcement? No, that wouldn't work. The whole point of going on the news was to give me some free time to make sure nothing got in the way. The last thing I needed was a random hiker wandering into the area to ruin the whole fight. Um, can you just make a recording and play that later? The young man looked around, but everyone else seemed to have lost their voice. None of you have a way to get a hold of him? Something like what that bat guy does in Gotham? Not unless you count kidnapping his girlfriend, someone muttered in the back. What was that? Ah, uh, nothing. Just saying it would be best to ask one of his friends? Would that work? There was currently no Justice League, so no help there. And even if the other heroes took the message then, I would end up fighting them which ruined the whole plan to fight Superman anyway. No, that was too unreliable. Um, I guess I'll just show up before the fight is supposed to start? You guys can still repeat the message right? Even without me being recorded. So you aren't going to hold us hostage or attack the studio if Superman doesn't show? Another person called out despite another co-worker jabbing him repeatedly in the ribs. Oh, no? Why would I do the dash? Or go on a rampage through the city? I mean, maybe I'll shoot off a couple blasts just to get his attention dash and destroy a few skyscrapers. What? No. I just wanted a fight not to level a city. The whole point of me moving the fight out of the way is so that we don't ruin the place. What about dash? At this point, his co-worker put his hand over the guy's mouth and physically restrained him. This was not how I expected this to go. I'm just gonna go. Ooh. The newsroom staff watched nervously as the alien child floated out of the studio. As soon as she was out of sight, the man who had been restraining his co-worker released him and slapped him upside the head. Are you trying to get us all killed? You moron? Hey, I just found out three very important things. Thank you very much. And you know the execs wanted more about the girl if we could get it. Yes. From the reporters and investigators. Not from the video crew. The man looked ready to beat some sense into his companion before he sighed. Whatever. What did you learn that was so important? Well, one. She really is just a kid. My nieces get flustered and run off the exact same way when they are mid-plan and discover an obstacle they didn't think about, and I suggest a bunch of things they don't want to do in a row. Two. She isn't going to use hostages or anything like that. She didn't even give that idea another thought. Maybe a cultural thing? I'm sure some anthropologist would love that data point. And three, she doesn't want to destroy the city. Even said so herself. So let me get this straight. You risked all of our lives because the would-be alien conqueror acted like your kid nieces? What if she just blasted you with one of those laser balls or whatever they are? I'd be fine. She did it to Dave and all he got was a little dirty from rolling on the floor. Everyone in the room was now looking at their co-worker with various levels of stunned disbelief or anger, especially the ones who had seen the same yellow energy, orbs melt metal in seconds, and hit Superman hard enough to send him flying out of the city. You're an idiot. Ooh. Clark Kent sighed as he watched a recording of Califa's challenge to Superman for the third time. The girl's announcement had gone viral on practically every video hosting site and social media platform around in minutes. At this point, it would be harder to find someone in the city who hadn't seen it than those who had. Oddly, part of him was relieved Califa hadn't deviated from her mission of taking over the planet 
by defeating its champions. He had been worried when it was reported she had robbed a bank that it would be the beginning of another rampage by a superpowered alien. That worry lessened when reports of her buying groceries of all things a few hours later, but it did confuse the hell out of him. The rest was just resigned to the massive headaches this event would cause in the future. Anti-alien factions were starting to form due to the rising number of verified extraterrestrial visitors on Earth, and an alien hijacking a news broadcast to declare hostile intentions and call him out in particular was going to be twisted by someone he was sure, irregardless that this was the action of a child. A child that was smart enough to research things on the local internet, despite being from another planet on a mission of subjugation, but a child nonetheless. He hoped he could settle this before some hothead decided the military needed to be involved and more people got hurt, even if it ruined his lunch plans. Chapter 6 Lex Luthor was many things. Rich. Intelligent. A ruthless businessman with a keen instinct. Yet, there was one aspect that he prided himself in above all others. Being able to manipulate the masses at whim. Right now he was watching the challenge to the alien sent by the Scion Child. Like everything, it was simply another situation he could twist to his favor. The only question remained, what would be the best move at the moment? Unlike most of the things that made the news, this wasn't something he knew was coming in advance. It was sudden, spontaneous. And it wasn't like this child had any contacts or subordinates he could spy on or recruit to keep tabs on her. No, this was a rare opportunity with a small window to take advantage of it before it was too late. Many plans of action whirled through his mind, each carefully evaluated before being refined or discarded. He could push for a military response, through several proxies naturally, and have them attack the site of this duel. If they managed to kill off the Scion then it would be one less alien thinking they could come in and take over because they were physically superior. Of course if they failed he was sure he would be able to convince several people in both the military and the government to increase sales and funding for L Corp weapons. It was a tempting plan, but one he ultimately had to push aside. It would have worked if the invader didn't look like a child. While people were scared of the Scion's power, they weren't so scared they would be willing to be attached to an operation gunning after a 12-year-old. While his more pragmatic contacts would have no issue with the deed, they would be crucified by public response. No, that option was out. He could always hire a mercenary to attack both of them. No, the time frame was too short for anyone competent. Very well, it seemed direct action was off the table this time. But Luther did not make it to where he was today by being unable to adapt his strategies. If being direct wouldn't work, he would be indirect. He pressed a button on his desk that opened the intercom to the lobby outside his office. Come in. Luther leaned back in his chair as his right-hand woman, Mercy Graves, walked into the room. What can I do for you, Lex? He gave his favorite henchwoman a rare natural smile. Her absolute loyalty to him and her competency were just two of the reasons he relied on her as much as he did. Her ruthlessness and willingness to follow orders instantly just made her even more useful. I've decided what we are going to do about our visitor's little challenge. He said slowly, get a few camera crews out to the location specified, as many stations as possible. We are going to make sure the whole country sees this. Yes, sir, right away. Instant obedience. How refreshing. Yes, this was the best move he could make right now. If the alien won, and Luther could easily admit it was likely he would, the country would be witness to their beloved idol of justice beating on a child. If for some reason he lost, then he was no longer the unbeatable symbol they held him up as and his influence would wane. Of course, if the camera crews happened to be killed, well, that just goes to show how dangerous it is to let these aliens run loose where normal people could get hurt now, didn't it? Ooh. When I first picked the place for my rematch with Superman, I thought about recreating the tiled floor seen in the World Martial Arts Tournament or the Cell Games, but couldn't due to the lack of giant mountains I could carve up for tiles. I mean, I also wasn't strong enough to just whip up tiles like I remember Cell doing, but the thought was there. Instead, I settled for a wide, flat patch of ground far from pretty much everything. It would be fine if we spent most of the time flying, right? So imagine my surprise when I found nearly a dozen different news crews converging on my location minutes before my scheduled fight. These people did realize I was about to fight Superman, right? That the whole reason I moved the fight from the city was because I didn't want squishy people getting in the way? 
Were they suicidal, or just dumb? Well, I still had some time to kill. Hey, what are you guys doing here? I called down to them once I flew over. And can you leave? I have a fight in a few minutes, and I don't want us getting distracted. I definitely took them by surprise because most of them jumped, some of them fumbled with the equipment they had been unloading, and one unfortunate guy dropped the camera lens down. I winced at that last one. That was probably expensive. Of course the reporters didn't just instantly jump to obey me. That would be too easy. Excuse me, miss, I'm Danny Damaris, reporter for Channel 7. Would you mind a short interview? Was there something about being a reporter that required getting up close and personal with things that could kill you? The other guys at the news station seemed the same. Maybe it wasn't a Lois Lane thing, but something that all reporters did, and she only survived it because of Superman. Actually, that reminded me. I guess I can talk to you for a bit if you don't mind answering a question first. The reporter checked to make sure his cameraman was recording before eagerly nodding his head yes. Can you only be a reporter if your name starts with the same two letters? I what? I mean, I didn't really go looking for a bunch of reporter names, but there's Lois Lane, Vicky Vale, and you're Danny Damaris. All of you have names that start with the same letter. I guess there's Clark Kent too, but his names only sound similar. Is he not a very good reporter then? Ha, huh, take that you big, blue bully. Even if I can't physically beat you up yet, I can still make fun of your alter ego. Donnie took a second to recover before giving me a strained smile and attempting to move on. I'm sure Mr. Kent is a fine reporter, and it has nothing to do with his name. The alliteration of the other names is just coincidence. Isn't that when a word sounds like the sound it makes? I knew what alliteration meant, of course, but I had an image to sell. No, that's onomatopoeia. Oh. Anyways, there have been a lot of scared people since your arrival asking what exactly your intentions are with the planet. I waited for him to continue with a question, but he just looked at me expectantly. Was I supposed to respond to that? Okay. What is your response to those people? Any clues to your motivations that might explain why you are here? I'm here to take over the planet by beating your champions. I repeated the public reason I was doing anything. Yes, but why? Is it for resources? For territory? Going by my original mission, it would be to exterminate everything on the planet and sell it off. But I wasn't about to say that on TV. Time to use the politician's second most popular trick in the book blaming someone else and changing topics. I dunno, I was just sent here to take it over. It's taking longer than I thought it would, but I've been having fun. You have some interesting things here, even if most of you are weaklings. Donnie looked a little annoyed at my response, but kept his tone polite. Aren't you worried about people getting hurt though? Your first appearance did quite a bit of damage to Metropolis. I shrugged. A little? I don't want to hurt people who aren't fighters, but I can't stop people from being stupid. I mean, I tried to have my rematch out here away from anyone else and you guys followed me anyway. Seems kind of dumb to worry about getting hurt if you're going to go looking for it. Now the reporter was definitely annoyed. I could see him clenching his jaw at my comments to not blurt something out. Well, what can I say? Channel 7 has a good medical plan. He tried joking. I tilted my head, innocently. Wait. Does this planet not give people the same level of medicine for everyone? Do only certain people get healed? No, of course not. Donnie backtracked. Everyone in the country can get the same care at a hospital. My company just lets me not pay for it as much dash. You have to pay for a hospital? I exclaimed, shocked at this revelation. That's so weird. How do you stop people from making things super expensive for no reason? or not curing diseases because they get paid more if people stay longer. We have a very good system in place to make sure everyone gets the care they need. Donnie assured me, not very well considering the stiff-looking smile he had on his face. If you say so. Anyway, it's time for my fight. If you guys don't want to risk getting in the way you should go home. I gave them one last piece of advice before flying back into the air and looking at the direction I could sense Superman coming from. Okay, round two. Chapter 7. I hid my excitement behind a confident smile and crossed arms as Superman slowed to a stop and hovered in front of me. There was just something about having the chance to go all out that got my heart racing. I'm glad you got my message, I want a proper fight this time. I declared. Superman sighed and relaxed his stance a bit. Are you sure about that? We could try resolving this another way. Nope. 
has to be a fight. Because of your mission? You said you were here to conquer the planet for your race, but you moved the fight all the way out here so no one gets hurt, so I know you aren't just going to mindlessly destroy everything. Superman said, delaying the start of our fight even more. Also, oops, definitely giving people the wrong impression of science now. Is there some way we could try negotiating with your leader to leave us alone? I mean, probably? If the Planet Trade Organization was a real thing here, then there had to be someone they didn't kill off or enslave right away. Since they needed, you know, people to actually buy and trade the planets they took over. Not that I, as a disposable shock trooper, would know how to get a hold of them anyway, but I guess I needed to give him some kind reason to fight me without me attacking the city. All right, if you can beat me then I'll tell you everything I know about talking to our leader. I declared, settling into a more offensive stance. Okay, it's a deal the. I didn't wait for him to finish before I launched myself forward and attempted to bury my fist in his face. Superman caught it before that could happen though. One hand firmly captured. I could tell by the way he was bringing up his other hand he was expecting me to try punching him again like our last fight. He wasn't expecting me to use my hand as a pivot point to kick him instead. It was awkward, especially because in order to kick Superman I ended up twisting my whole body around and away from him, but I still hit hard enough to not only free myself but also send him flying. He recovered quickly though. I'm glad you're not hitting normal people that hard. You'd really hurt them. Superman commented, rubbing his jaw. I scoffed. Humans are too weak for me to need to do that. And they'd probably pop if I hit them that hard. They might surprise you. Humanity might not be the most physically strong race out there, but we are plenty strong in other ways. I was tempted to point out he wasn't human though, but who was I to tell him what he could or could not consider himself? It's not like he was saying he physically wasn't Kryptonian, just that he considered himself human. No different than if someone was born in Japan and grew up in America or something like that. Yeah, they were born somewhere else, but they likely didn't think of their birth nation as home if they were only there as a baby. Or maybe they did. I guess different people could have. While I was distracted by my thoughts, Superman blurred to the side. If this had been before my training with the Flash, I wouldn't have been able to keep up with him, but I was used to this level of speed now. I was easily able to see the open hand coming straight at me, confirming Superman was a jerk. He was still trying to spank me. Not this time, you blue jerk. He gathered in my palms, and with a loud shout, I blasted him in the stomach with two beams of energy, swatting him out of the air and into a nearby cliffside. Ha! Huh, I've been training for our rematch, Superman. You can't cheat like last time. I laughed as I floated closer to him. He was half buried in dirt and rocks, but he didn't look particularly bothered by it either. Cheat? How did I cheat? He asked, sounding a little incredulous. You didn't fight properly. I yelled, angry he was trying to sound innocent. Spanking people when you were supposed to be fighting them isn't fighting. It's harassment. Acharassement. Superman coughed. Where did you hear that from? Internet. He sighed and pulled himself out of the cliffside. I wasn't trying to spank you, he lied. I was trying to restrain you so I could get some answers. I can tell you're powerful, but running around causing trouble is going to get a lot of people hurt eventually. And I really don't think I can seriously fight a child. Hey, I'm a scion warrior, not just some kid. I protested. And the only way you're getting me to talk is to beat me in a proper fight. Now stop stalling. Superman sighed again. All right then. And then he was gone. Faster than Flash had moved during our training, but not quite as fast as I had seen him move, so I was already swinging a fist to hit him in the face. But to my surprise I hit nothing but air. How did he? Gah. I couldn't help but gasp in pain as Superman's palm dug itself deeper into my stomach. It hurt, but I also started smiling. He was finally taking me seriously. I smacked his hand away and tried using that momentum to kick him, but once again I hit nothing but air. This time Superman grabbed my arm as I went sailing past and swung me around before throwing my high into the sky, which was really disorienting. I spent a few seconds just trying to figure out which way was which before finding Superman with my key sense and rushing back at him. For a bit I thought I was overwhelming him. I still wasn't landing any solid hits, but he never managed to counterattack either. But as I paid attention to why they weren't landing I started noticing something else. Every kick landed short. 
Every punch was being gently deflected or caught before it hit, and every key blast was dodged. He, he was toying with me, wasn't he? I was wrong. He still wasn't taking me seriously at all. Darn it. I was tiring out too. I was starting to overextend and Superman was taking advantage by throwing me around. Literally. Why? Can't. I hit you. I screamed, punching him with every word. None of them landed and I just got a slight smile in return that almost sent me back into a rage. Well, you just keep punching or kicking randomly. The jerk said smugly. It caught me off guard at first, but I just needed to watch carefully to figure you out. I froze. Of course. Everything I knew about fighting was basically, hit it harder, hit it faster, and while it worked for anything weaker than me, anyone stronger would be able to keep up. Okay. I knew what I needed to train next. Superman looked a bit surprised when I smirked and drifted away from him instead of charging forward again. Sorry, but I got what I wanted from this fight. Giving up? He asked. If you are, I hope you're ready to answer my questions. My smile grew a bit sharper, nope, but I definitely can't beat you with my fists right now, so I'm going to end this with my ultimate technique. Out of three, but he didn't need to know that. I spread my fingers out and placed them by my face while I readied the key needed for the technique. Superman started looking serious, watching for any sign of what I was planning. Perfect. Solar flare. I shouted the name of the technique as my key flared out in a blinding flash of light. Superman was taken completely off guard and flinched while trying to shield his eyes, for all the good it did him right now, leaving me to complete the last part of my master plan, running away as fast as I could. I knew I couldn't win just yet, I just needed to not lose either. Ooh, gah. The sudden blast of light was unexpected and Superman was half expecting a child-sized missile to come crashing into him when he was blinded. So it was a bit embarrassing when nothing happened long enough for his eyes to recover and find Califa's form flying off in the distance. He was tempted to fly after her and wring the answers he needed out of her because if she was anything like some of the other children he knew growing up, and she certainly reminded him of some of them, she wouldn't consider this a loss. Before he could chase after her, there was a scream and the sound of rocks giving way. Superman turned to see that some of the reporters that had stubbornly stayed in the area, even though he tried to keep the fight far away from them, had also been blinded by Califa's last technique and staggered too close to the cliff edge where it collapsed. He was already moving to catch the unfortunate reporter even as he realized the Scion girl would be long out of sight before he managed to calm the reporter down. Hopefully she would keep to her pattern of relatively harmless actions until he could properly get her to sit down for a long discussion and maybe figure out what to do with her afterwards. If he was lucky, she would stay out of trouble until then. Ooh, it was dark and stormy by the time I finally managed to get to my destination. I hadn't exactly wanted to come here looking for a martial arts teacher, but they were the best person I knew where to find and I knew they didn't mind working with villains or kids from time to time. Why are you following me? A stern voice growled from the shadows where I had finally found my target. You're good at martial arts, right? I asked instead. Lightning flashed, revealing a dark cowled figure with a bat symbol displayed prominently on his chest. I want you to train me. Chapter 8 No. The reply was quick, firm, and delivered so matter-of-factly that when Batman turned and walked off I was left floating dumbly behind. It was only when the last bit of his cape disappeared around a corner that I snapped out of my daze and chased after him. Hey, what do you mean no? No, I won't train you. Why not? Batman was like the DC martial arts guy. Yeah, there were people that got superpowers from their fancy martial arts or whatever, but Batman knew like all of those and mastered them too, even if he didn't get the powers from them. And none of those other people ever trained a handful of tinier people that went on to kick nearly as much, but as he did. It was all, I've been chosen by some magical force, and then Batman and his sidekicks beat them up. He had to train me. You're a child on a self-admitted mission to take over the planet. Batman pointed out dryly. It'd be irresponsible for me to teach children to throw themselves into danger, even more so when you were going to be using those skills to fight us. That was a well-reasoned argument. I had a counterpoint. Don't you have a five-year-old running around in tights fighting criminals? That's pretty irresponsible already. There was a crash of shifting metal. 
I turned towards the sound and was shocked to see a small boy in a red and green outfit trying to pull his foot out of where it punched through a rusted air conditioner. How did I miss him earlier? Anyway, yeah, him. I turned back to Batman while pointing at his struggling sidekick. You train him already so train me. Besides a slight deepening in his frown, Batman made no sign that he was bothered by Robin's blunder. Robin is a normal human that has dedicated himself to fighting crime. He isn't trying to attack the planet and has no powers. Unlike you, he needs training to live with the path he's chosen. And I'm eleven, not five. I whirled back to Robin. Eleven is basically five. You're short enough it doesn't make a difference. The preteen scowled. Yeah? Like you're one to talk? You're only a little taller than me. How old are you anyway? That was actually a good question. Science didn't exactly care about age. We didn't have birthday parties or anything like that. Even if we did it wasn't like the calendar of Vegeta and Earth were the same. I have no idea. Older than you though. I said with a smirk. Robin bristled. How do you not know how old you are? Don't know the day I was born? Space travel and induced hibernation makes keeping track of time hard, and I have no idea how our time systems compare. I counted the reasons on my fingers. Do you know how an Earth year compares to a Vegetian one? No, why would I know that? How would I know that? You asked. I shrugged. Don't lose your tail over it. I don't have a tail. Guess that explains why you are so small and wimpy then. I started floating around Robin, jabbing him occasionally with my tail, despite his efforts to grab it. Too bad for him I was faster, and able to fly while he was just getting angrier and sloppier because of that anger. I guess Batman hadn't trained him how to deal with flying a pwn. Oh right, I was here for training, not messing with a preteen. I gave one last push to the middle of Robin's forehead and knocked him over before floating back to Batman. The Dark Knight had moved since I got distracted with Robin. Now he was standing in an area that gave him a clear view of the two of us with his hands hidden under his cape. Had he been watching us? It made sense. He probably didn't want me accidentally squishing his sidekick and Robin probably hadn't been training with him for long if he still sucked so much so he wanted to make sure he could intervene. Now where were we? Right, train me. Batman remained unimpressed. I don't have time for this. He grumbled and stalked off. I naturally wasn't going to let him get away so easily and followed after him. It was actually kinda cool watching him sprint over rooftops. No wasted movement. No uncertainty even when he got close to the edge of a building, and it didn't look like he was moving randomly either. Eventually he came to a stop near a skylight. Curious, I looked inside and saw a bunch of people operating some kind of machinery inside. What's that? I asked. Batman spared me a small glance and went back to studying the men below without a word. Rude. It's a counterfeiting ring run by the mob. Robin informed me as he caught up to us. I could have sworn I saw Batman scowl more at his arrival, but it was gone before I could be sure. We've been tracking them down for the past few days. Oh hey, you finally caught up? I smirked. About time. Robin bristled and opened his mouth, but he was cut off by Batman. Enough. They are packing up their operation tonight. We don't have time for this. He turned to look at me. Stay out of the way. I tilted my head. If I do, will you train me? I'll consider it. Better than nothing. I nodded my acceptance and watched as the two of them went to work. Batman started things off by crashing through the skylight and blowing out the lights with one of his little boomerang things with Robin following close behind. I'd like to say it was a cool fight and I managed to learn something just by watching but Batman versus a bunch of random people disoriented by sudden darkness meant everything was over pretty quick. A few punches and the occasional kick, and they were knocked out already. Even Robin managed to take out a few with little trouble. I decided to be polite and waited until they were done tying up their criminals. Once they finished I landed in front of Batman and looked up at him with sparkling, excited eyes. So, you'll train me now? No, I won't. I was crushed by this completely unforeseen betrayal. W-H-H-H-H-H-Y-Y-Y. I wailed asked reasonably. You said you would if I stayed out of the way. I said I would consider it. You are still hostile to Earth so I won't train you. That's not fair. I admit the next few minutes were not my most shining moments. I tried begging, threats, promises, and many other things trying to get Batman to give in but without success. 
Begging didn't seem to faze him. Threats made him point out it was exactly those reasons he refused to train me in the first place. And everything else just seemed to bounce off the jerk. Eventually, he just ignored me entirely and went about the city stopping a few more crimes and teaching his psychic how to free run a bit better. It didn't help that Robin seemed to find the whole thing hilarious. The wimp was getting on my nerves. Relax, monkey girl. The bird brain smirked at me. He just said no. Don't lose your tail over it. I saw red. I'll show you losing your tail. I shouted and ready to throw a key ball at him when a gloved hand clamped around my wrist. I don't think any of us were fooled into thinking Batman could really stop me if I wanted to continue with my attack, but blasting Bird Boy wouldn't make him train me. I was going to have to break out my ultimate technique, a move so evil and underhanded that I felt uncomfortable even considering it. But they left me no choice. I looked up at Batman and let some water gather in the corner of my eyes. You really won't train me? I asked, voice trembling. Whoa, wait. Are you crying? Robin asked, uncertainly. Even Batman looked uncomfortable in the face of my ultimate move. And this wasn't even its final form. And no, I'm not. You're crying. Despite my words, even more water started gathering in my eyes and spilling over my cheeks. Batman was still holding strong. But Robin was starting to crack. BR, Batman. What do we do? The caped crusader shifted awkwardly and released my arm. I let the key ball dissipate and sank to the rooftop, the very picture of dejection. I heard them start to edge away and decided to break out level 2 of my technique, adding in some low keening sounds and hiccups. We're not going to really leave her here, are we? My technique was already eating away at the unity of the heroes. It was only a matter of time now. I upped the intensity a bit more and knew I was close to succeeding when I heard Batman sigh and walk back over to me. I looked up at him when he kneeled in front of me and struggled to see through the water pouring from my eyes. A drawback from using this technique. You really won't? I asked one more time. Batman sighed. I'll train you. If you agree to some conditions. You promise? Yes. Yes. I ended my technique and leapt into the air with a bright smile. I knew this would work. Fake tears were one of my most evil moves, but no hero could withstand it. TCH, I thought she was supposed to be a monkey not a crocodile. We got played. I was so happy at my success, I didn't even get mad at Bird Brain for the comment. Chapter 9 I don't know what I was expecting training with Batman to be like. Maybe getting strapped into fake giant death traps and needing to fight off robots with one arm tied behind my back or maybe brutal hand-to-hand -hand lessons in certain styles while getting quizzed on detective mysteries. Calmly moving through Tai Chi stances with Robin while a G.I. wearing Batman, he was still wearing the mask, corrected my posture was not on the list. This wasn't what I was expecting when you said you would train me. I couldn't help but say as I moved through the forms I'd been shown, body control is very important for learning martial arts. Tai Chi is very good for learning both awareness and control things you will need in other styles, especially if you need to control your strength to human levels. Batman explained again. Still think it's weird we agreed to train her at all. Bird Brain commented. No one paid him any attention though, as was proper. Yeah, but this would be easier if you just used your key to make yourself stronger instead. I insisted for probably the fifth time. Then I wouldn't need to be so careful. We've tried that. But until Robin or I can do so it would just waste time. So we'll focus on practical things first. It would help if your instructions didn't suck. It would help if you weren't too stupid to follow basic directions bird brain. I snapped at Robin. Basic directions? Feel the warm glowy stuff in your body and make it do stuff aren't directions. It doesn't even make sense. The moron snapped back. Of course, they're the basics. They're so basic I shouldn't even need to teach you how to do it. It's like asking me to teach you how to breathe. I thought Batman would have been a really impatient guy, but he must have the patience of a saint to put up with someone as stupid as Robin. I take it someone taught you how to do this on your homeworld? Batman asked calmly while stopping me, correcting my stance, and making me start over. I actually had to think about it. There weren't a whole lot of interesting memories from old me, so I tended to not think about them a lot. Most of them were just being bored traveling from one planet to another while Jerk Dad tried to get me killed off. Not really. I eventually replied. 
I mean, I learned some stuff by watching others, but I was getting sent on missions too much for anyone to teach me. Missions? Like the one you're on right now? Yeah. There aren't a whole lot of science available, so we usually get a mission right after we finish the last one. I think. I always got a new one a few days after I got back from the old one. Wait, does that mean you stole planets from other races before? How could you? Robin shouted loudly. Robin. Thankfully, Batman silenced him with a stern word before turning back to me. Did you not train for these missions then? I focused on shifting my weight the way he had shown me. Kinda? Like I did exercises and stuff. But the missions were supposed to come first. And they were kind of a let down, honestly. I always finished them super fast. The first one was supposed to be this really advanced civilization, or something, but they ended up blowing themselves up before I got there. I spent a long time just looking for someone before I realized I had the planet to myself. I was so focused on my form that I didn't see Robin stumble out of his stance and stare open-mouthed at me. I didn't see Batman stiffen up either. And how old were you at the time? I paused what I was doing and thought about it. That was my first mission, and I think it took a few months to actually get to the planet. So, maybe three and a half or so? I said uncertainly. Still no idea what that is in Earth years, but around that. And how many missions have you been sent on? This is my fourth. I gave him a bright smile. The second was full of giant killer reptiles that wanted to eat me. Robin raised an eyebrow. Giant killer reptiles, huh? How did you beat them? I shot him a smirk. I waited until I was bigger than them, and then squished them all. Robin looked a little green at the thought. Wimp, what about the third? That one was fun. It was full of carnivorous plants. I replied to Batman. It was too bad about the allergies, though. Allergies? I nodded seriously. Yep, the plants were allergic to laser beams. Geez, monkey girl, that's really messed up. Robin said. Your face is messed up. I shouted and pounced on the brat. I wasn't going to let him insult me like that. Batman allowed it, just as long as I stayed in human levels. Ooh, Coast City was similar to Metropolis in many ways. While it wasn't built as a testament to what the technology of tomorrow might bring to the table, it was a city that had become known for being the home of a man with powers far beyond the average person. Only instead of those powers being the result of alien biology, the Green Lantern was granted powers by alien technology and inducted into a galactic peacekeeping force. Similarly to Superman, Green Lantern seemed to appear when needed only to vanish once the trouble was taken care of. The fact that there were two more Green Lanterns active elsewhere made him even more mysterious. Unless you happen to know that Green Lantern could be seen coming and going from the same direction multiple times at different angles, and could do the math to discover his likely launch point. The sun was just about to set on the California coast when Green Lantern Hal Jordan landed in the alleyway a few streets down from his condo. It was a great blind spot and helped him ensure no one was going to target him while he was off the clock as it were. It was also one of those places that normal people had no reason to hang around in. So seeing a costumed man waiting patiently in the middle of the alley looking like he expected Hal to be there was a bit of a shock. Green Lantern. The man dressed up like a bat greeted him calmly. Uh, hi there. You're that guy from Gotham, right? The urban legend? Hal had been vaguely aware of the Batman from some late-night TV shows on modern-day legends. He had dismissed it as just normal hoaxes trying to scare people or cheat them out of money like those Bigfoot hunter shows. But then Superman had shown up and Hal had gotten a magic ring from a dying alien. He was a little more willing to not dismiss things immediately after that. That guy nodded. I've heard your ring can access information from all over the galaxy. I need your help. Whoa, whoa. Slow down there. Spooky? Yeah, the ring can access the Green Lantern's databases, but we can't exactly go handing that stuff out to anyone that asks. There were rules. Not that Hal always agreed. But the phrase monkey with a flamethrower was a good way to sum up some of the incidents caused by other lanterns freely sharing advanced technology. I only need information about an alien race that recently arrived here. Another one? One of these days Hal really needed to figure out exactly how many aliens were actually on Earth. Still, if they were already here that meant he could justify sharing some things without issue. Alright, still not sure I can give you what you're looking for but ask away. What am I looking up? Saiyans. Hal barely needed to prompt his ring for the information before a green, 
construct with the information scrolling down it appeared in Madeir. Anything in particular? Looks like they've been around for quite a while. Tall, dark, and broody considered the request for half a second. I need to know what will happen if the person they sent to conquer a planet fails to do so. Conquer the planet? How had he not heard of this before now? Lantern Hal Jordan, Sector 2814 requested all local media broadcasts from planet designation. Earth, be muted unless there was a significant risk of life while on patrol around the sector. His ring unhelpfully informed him. And how was an invasion not considered a significant risk of life? Invading party was confronted by local forces and defeated in less than four local hours. Threat level was decided to be non-urgent. That was okay. He clearly needed to tweak some settings before this happened again. The last thing he wanted was to come home to find out his city was blown up because the ring didn't think to warn him before something happened. Uh, okay, going by this, as a whole Saiyans don't leave their own sector of space that often. No reports of them invading for a few hundred years. The last one was a scion that turned pirate five decades ago and tried taking over a planet as a base of operations and was stopped by the local lantern. Looks like we might just have a bad actor trying to carve out their own territory. There was a minute frown on Spooky's face that Hal might have missed if he wasn't specifically looking for it. You're sure? According to the girl herself, she has already conquered three other planets before arriving here. Three? Did she say how? Hal actually relaxed a bit when Spooky told him about a dead civilization. A planet full of super predators and carnivorous plants. That sounded more like someone scavenging the planets no one wanted for some reason or another. Not the beginnings of an aggressive invasion. He even said as much to his sudden visitor. So yeah, don't think we have much to worry about in terms of an invasion on the horizon. Give me a few hours and I'll find them and kick them off the planet. It's kind of my job after all. Don't bother. I have her handled. The invader was already beaten. This guy must be a pretty impressive metahuman if he could take down a Saiyan. How could easily admit the average human didn't really stand a chance against one? Still, I should check her out. If she's invading planets, then she needs to either be deported back to her race or imprisoned before she hurts people. There's no need for that. I'm training her to limit any collateral damage. Whoa, hold up. You're training the alien invader? Yes. Why? because she is a child acting under the orders of another to invade planets. If she stays here, we can stop her from being used by whoever sent her here and potentially draw that person out. If she is sent back, we might be responsible for sending a child to an abusive environment. I refuse to allow that. Hal made a quick check on Scion Biology to confirm this wasn't just a species that happened to look like human children making use of a cover, but sure enough, while science grew in stages unlike humans that grew continuously to adulthood, that only meant the invader, the girl, could be as young as 8 Earth years or as old as 15. And considering they could easily live to be 200 years old, she truly was a child. All right, good point. And you're sure you can control her? Spooky nodded. Then I'll ask the corp to investigate any rumors of someone using Scion children as shock troopers with any luck. What the hell? The second Hal started looking for incidents regarding Scion children used like that he ran headfirst into a security wall marked Alpha Lantern Eyes only, and the date of the block was several thousand years old. That didn't make any sense. Something wrong? I got locked out when I went looking for similar incidents. That shouldn't happen without a very good reason. Hal turned away so he could focus on the readings his ring was giving him. It was starting to look like he was going to take a trip to a way to get to the bottom of things. I'll need to investigate more. You think you can keep an eye on the kid for a while? I am training her, was the deadpan reply. Right, well, leave me some way to get a hold of you. If there's someone out there using kids as an invasion force, I want to make sure we can catch him and I might need to talk to the girl about that. No need. I'll ask myself and update you if there is anything you can do. Wait just one second. Hal turned back fully expecting to give Bat Guy a reality check that this went beyond just Earth and was a Green Lantern matter, only to pause when there was no one there. Ring. Scan for life forms. There are 4,207 human-sized life forms nearby within a 1-kilometer radius. Definitely was going to tweak those settings after this. Scan for the guy in the Bat suit I was just talking to. There are zero life forms nearby meeting the criteria guy in the Bat suit I was just talking to, 
Well, damn it. Chapter 10. I wasn't too surprised to find out Batman wasn't going to be able to train me whenever I wanted. Unlike me, he had other things to do which meant he had to set aside time for preparation, investigation, maintaining his cover identity, and then his own training. That meant I was free to do almost whatever I wanted when he was busy. Batman did give me a few rules I was going to have to follow if I wanted to keep getting his training. Most of them were obvious ones like no blowing up a city or no killing people. Things that I wasn't really interested in doing anyway so it was fine. It used to be I had to follow the law, but I started looking up all the random, nonsensical laws I could find and presenting them to him asking if I had to follow those too until he removed that one from the list and told me he would revise it when he had time. Which meant there was a window of time where I could do almost whatever I wanted and had a ready excuse so he couldn't get mad. I was going to use that time to rob a bank. It bothered me that my first bank robbery got interrupted. Okay? It was a classic crime. A hallmark of any successful supervillain. I wasn't going to let it remain a black mark on my career just because some stupid humans had to ruin it for me. Of course, I couldn't just act like the first time hadn't happened at all, so I wasn't going to focus on the location as much. I wasn't even entirely sure what city I was in at the moment, just that it was somewhere in the southeast. As long as I stayed out of Florida, I should get some decent news coverage and help cement my reputation. I might even be able to find a few more minor heroes too. Someone I could spar against that fell somewhere between Super Jerk and Batman, so I could get a fight I was capable of winning, but took more effort than just raising my key. And this time I wouldn't be nearly as nervous. Not that I was nervous the first time, because I now had some experience. I could do this, and it would go perfectly. Ooh, I couldn't stop smiling if I tried as I walked out of the bank. Everything had gone perfectly to plan. Not only was I able to break into the vault and steal a bunch of money, the teller had also managed to set off the silent alarm, so I would be able to fight the police on the way out. Naturally, they wouldn't be able to stop me, and I would finally get the recognition as a villain I deserved. My grin widened when I saw a bunch of police cars right outside and I was fully ready to launch into the mandatory monologue when I noticed something was off. None of the cops were actually looking at me. Instead, they were looking at, Oh, come on. That wasn't fair. Barely two blocks from the bank, there was a bird-winged woman with a mace fighting some kind of giant lizard with a laser gun. And they were kind of trashing the place, which meant they were getting my attention instead of me. Shoot, the woman looked familiar too. She was Hawk Girl, Or was it Hawkwoman? Were they the same people? And wasn't she secretly evil for a bit? Ah, whatever. Right now she should be a hero. Which meant I might be able to fight her to make up for the fact my carefully planned robbery was ruined again. But first I needed to get rid of the other alien she was fighting. I flew up into the air and pointed a palm at the reptilian alien. A ball of key gathering there. Then I thought about it and how the alien was tanking the mace hits and poured even more key into the attack. The blast caught the alien completely by surprise and sent him crashing into an abandoned car and the one behind it and the three behind those. I may have gone a tiny bit overboard. It was fine though. I could still see him breathing so he was alive, just very thoroughly knocked out. My attack also had the bonus effect of making the police remember why they were in front of a bank in the first place, but none of them were brave enough to actually face me. They just readjusted where they were hiding so they had something between me and them. Hawkgirl woman didn't seem to pick up on that immediately though. Thanks for the help, but I had it handled. The winged woman said as she landed nearby. Lieutenant Sher Athal of Thanagar. I shrugged. I was just upset you guys were getting in the way of my special event. I had everything going the way I wanted, and you were distracting everyone else. I waved at the gathered cops. Oh, and I'm Califa. Nice to meet you. Event? What kind of? Hawkgirl woman finally saw the police hiding from me, and the building we were standing in front of as well as the bag full of money at my feet. You weren't robbing this bank, were you? She asked, glaring at me. Well, hawkishly. And if I was? Then as a reward for helping detain another criminal. I would let you go as long as you left everything you took behind. Her mace lit up in some weird sphere of lightning, and she had a very aggressive-looking grin on her face. One that I was certainly matching at this point. Yeah? You know what I say to that? Make me. All right, hero fight. Ready, set. Don't say I didn't give you a chance, Rag. Go. The winged heroine launched herself at me with a loud battle cry. 
swinging her mace at my torso. I kicked the bag full of money away so it wouldn't get damaged and brought up both arms to block. To my surprise, even when I flared my key to reduce the impact, the mace still really hurt when it hit. I could actually feel my bones creak a little from the impact. Hockey certainly wasn't holding back. I was going to have to watch out for that. This was not the time to be distracted though, and I had to duck under another swing to avoid getting whacked again. Hockey overshot and I was able to land a solid punch to her ribs that had her flapping her wings hard to avoid crashing into the ground. I waited patiently for her to stabilize and turn around so that when I shot a key beam at her, it was heading directly for her face. She surprised me again by actually smashing my beam backwards with her magic, mace, and I had to move fast to avoid getting hit with my own energy. Of course by the time I had done that hockey was right in front of me again. I tried flying backwards to get out of the way but she was faster. That didn't mean I was going to let her get a free hit though. Since I couldn't dodge, I leaned into her swing and used the impact to increase the momentum for a solid kick to her face. Unfortunately, between my own shorter legs, not managing to fully connect, and her bird-shaped helmet, the attack didn't seem to do much. This time it was my turn to attack, and I rushed forward to take advantage of the fact that Hockey's flight was reliant on actual wings. Two simultaneous key beams forced her to pull them closer since there was no way she could hit them both with her mace and left her wide open for a mid-air tackle. I felt the air whoosh out of her lungs as I tried to push us both towards the ground but she wasn't making this easy for me. Even with the surprise grapple, Hockey managed to bring her knee up hard and fast into my chest so that it loosened my grip on her, which turned out to be enough that she was able to slip out of the hold entirely and use me as a springboard to keep flying while I was sent crashing into the pavement below. At the sound of another battle cry, I looked up just in time to throw myself to the side as Hockey's mace cratered into the ground where I just was. I flared my key to kill my momentum and fly straight back at her to deliver another punch to the face. This time it was a clean hit that sent Hockey stumbling away, dazed but not out of the fight. I waited just long enough for the retaliatory swipe with the mace when she tried to guess my next attacks timing to miss before launching myself at her again, only to realize too late that she had predicted me predicting her and flew straight into a roundhouse kick. You're pretty good. I complimented as I floated back off the pavement. And you're a pain in the ass. Hockey growled back. Ah, that's not nice. Aren't you having fun? I don't think she wanted to admit she was enjoying this fight just as much as I was because she just leaped at me with another battle cry. She was somehow faster than I expected and caught me with a surprise uppercut before grabbing me by the front of my armor and spiking me into the ground. I wheezed a bit at the force of the impact. Once again Hockey readied her mace to smash me further into the ground, but she was too slow. A bright yellow key blast caught her right in the stomach and sent her smashing through a stone building's wall. Oops. Still, that wasn't enough to keep Hockey down, even if she was looking a little rough at this point. She pulled herself out of the rubble and glared down at me looking fully prepared to keep the fight going. Something I was all for, but I was getting to the point that one of us would have to go down soon. Even if Hockey was looking pretty banged up, I wasn't all that fresh either if I was being honest. I wasn't about to run away though. This was the first no-holds fight I had gotten and that wasn't against someone that outclassed me hilariously. I was going to keep enjoying this as long as I could. Hockey probably didn't feel the same way. I got the feeling she was looking for a way to take me out as quickly as possible going by how careful she was being right now. What's the matter? Did you want to give up? I taunted her with a wide smile. Don't flatter yourself, kid. I'm just getting started. She snarled, flying into the air and dive bombing me. Mace cocked back. Since I knew she was skilled enough that I wasn't going to just avoid her, I did something she wasn't expecting and jumped closer at the last second. Using the training I did with Batman, I managed to stop her next swing before she really got it going. But just because I caught her by surprise, that didn't mean she wasn't quick enough to respond. Even as I caught her right arm her left was moving into position to block the attack she was sure was coming. Too bad for her that wasn't what I was after. Batman had spent a lot of time teaching me how to use leverage instead of strength to disarm someone. I used that training now to twist Hockey's arm around until she was forced to drop it and then I kicked her away. This time when we separated, I was the one left holding the fancy metal mace and she was unarmed. Give that back? I waved the weapon tauntingly at her. No way, 
It's my turn to play with it. Grr. All right. Ready for round two? Hockey took a stance while glaring at me. Even without her weapon, she was going to keep fighting. Great. It would have been boring otherwise. Okay. Let's keep going. Chapter 11 I smirked as I faced the bird woman down with her own weapon, but the longer I held it the more my expression slipped until I was basically scowling. I gave the mace a little shake, but there was still nothing happening. I smacked it on the ground. Still nothing. I flipped it around in my hands searching for some kind of hidden button or something but I couldn't find anything. What are you doing? Hawkerel woman finally asked. How do you make it do the lightning orb thing? Why would I teach you how to use my own weapon against me? Well, that was no fun. Using a magic, anti-magic, mace that covered itself in a lightning effect so it looked like a plasma ball was one thing. Using it normally was the same as hitting someone with a metal club. That was way less cool. I doubted I was going to figure it out on my own in the next couple seconds either. Oh well, I'll figure it out later then. I responded to Hockey and tossed the mace over my shoulder. She looked pretty pissed off that I just casually tossed it away like that, but that didn't last long since I charged her soon after. She blocked the first punch with ease because I wasn't entirely sure if the durability thing was somehow because of the mace, but Hockey was clearly superhuman in the ways that mattered. She was faster, more durable, and actually stronger than I was expecting. She was also a really good fighter too. The two of us traded punches, kicks, and holds as we tried to beat the other into submission, and I wasn't afraid to admit she was much better than me. I was getting hit two or three times for everyone I landed, and only my smaller size and key assisted strength were letting me escape most of the holds. I really needed more technique training. I was already being forced to abandon the Tai Chi I was taught as hockey started throwing things at me I hadn't learned how to respond to, like what to do when your opponent smacks you in the head with their wings before uppercutting you in the chin. After that particular combo I decided to take the fight to the sky. I had better maneuverability to offset her experience and she couldn't pull off the weirder wing attacks anymore. Which was a good thing because my vision had gone kind of blurry from that last uppercut. Both of us were in pretty rough shape actually. I had several cuts bleeding freely and my armor was cracked in a few places. Hockey was bleeding too and she was keeping her left arm further away from me. I think I might have broken something there. I needed to beat her soon though. I was starting to get to the point I would be running on fumes. I was having fun, but losing the fight because I ran out of energy just to keep it going was stupid. Running out of steam, kid? You can give up whenever you want. Hockey said, blatantly ignoring her own state. Kinda, I replied honestly, but I'm still gonna win. Like hell you are. Hockey flapped her wings and I braced for the incoming attack only to get caught off guard when she flew right over me. A quick check made me realize this wasn't some mistake. She was going for the mace. Oh no you don't. I took off after her and tried to scare her off with a few key blasts, but Hockey dodged all of them until she managed to snag her fancy metal stick off the ground and deflect the last two. I gave up shooting at her then. All it was doing was tiring me out. Then Hockey caught me in the shoulder with her mace. I cried out in pain as the spiked end shattered my armor there and sent me crashing back into the ground. Hawkgirl woman must have figured that was her chance to end the fight because when I looked up I saw her descending fast. Mace raised overhead, ready to crush me further. Time seemed to slow down as my adrenaline surged at the sight and I frantically thought of a way to win. In the end I realized there was no way I was getting out of the hit so I was determined to make it cost hockey. A weak key blast at her face was predictably swatted away, but that meant instead of a devastating hammer blow, Hockey was forced to settle for a much weaker backhand to my ribs. Even that was more than enough to crack a few of them, but before she finished the attack I blasted her in the chest with the rest of my key. Both of us were sent skidding over the pavement as a result, and both of us were struggling to stand afterwards. I took a second to judge my remaining energy levels and was disappointed to find I barely had enough to get out of the city. I guess that meant the fight was over. We well this was really fun. I complimented my sparring partner, wincing a bit as talking made my ribs shift, but I'm done for today. We'll call it a draw and pick this up some other time. And, what makes you think? I'm letting you leave. Hawkgirl woman was having an even harder time speaking. I think my last attack did some real damage. Well, neither one of us have the strength to keep fighting. 
and you don't look like you can follow me. I pointed out, you aren't in shape to run away either. The local officials shouldn't have much trouble dealing with you now. I grinned and fanned my fingers in front of my face. You know what I have to say to that? Solar flare. The amount of cursing from both Hawkgirl woman and the remaining humans in the area was hilarious. I could barely stop laughing the entire way out of the city even though my ribs were aching the whole time. That was annoying. I couldn't wait to get back to my cave so I could take a nap in the attack ball. Its medical functions kinda sucked compared to a healing pod, but it was better than nothing. Ooh. A couple days later I was still a mess of bruises but I was feeling much better than before. I didn't do much during those days other than lounge around the cave and sleep or look myself up on the internet. It was actually really interesting to see how people were reacting to my presence, especially as my self-proclaimed mission to take over the planet became more widespread. Initially there were a lot of calls for the government to step in and do something about me, but that set off a bunch of people that didn't like the idea of a government holding a child, even an alien child, in some prison or lab because of something I was ordered to do. Then there was a whole movement to have one of the heroes step up and take me under their wings similar to how Batman was doing for Birdbrain, Flash was doing for Kid Flash, or Green Arrow was doing for Speedy, that then splintered into several sub-arguments ranging from trying to decide who could even manage that given my strength to weather, or not it was any better trusting someone in a mask to keep an eye on an impressionable young girl than the government. I did get a kick out of the flame war that erupted when someone suggested Hawkwoman, which still didn't clear up if she was the secretly evil one for me. Take me under her wing, ha. Huh? Because she was at least willing and capable of putting me in my place when needed and pissed off a bunch of soccer moms who thought anything more than a timeout was child abuse. That did remind me that I needed to go talk with Batman about more training since while the Tai Chi forms were really useful when I knew I could apply them, I still wasn't able to use them for everything. I needed either more forms and practice or I needed another style to use. Ooh. Unfortunately for me, Batman wasn't around for training, so I was just wandering the city looking for something to do, which turned out to be harder than expected because Gotham was kinda awful. Tourists weren't exactly rolling through so anything fun was meant for the locals, which meant things that were fun for corrupt business people or criminals, or corrupt business people that were criminals. The point was, even after wandering around for a while, I was still bored with nothing to do. Hey! Some random guy called out and ran up to me. Hey kid, you're that alien that touched down in Metropolis, yeah? The one with the tail? I wasn't too put out by him not fully recognizing me. My armor was pretty beat up from my last fight so I was just wandering around in an oversized blue and gray hoodie I snagged off a clothesline somewhere. Actually considering no one else seemed to notice I had to give the guy a thumbs up for even making the connection. Yeah, I'm Khalifa. Why? Did you want to fight? The guy probably wasn't a hero considering Batman didn't let ones he didn't like hang out in his city and he didn't look like much, but he still might be a fun distraction. No, no, no. I'm not a fighter. Or not. The man quickly waved his hands in denial. I'm a recruiter. See, the bosses are always on the lookout for interesting fighters. It's up to guys like me to try bringing them in. Oh, a place where fighters ended up? That sounded fun. So your boss thought I was really impressive and wanted to offer me a spot? I asked, excited. Well, no. The man instantly shot down my enthusiasm. We just keep an eye out for anyone that looks like they could put up a fight and would be willing for a couple thousand in cash. I just happened to see you and thought you could use the money since Hawkwoman stopped your bank gig the other day. Oh, I slumped down a bit. Guess I still wasn't a big enough villain for people to be coming after me specifically. Well. I guess it could be fun. Fun, yeah. I'm sure it'll be fun for someone. The recruiter handed me a card with an address on it. Head to this place and tell them Carl sent you. And do me a favor and try and last a few rounds. I get paid on commission, you know? I watched the man walk off when something finally hit me. He said Hawkwoman stopped my bank robbery. In all the excitement of the fight, I forgot to go back and pick up the money I took. GRRR. My bank robbery was totally messed up again. Chapter 12. I wasn't really sure what to expect when I went to the address on the card, but a tiny sign next to a staircase leading underground squished between two other buildings, wasn't it? There wasn't even a fancy door to set it apart, just the same metal bar door where the outside screen door would normally be and a dull red wooden one behind it. The inside wasn't any more impressive. Flat, 
undecorated, off-white walls that were barely lit by the one struggling light in the middle of the ceiling. A single beaten-up wooden desk off to one side with one of those little bell things, and an even more beaten-up brown leather couch that looked one good shove from falling apart were the only furniture there. Seeing nothing better to do, I walked up to the desk and dinged the bell. Nothing happened for a few seconds, but then I heard a droning, crackly sound. People sending in kids now? Guess we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. A voice drawled over a really low-quality speaker. You know what this place is for, girl? Yeah, some guy named Carl said I could fight people here. I said looking around trying to spot the hidden camera the person must have been using. Carl, huh? You a meta, girl? No, I'm a Saiyan. Not human, good enough? The voice said disinterestedly. Whatever, head to the back and we'll have you evaluated for a weight class. Heads up though, if you're wearing a wire or something for the cops, the automated turrets will fire immediately. The speaker cut off and a hidden door in the back wall slid open revealing a hidden hallway. Huh, this was actually kind of fancy, wasn't it? Even despite the ratty exterior. Hopefully their fighters were good too. Down the hall was another room. This one completely empty besides one really tall muscled guy in cargo pants and a vest. I looked around for any hint on what was going on, but it was just a room. Meet Leatherneck. The voice came back as a door shut behind me. He's the one we use to judge the fresh meat that comes in. He's a meta with unbreakable skin. All you have to do to get a pass to the arena is last two minutes against him. If he breaks your spine, don't worry, we'll drop you off outside a hospital real quick like. So just beat him up for two minutes then? I asked out loud. Heh, don't get cocky, brat. I've taken an RPG to the chest before and came out without a scratch. Leatherneck laughed. And then I went on to feed the guy who shot me his own teeth for trying. Don't think being a kid is going to make me go easy on you either. I luove the sound of tiny bones breaking and I can't wait. Hey, can I start already? I interrupted. I wanted to get to the real fighters. Ha, huh, well now you pissed him off. The voice sighed. Go ahead. I'll send a cleanup crew in a few minutes. Fucking brat. I'm going to take my time pulling you apart. Leatherneck screamed and lunged at me. He was annoying so I put a bit more strength than I was planning into my punch. I nailed him in the stomach and sure enough I didn't do any damage to his skin. I did do a bit more damage to everything else when I sent him smashing through what looked like a reinforced brick and then halfway through a metal wall on the other side. Oops. I waited a bit for the guy to get up because while I hit him harder than I was planning, I didn't hit him that hard. But no matter how long I waited, Leatherneck didn't get up. Crap, I didn't kill him, did I? No, he was still breathing, so I should be good. Hey, did I win? I called out to the voice. Y yeah. You won. The voice didn't sound bored anymore. Guess that means I impressed him. Congrats, I think you're going to be a big hit in the dome. The dome? Yeah, it's where the real money is made. Specialty fights and stuff. Free-for-alls, team fights, king of the hill, stuff like that. I'm sure you'll have plenty of people shelling out bets for you. Does that mean more fights? I asked. As many as you want. Come back here tomorrow. I'll have someone take you to the dome. Cool. I was looking forward to this. Ooh. I was back the next day with still no clue what Batman was doing. Kind of frustrating because I really wanted to know when I could train with him again. I had even done a quick flyover last night and this morning looking for his key signature, but he wasn't home but I was too excited about today to care much. I met a different man at the same recruiting spot that simply shoved me into a plain black car and started driving without a word even though I started peppering him with questions about where we were going, how strong were the fighters, and how many fights I could have in a day. He didn't answer me once. So we drove in near silence despite my attempts at conversation until he pulled into a service tunnel that once again led somewhere underground and parked the car. So I guess we're here? I asked when the door opened. It didn't look like much. Some old underground facility they repurposed, I guess? There wasn't much to look at either. Just the tunnel we came through, and a large door going inside. Though it did make sense, a probably illegal underground fight club wouldn't exactly pick a public building, or a place that screamed, illegal things happening here. Hopefully it looked better on the inside. The driver still didn't say anything. Maybe he was mute? So do I just go in there? I tried again. This time I did get an answer. 
The driver just nodded though, so my mute theory was going pretty strong. Okay then, thanks for the ride. Ooh, getting to the arena was pretty easy after that. Apparently the staff was expecting me, so I was guided through what passed for security. Mostly just making sure I wasn't being tracked or recorded, and after a short wait I was pushed through a door into the arena itself. This was much more impressive than the front door. A large dome of some clear material separated the fighters from the crowd, and there were thick metal doors that prevented anyone from just wandering onto the arena floor. The floor itself was big enough that special props could probably be added for events, and was lightly dusted with dirt to make cleanup easier. I couldn't actually see the crowd. The lighting in the back and the shadows around the place made them all look like black blobs, but I could hear them just fine. I could practically feel the floor vibrating from the noise they were making. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another night of electrifying fights. An announcer boomed even over the noise of the crowd. Tonight we have a particularly special event, but before that we have a new challenger to the dome. She may look like a kid, but she's actually an alien conqueror, here to challenge the champions of Earth. Several boos came from the crowd. Let's give a proper Earth greeting to the Scion Califa. Was this a wrestling match? Did I need a catchphrase? No one ever mentioned needing a catchphrase. Anyway, the crowd exploded in cheers, boos, and curses. And as our own special welcome, we here at the Dome have decided to give her our own special greeting. The announcer continued once the noise died down a bit. If she wants to challenge all of Earth, let's give her a taste of what we have to offer. In an everyone versus one match, let's get ready for a dogpile. Once again the crowd lost their collective minds. The giant metal doors rose up enough that the other fighters could walk under them without issue. And there were a bunch of them, easily somewhere around 20. The cool thing was they all either were obviously metahumans, considering the animal traits on several of them, or had some kind of super tech. One guy was even in a full suit of armor and looked like he replaced his entire arm with an energy cannon. That was pretty neat. All of them were in some kind of costume too. I thought there would be more people in just normal clothes, but then again even Leatherneck was in something like a costume and he was just a punching bag. It made me wish I had shown up in my spare set of armor instead of just wearing the undersuit. I felt a little underdressed. Well, only kinda. I did see several people not bothering with a shirt for some reason or another. Did they not get cold? One of them wasn't even wearing shoes. Just these weird little foot wrap things and karate pants. Although I guess if he wore a shirt, he wouldn't be able to show off the snake tattoo on his chest. Still seemed dumb to me though. The rules are simple. The announcer interrupted my musing. The round ends when one side can't fight anymore. Besides that, everything is fair game. Not only that, the last people standing will get to be included in our final special event. So brace yourselves, this is going to be bloody. My opponents all fanned out and started posturing. Some were cracking knuckles, others were posing or playing with whatever weapon they brought, and some were charging energy attacks or guns, all while staring at me. A sharp smile split my face and my hair began to move from the breeze my rising key was producing. This was going to be fun. And here we go, people. 3, 2, 1, begin. Chapter 13 It was almost painful holding myself back from charging straight into the mass of fighters in front of me and just cutting loose. But doing that would mean taking out the squishier, normal fighters before they could show off. Normally I'd be pretty fine with that, but then I wouldn't get to see how they dealt with a stronger, faster, flying opponent and steal it for myself. So I had to wait until the first few crossed the distance to actually take me on. The first to try attacking me were mostly variations of Super Karate Guy, but several were just normal people for the most part. And would you look at that, ladies and gentlemen? It seems like Califa is playing safe and waiting to see what comes her way, but will she be able to handle several masters of the martial arts? I found that out the hard way when I tried one of the blocks I had seen Batman use at one point. It was supposed to be a joint lock, but I overshot and accidentally broke the guy's elbow. Another actually lost a few teeth when I hit him pretty gently in the face. One guy was pretty similar to Leatherneck where he had some kind of durability power, but was way less skilled than the other guys. I guess he ran into the same issue I was where being hard to hurt made it hard to actually train against normal humans, so I ended up using him as a baseball bat for a bit until the guy with the laser cannon for an arm I noticed earlier decided to take a shot at me when he though my back was turned. 
My meat shield took the blast and a few others from some of the others hanging out in the back before the rest of the group started to jump in. Looks like she can. Just look at that carnage. It seems just pure human skill isn't enough to tackle the pint-sized conqueror from the stars, but that isn't all she's up against. She's broken the likes of King Snake and Cobra, but they aren't the only vipers in the arena tonight. How will she fare against a little, augmented humanity? And these were the guys I was looking forward to fighting. The ones that could actually put up a fight. A guy in a metallic snake costume ducked under my improvised shield slash weapon and whipped me in the chest with his tail. I was sent flying but while the hit hurt it hadn't really done any damage. No, that was reserved for the guy that looked like a giant pile of living scrap metal. That guy caught me midair and tried to shove me through the floor, and when that didn't work he tried to punch me through it while the crowd cheered him on. Dust began to billow up from the sheer amount of hits, and I guessed the scrap man was some kind of robot, because he wasn't slowing down. My key surged as if finally managed to get a hand in place to catch one of his fists before it attempted to push me further into the small crater that had formed. The fist ground to a halt and the scrap man grunted in surprise as a key blast caught him in the chest and blew him off of me. The surrounding fighters all took a step back when the dust was blown outward by another key spike, revealing me sporting a blood-stained grin. And she's up. A combo move from Copperhead and Girder looked like that was it for our new arrival, but it looks like not even that beating can keep her down for long. And then Cannon Arm Guy shot me out of the air. I was getting real tired of that guy. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to deal with him as several of the rest of the fighters all tried to jump me before I could recover from the energy blast. I lost track of time and details as I fully concentrated on the fighters surrounding me. I punched, kicked, key blasted and in one case spit everyone that still looked like they wanted to keep fighting. Bones were broken, weapons were shattered, and blood was getting everywhere. Not always because of me either. Some of the fighters didn't hesitate to risk friendly fire if it meant getting a hit on me, usually the ones using regular guns, but since they were taking my punching bags, training dummies, opponents out of the fight, I didn't hesitate to hit them with a key ball and slag their equipment. The big guy made of scrap metal came back for another round and I had fun trying out some of the new techniques I had seen some of the others use before they were taken out, with mixed results because in some cases the size difference was a bit ridiculous. Califa is tearing through the dog pile. Nothing our defending contestants do can put a stop to the tiny alien menace, but here comes Barrage with Ano Dash. I finally had time to turn and face Cannon Arm Guy and send a key blast at him before he got the shot off. The beam of bright yellow key slammed into the red beam of plasma, and for a second, I got my hopes up that I was going to get a beam struggle in the middle of this fight, but while I was fully eager to fight it out energy attack to energy attack, Cannon Arm Guy decided to duck and run the second it was clear his shot wasn't overpowering mine. Their plasma blast. And Califa sends him running. I wasn't letting him get away this time though. I sent one of the few lingering fighters flying with a kick and dashed closer to the armored man. He tried swinging his arm cannon around to focus on me, but I caught it long before he lined up a shot. Then I squeezed down. Whatever metal his suit was made of buckled and warped under my grip as I crushed the barrel of his plasma gun, something I followed up with a hard punch to the chest. With him taken care of, I took a second to look around the arena to see how many fighters were left. I was slightly disappointed that only two, the scrap metal guy from earlier and a giant humanoid shark, were left standing. Both of them bellowed wordlessly and charged, and I charged them right back. Sharky tried to scratch me with the claws he had on the end of his fingers, but I ducked into a somersault handstand and kicked him in the face when he missed. Then, using his face as a springboard I launched myself at Scrap Metal Guy and landed on his chest. What the? I ignored his disbelieving grunt and focused. This guy could take whatever I could dish out normally, so I was going to need something special to make sure he stayed down. He gathered in my fist as I drew it back and then I punched him in the face. Then I did it again, and again and again and again, until I felt something break. I wasn't sure if it was something in my hand or the metal that made up his face, but it didn't matter because his eyes rolled up into his skull and he dropped. Okay, one left. I didn't even get to finish that thought as a seven-foot-tall shark man tackled me off the other fighter and tried to bite me in half. Thankfully, I was instinctually able to get a hand and foot in place to stop Sharky from biting down even if it meant feeling teeth digging into my skin. Hungry, are you? 
I snapped and raised my free hand, key orb forming on my palm. Well, chew on this. I used the resulting explosion to fling myself clear of Sharky's mouth and only looked back when I realized I might have accidentally taken his head off with that attack. I didn't exactly check to see how durable he was. I didn't have to worry though. Sharky waved a hand through the smoke, revealing his mostly undamaged head, clearly still alive. So you thought to take my teeth, you monkey? Sharky growled as he spat several shards of broken teeth onto the arena floor. A natural attempt for an inferior creature like you, but unfortunately my teeth cannot be broken so easily. Even as he spoke I could see new teeth, pushing the old broken ones out of the way. I really just wanted to get away from your bad breath. I shot back. That was way worse than your teeth. Insolent. Prepare yourself. When I get my hands on you, I will tear your flesh from your bones. So don't let him get close then. Anyways it was time to end this. And I knew exactly how I was going to do it. Even if I was blatantly stealing someone else's technique to do it. I cupped my hands together and focused my key. Ka. Humph. Another energy blast? I was barely harmed by your previous one. Better make it count, child. It will be the last one you ever do. Me. King Shark charges Califa. After her last energy attack did no damage, it seems King Shark is going for the kill. Ah, me. Bright cerulean blue key gathered in my hands as I dragged more to the surface and focused it. Sharky wasn't the fastest person in the arena, so my attack was ready with plenty of time to spare. But just to make sure I waited until he was right on top of me, one hand outstretched to claw me before I thrusted my hands out right towards his chest. Ha yeah. This blast was nothing like my little key attacks. It practically swallowed Sharky's huge body before blowing him up and away towards the top of the dome. I was so tempted to see how long I could keep my attack going. It was the first time I pulled off a Kamehameha in a fight. How cool was that? But the ring owners probably wouldn't let me come back if I broke their fancy dome. So I shut off the energy before I melted right through it. Sharky had actually made a perfect indent into the dome cover that was even more obvious when he fell away back onto the arena floor. A quick check confirmed he was still breathing, but definitely unconscious. I win. I threw my hands up in celebration, but was confused when I didn't hear applause. I, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in a stunning final attack, Califa is the last remaining fighter. We have a winner for the dogpile. Let's hear it for our visiting alien invader. Oh, there was the applause. I did a quick victory lap around the arena, waving at the crowd as I basked in my first actual victory since landing on Earth. I really needed to win more. This felt nice. After a while, one of the staff members escorted me out of the arena into a waiting area and explained I was supposed to wait here for a few minutes while they cleaned up the arena for the next event. And since I was the winner, I would be fighting in that one too. They even provided some light snacks. Barely an hour later, I was back in the arena for this special event, which was fine because I was out of snacks and already looking forward to my next fight. Maybe this time it would be someone really strong that I could practice all the cool new things I saw in the dogpile. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our grand special event. Two sides enter, one side leaves. In one corner, we have the alien terror, the conqueror from outer space, Califa. I waved as the crowd exploded into cheers. In the other corner, the bane of crooks and criminals everywhere, the dynamic duo, the Dark Knight and Boy Wonder themselves, Batman and Robin. My head snapped to the other entrance and sure enough, there was Batman and Bird Brain being shoved through the doorway with heavy metal manacles that covered their hands up to their elbows that only fell away once the door closed. Once again, the rules are simple. Both sides fight until one side is dead and gets to walk away to fight another day. If neither side wins, a metal hatch opened up to reveal an automatic turret. Then it's good night for everyone in the arena. Are you ready for a death battle? I was barely listening to the announcer once he told me I was going to be fighting Batman in a serious situation where he wasn't going to be able to hold back or deflect the topic. This was going to be awesome. Growing Pains Chapter 14. The second the match started I couldn't stop myself from bounding forward, eager to test out the new things I had just learned. I saw the hero and his annoying sidekick open their mouths to try talking, probably trying to convince me to stop the fight, but I had been trying to get Batman to take me seriously in training for forever. Yet, every time I brought up more intensive training, 
or sparring he deflected by saying I needed more practice with the basics before that. And while he wasn't wrong, I figured he was more interested in keeping an eye on me than giving me new skills. But now he couldn't stop me, and I got to beat up Birdbrain at the same time. But first, Batman. Birdbrain cried out when I jump kicked at his mentor's head, missing by a slim margin. That didn't stop me though, and I instantly dashed back at him the second my foot hit the floor. Batman kept trying to avoid me and create distance, but I wasn't going to let that happen, and we're off to an acrobatic opening. I distantly heard the announcer shout, Califa isn't giving Batman room to breathe in a stunning display of martial arts, but he is countering her move for move. But since the Dark Knight isn't a broken mess, it looks like our little alien menace has decided she wants to play with her food. I mean, he wasn't wrong. If I wanted to just win then, I would be blasting them from the air with key attacks. But where's the fun in that? The first hint that I might have dismissed Robin a bit too much was three little pellets landing in between me and Batman just after I failed to get him into a joint lock. Then they exploded and I was choking on the thick smoke they spewed out while Batman slipped away. Ashy, Stay out of this bird brain. I coughed. I'm fighting Batman first. Why are you fighting us at all? You stupid monkey. The brat yelled back. We're in a fighting ring. What else would we do here? An illegal fight ring. Batman spoke up. And we didn't choose to be here. So wait. That bit with the manacles wasn't just so you could pretend you weren't here on purpose? I asked. Did you really get caught by these guys? How? Robin blushed bright red and averted his gaze. Naturally, that meant I had a laser focus on him. You messed up, didn't you? I stated. I don't know what you're talking about. Ah. Uh, you did. Ha ha ha. I was forced to hover midair from how hard I was laughing. Bang. Only to stop when a bullet impacted the ground by my feet. A quick reminder that this is a death match. The announcer said threateningly. No stopping halfway through for a chat. I stopped smiling. This random person was telling me how to fight? When he hadn't even shown himself at all? I must have grown a sense of pride when I wasn't looking because the thought of someone I could almost guarantee was weaker than me in every way that mattered ordering me around rubbed me in all kinds of wrong ways. I silently pointed a hand at the turret that had shot at me and vaporized it with a bright yellow key blast. Don't tell me what to do. I said darkly. Then I turned back to Batman and Robin, who were both looking much more on edge than before. Well, at least it looked like they were going to take this seriously now. He's not entirely wrong though. We can talk later. For now I'm going to have fun with this. This time I charged Robin with a sharp grin on my face. To the kid's credit, he didn't freeze up or anything like that. Instead he somersaulted over my head by using my shoulder as a springboard and tried kicking at my back. Too bad it was a move he used against me a lot in our occasional spar, so I was ready to turn and catch his foot on my forearm before punching him in the jaw. I wasn't ready for Batman to take advantage of the opening to pump me like a football, though. So that's the way you eep? Batman didn't settle for just a single kick. I looked up just in time for a batarang to fly by, narrowly missing hitting me in the face followed by several more that I had to throw myself to the side to avoid and incidentally interrupting my attempts at mid-fight banter. I ignored the tiny boomerang things hitting the arena wall and exploding and focused on my two opponents. I saw Robin nod at something Batman said, and both of them splitting up so we all formed a rough triangle. Then I was stuck dodging as the two started throwing all kinds of things at me. Explosive discs, smoke bombs, taser things, and a few more. I wasn't going to touch them after I tried catching a taser batarang with the intent on throwing it back, only for it to go off immediately. My hand was still tingly. Ayan were back in the AC action, folks. Our crime-fighting duo is keeping Califa at bay with an impressive amount of projectiles. But try as they might, the tiny alien terror is simply too slippery to get hit. But that might not be enough to take her out, she hasn't gotten serious yet. I ignored the announcer again since it was clear he had no idea what Batman had planned. All of Robin's throws were aimed to distract or disorient me. They made noise, kicked up dirt and sand, and made smoke. Sure. But the biggest thing they did was conceal where Batman's throws were coming from. Those were always thrown so I would have to dodge out of the way and were thrown hard enough that they usually didn't stop until they hit the arena walls. I was cheating with key sense, something I was pretty sure Batman didn't know about, to keep an eye on where the two were. 
and it was needed after a few seconds when nearly the entire arena was covered in smoke. But his projectiles didn't have key in them. I needed to use my other senses to avoid those. It was difficult, stressful, and incredibly frustrating trying to keep an eye on two people with one sense and as many as seven small flying objects with the rest. And I was having a blast with it. Here I was, an alien from space with powers far beyond a normal human and in a wide open room. And Batman had still managed to change the environment around to suit him and give me a hard time. Sure, I wasn't using most of those powers, but I had already determined this was going to be a test of skill, not strength. Speaking of Batman, he must have run out of things to throw at me because I could sense him getting closer. I turned to face him right as he burst through the smoke and went low, trying to kick his legs out from under him. He jumped over it in a move so smooth, I would have sworn it was practiced if I didn't know better. My own dodge when he punched straight down was jerky and uncoordinated in comparison. You would think punching the ground as hard as you could would make a human pause for a bit, but Batman was shifting into a different stance the second he made contact. I dodged, weaved, and counterattacked as best I could while forcing myself to react at human limits. Why couldn't this be how we normally trained? Because you still need to brush up on the basics, Batman said, making me realize I said that last bit out loud. Then he took advantage of me over committing to a punch to throw me over his shoulder and into the floor. Hard. I wheezed a bit as the air was forcefully driven from my lungs and rolled when Batman went to smash my diaphragm, only to fall into a trap when it turned out to be a feint, and he caught me by the wrist and put me in an armbar. You know I could break out of this, right? I grunted as I allowed my arm to be forced into a rather uncomfortable position. You'll lose your game if you do, he replied. Ite sakari. Figures he would have realized what I was doing by now. So what now? I might not be able to win right now, but you'll probably get tired before I do, and I don't think our friends are going to be happy if one of us just gives up, you know? Batman sighed in defeat. What do you want? More sparring matches like this one, and you aren't allowed to hold back anymore. I haven't been holding back. You really do need that much practice with the basics before I could teach you more. Yeah, but you could at least mix things up now and again. Batman didn't sigh again but I had a feeling he wanted to. Deal. Cool. I chirped with a wide smile. And with that I was released. So what now? Ooh. By now the entirety of the arena was just a mass of smoke. The organizers definitely hadn't thought about someone using so many smoke bombs that it could cover the entire floor, so there were no countermeasures for it. Something the crowd was starting to get annoyed by. They had come to see a fight. Not just stare at some smoke for several minutes before too many of them could start making a fuss. A massive yellow beam tore through the smoke and a nearby wall. Then, even more of it started getting pushed away as I flared my key higher and higher. And it looks like this might be the beginning of the end. Ladies and gentlemen, Califa has apparently decided to stop playing around and has cleared the smoke screen with one attack. But what's this? Our boy Wonder doesn't seem to be in the ring anymore. It looks like the dynamic duo is down a member. Was he caught up in that last blast? The grumbles were replaced with cheers as the crowd's bloodlust peaked. I rose a bit further into the air and attempted to speak, but couldn't get anything out over the noise. That was pretty impressive, actually. I just hovered in place, arms crossed, tapping a finger while I waited for the noise to die down. Once it finally did, I raised my hand and pointed down at Batman dramatically. Everyone, listen up. That killed the last of the noise. I have just one thing to say before I end this. As the future conqueror of Earth, I judge Batman as a worthy champion I must defeat. A champion of skill. But the crowd seemed to lean in, waiting for what I was going to say next. I can't do that yet. So I give up. There was a beat of silence, and then the crowd erupted in rage at being denied their entertainment. Too bad for them I didn't really care. Well, that was certainly a surprise. In a shocking turn of events, Califa has forfeited the match. But don't worry, folks. We promised you a death match, so that's what you're going to get. Unleash the turrets. At the announcer's command, there were a bunch of mechanical groans as the turrets he mentioned tried to deploy. But it turned out Batman had already beaten him there. While I had assumed he had been using the earlier smokescreen to attack me by surprise, it had really been so that he could disable the turrets around the arena without anyone noticing. 
Of course there were a handful that he missed, but it was easy enough for me to blast them with a key attack before they could really get going. Ah, uh, him. Nothing to worry about, folks. We have contingencies for just such an Akka's BAM. W wait. What are you doing in here? There were a few sounds of a struggle over the system before Robin's smug voice rang out. And that's one hack of an announcer taken care of. With that taken care of, it's a total victory for the heroes. I hope you all enjoyed the show, ladies and gentlemen. Please feel free to give us a review while we wait for the police to help you on your way out. Thank you and have a nice day. By then, even the dumbest in the crowd had realized the fight club had lost control of the situation and started running for the exit, but it was no use as several security gates slammed closed at the exits. Not the best ending to my first fight arena, but I still had fun. I'd have to check back with the recruiter guy to see if they had a branch that wasn't dumb enough to kidnap Batman and see if they were looking for new fighters later. Ooh, so how'd you get caught anyway? I asked as Batman and Robin waited for the last of the fight ring organizers to get carted away. We were investigating a few disappearances and stumbled across a recruiting center. Batman said simply, opting to just leave it there. And I tried to stop the recruiter from escaping out the back. Robin rubbed the back of his head and sheepishly added, There was a gas trap we didn't see. I just stared at him. That was it? Wow, that's so lame. Yeah, well what about you? Did you just follow the first stranger offering you a fight, you muscle-brained monkey? Robin snapped. Then when I didn't reply, he smirked. You totally did, didn't you? Shut up, bird brain. I was looking for someone else to train me while Batman was busy. That doesn't make it any better, he laughed. I wasn't about to take that lying down and tackled him to the ground where we both tried to wrestle the other into submission. I was so focused on delivering sweet justice to the bird-brained idiot that I didn't notice Batman shake his head and walk off with a small smile on his face. Growing Pains, Chapter 15 You know there are easier ways to get my attention, right? Yeah, but this is the most fun. I smiled as I adjusted the weight of the car so it wasn't slipping off my shoulder anymore. The Flash wasn't as amused as I was. Or at least he was pretending to not be. It was bad form for a superhero to laugh at the police chief when his car was stolen by a passing supervillain and held hostage 20 feet off the ground, not when the guy was right there. Especially since this was the fifth time I've done something like this. Flash hadn't exactly been thrilled to find out he had been training a supervillain instead of the aspiring hero he had assumed I was. But after a week of needling him, I managed to work out a similar deal to the one I had with Batman. I wouldn't do major crimes in Central City in return for continued speed training. He tried avoiding me a bit and relying on our agreement to keep me from doing something too noticeable. So I went to someone that would complain loud enough that Flash would need to check in even if I wasn't doing anything super evil. And the police chief could certainly yell. Especially when his 1965 Mustang kept mysteriously finding itself in places a car couldn't get to, like a roof or a tree. Luckily for him, there was a helpful alien invader that would be happy to get it down, as long as he could get the Flash here for a bit. Flash told me I could stop after the third time. I kept doing it because it was funny. That is not the way to treat a classic. Flash shook his head in mock despair. Come on, give the chief back his car. I know what you want. Sure thing. I dropped the car back in a parking lot and ignored the police chief as he rushed to inspect the thing for damage. Seriously, it was a car. An old one, sure, but older doesn't always mean better. And there was certainly no reason to cry about it. Normal spot, then? Flash asked, doing some light stretches with a challenging smile. You're on. After a silent three count, both of us went speeding towards the city limits. Needless to say, Flash beat me by a few miles. Ooh. Two hours later, I was laying on the ground, drenched in sweat and panting like a dog. All I could do was glare at Flash who, despite everything I tried, was barely sweating at all. And I couldn't even be sure that wasn't from just standing around in the sun for a few hours. Hey, don't give me that look. You're doing much better than when we started. He said genuinely. And if he stopped there you could mistake him for being a kind, caring individual. Who knows? In a year or so, you might get me to break into a light jock. Yep, there it was. Jerk. Oh, come on. Is that any way to treat your favorite training partner? Flash continued when I glared harder. You aren't my favorite. Hockey's my favorite. 
It's just that it's really hard to find her before she moves cities or she has her partner with her. And I can't fight both of them at once yet. Oof, scathing. Flashmon grabbing his chest in pain. Well, anyway, I've got to run. I've got a date in a few minutes. Wouldn't want to be late. Is a few minutes enough time to get there and be ready? Sure it is. I'm the fastest man alive. He said confidently. Oh, I feel bad for your date then. Yeah. Wait, what do you mean by that? Nothing, I said innocently. Just that it's a shame if all your dates end too soon because you go too fast. Flash narrowed his eyes at me and tried to guess if I was implying what he thought I was. Unfortunately for him, I was used to trying to hide my thoughts and reactions from Batman, not that it seemed to make a difference, and Flash was certainly not Batman. Eventually, he gave up his one-sided staring contest and turned towards the city. Right. Well, stay out of trouble. Don't go trying to take over a city or something. Huh. I wasn't about to tell him that was my next idea on how to force Superman to fight me. The Metropolis mayoral election was next week. I was totally going to crash it and declare myself mayor. Flash gave me a two-fingered salute and began to run back to get ready for his date. He made it all of three steps when there was a massive flash of light behind us. We both turned to see what looked like a dozen flaming meteors burning through the atmosphere trailing dark black smoke. It didn't take long for me to realize these weren't normal meteors. Those didn't tend to change direction midair and scatter in several directions. Huh. Looks like another alien invasion. I idly commented, causing Flash to slump over. I'm not going to be on time for my date, am I? He asked rhetorically. Ooh. From what I gathered on the internet, the last three alien invasions used the same plan that went something along the lines of this. Step 1. Invade in one big group. Step 2. Use landing location as a beachhead to attack nearby city. Or for the more aggressive ones, just attack city directly. Step 3. Quickly overrun the population and military forces until nearby hero, or Superman, shows up. Step 4. Send out champions that are the pinnacle exception in strength compared to the rest of the invasion force. Step 5. Lose. Step 6. Pull back all forces and flee because without champions X, the invasion force is too small to actually hold the planet and the foot soldiers like living, or because the champion was the invasion force. And, optional, step 7. Leave champions behind to act as infiltrators slash scouts for when the next invasion occurs. And considering that these invasions were usually wrapped up in less than a day, a lot of people didn't bother panicking unless they were right near the initial invasion point since everything would go back to normal by tomorrow. So when the black smoke being trailed by the meteors turned into oily black clouds that covered the entire sky and showed no signs of dissipating almost a day later, people started to worry. They began outright panicking when it turned out that the invasion force was actually the second wave and that several people in the military, government, and science facilities had been replaced by shape-shifting aliens that had sabotaged local responses and revealed more machines that were pumping the air with black stuff all over the continent. The following armies of white, gray, and black, gelatinous, homicidal goo people with laser rifles didn't do much to calm them down either. Fortunately for the humans, and unfortunately for me, the aliens themselves weren't so tough that a person with a gun couldn't at least hold them off for a bit. So it wasn't like the invaders were just rolling over any resistance just yet. But there were a lot of them, and they weren't even fun to fight. Get off this planet. I yelled as I vaporized another squad of goo people. I was here first. I called dibs. I'd have said that I'd lost count of how many of the invaders I had done that to by now, but that would imply I was keeping count to begin with. I was far more interested in stopping them from blowing up my favorite restaurants than counting blown up aliens. Central was the only city I'd found so far that had decent serving sizes and didn't try calling the police whenever I just wanted something to eat. I wasn't going to let some random invasion force me to go hunting for decent food again. I spotted another group going down 5th Street, shooting at people as they ran away and wrecking buildings thanks to some kind of armored vehicle that looked like a misshapen potato attached to four spider legs that also shot lasers. I flew over to it, blasted three of the legs off, caught it by the remaining one, and started using it as a giant hammer to squish the smaller foot soldiers running around in panic. Then when there was only one remaining, I swooped down and grabbed it by its skin? You and lifted it into the air. All right, slimeball, listen up. 
I was having a good day until you jerks decided to show up. So, I'm going to give you one chance to tell me where your leader is so I can politely tell them to turn around and get off this planet before I vaporize all of you. Sound good? The alien made a weird repetitive hissing sound that I eventually recognized as an attempt at laughter. We are the Imperium. We will conquer this pathetic planet and feed on it. You humans cannot stop this. Even your power will just make us stronger. Sorry, not a human. I'm a scion. Got the tail and everything. I said, waving said appendage behind me. I then got to witness the fascinating experience of something going absolutely statue still for a moment, before frantically doing its best to claw my hand off its skin, and when that didn't work, claw away at itself in order to escape. The whole sudden spectacle shocked me enough that I just floated in stunned disbelief even after the goo person managed to free itself only to fall several hundred feet back to the ground where it splattered on impact. What the hell was that about? Unfortunately for me, the universe didn't suddenly leap to answer my question. But that didn't mean the invasion had stopped just because something weird happened to me. A nearby explosion drew my attention to another one of those walking potato tanks and more foot soldiers. Welp, guess the only thing left to do is find another alien to explain what the heck just happened. And if that one didn't give me an answer? Well, there were plenty more of them wandering around. Ooh. Hours later I was tired, hungry, and absolutely covered in soot from all the fires popping up all over the city. Not to mention I was starting to get really pissed off that I wasn't any closer to finding out why the invaders were freaking out about a single scion child on the planet they were attacking. Did science actually exist in this universe? And if so, why am I what's causing them to panic, rather than the yellow sun-charged Kryptonian that should be a much bigger threat? Sure, a group of science would absolutely demolish these Imperium guys, but it was only me here. My musing was interrupted by a red blur streaking by and doubling back that predictably turned out to be the Flash. He looked a bit scuffed up and more tired than I had ever seen him. Not that that said much, but he also looked pretty happy to see me so I guess he was fine. Hey kid, glad to see you're okay. Flash said quickly. And I heard you were doing a pretty good job taking care of the city. A lot of people were talking about it. I scowled. I wasn't exactly doing that for the people here. But if they were grateful I better get a few free meals at least. Cool, great to hear. I'm guessing the heroes won, and now it's just dealing with the leftovers? If so I was going to be bummed. Despite the amount of destruction they caused, the Imperium was kinda weak. I was hoping for one good fight at least. Yeah, about that. Flash rubbed the back of his head awkwardly. Ooh. Minutes later I was standing in the middle of an American army base and surrounded by several heroes including Superman, Hockey, and Wonder Woman who I actually hadn't been able to meet before now. Normally, I'd be ecstatic about that, but I was currently too busy glaring daggers at the green-skinned man in a blue cape. I'm sorry. I don't think I heard you right. Run that by me again? I grit out. Martian Manhunter didn't have any hair, so it looked a little weird when he raised an eye ridge at me. As I said before, the Imperium planned to terraform this planet into a feeding ground. I don't mean that. I angrily swiped a hand through the air. I meant, what do you mean you left Batman behind? I could feel a bunch of looks from the other heroes, but I ignored all of them. Or at least I was going to until Superman put a hand on my shoulder, and I began to debate if it was worth hitting him with a full power Kamehameha. Look, Califa, I know it's hard to hear. He was my friend too. But these things happen, and sometimes there's nothing you can do. Batman's gone. Growing Pains, Chapter 16 Batman's gone. I knew the words were wrong. I knew Batman wouldn't just get quietly taken out from something like the Imperium. He was probably hiding out somewhere in one of his thousands of bolt holes, sciencing up some gizmo that would be crucial to removing the goo people from the planet, just waiting for the right time to make his reappearance. The problem was, as much as I knew that, I couldn't prove it. While I had never specifically told anyone about my key sense, Batman had picked up that I had some way of sensing where people were. He probably figured out it had something to do with key from my attempts to teach him and Robin how to use the stuff. And while he never actually managed to use key techniques, he was able to reduce his presence to the point I couldn't find him unless he wanted me to in like a week. That was coming back to bite me because unless I got close and he wasn't attempting to hide, I'd never be able to pick out his specific key signature from everyone in my range. Of course, 
Just telling everyone he was still alive because he was Batman only got me some pitying looks and more attempts at consolation. Looking like a child despite being a kick-ass scion warrior did have its occasional downsides. Batman's gone. But worst of all was that tiny niggling voice in the back of my head. The one that kept treacherously asking, but what if they're right? I did my best to ignore that one. Do you mind if I sit down? A voice interrupted my spiraling thoughts. I looked up to see Wonder Woman standing there with two trays of food. I did my best to avoid making a face. Emery's weren't the horror stories I had heard of, but they still weren't great. Sure, go ahead. I motioned to an empty spot on the bench next to me before going back to looking out into the distance. Although, not going to lie, when everything is being covered up by nasty black clouds, looking out into the horizon loses a lot of its appeal. I accepted one of the trays as it had been meant for me and dug in. Blee, overcooked noodles and a watery tomato sauce. So why did you want to sit by me? I asked as I took another bite of food. Shouldn't you still be busy planning how to deal with the whole invasion thing? Wonder Woman bit into her own food, and I could tell she didn't find it much better than I did. We're taking a small break for now. The others are checking in on friends or family, or doing as I am, and taking some time for a meal. She said after a small pause. Flash actually suggested I stop, by since he needed to check in on his protoge. Oh yeah, Kid Flash. I hadn't actually met him in person yet since most of my activities tended to happen in the middle of the week when he would still be in school, but I had at least heard he existed during the aftermath of my first fight with Hockey. Guess it made sense Flash would want to check in on him. I wonder if anyone was going to check on Robin, and if he had heard a boo. Nope. Not thinking about that. Okay, why though? He thought it might be easier to talk about the loss of someone close to you with someone of the same gender. He isn't dead. To my surprise, Wonder Woman didn't immediately just try to get me to accept otherwise. Instead, she just nodded at my words. But that doesn't change the fact that he isn't here right now, does it? I scowled, but she had a point. So what do you plan on doing next? Not going to tell me what I should be doing. I couldn't help but ask. Would you listen if I did? Wonder Woman shook her head. I know better than to tell a warrior what to do when they've committed themselves to a certain path even one as young as you. You already know what you are going to do. Huh. She could read me pretty well. That was a surprise. Yeah. I'm going to go back to the base the others escaped from, and I'm going to go find Batman. And if there's no one left for you to find? My eyes hardened as I looked back out to the horizon where I could sense one of the Imperium's bases. Then I reduced the rest of the invasion force to ash and make them wish they had never stepped foot on this planet. I declared resolutely. Wonder Woman looked sad when I said that but didn't say anything against it. She just collected the now empty trays, ruffled my hair, and went back inside the army base. I followed not long after because the MRE was an okay snack, but I was still hungry. Maybe the cafeteria had something better? Ooh, it didn't, as it turned out. More food, certainly. Better? Nah. But leaving the cafeteria with a full stomach and maybe slightly traumatized kitchen staff, I was politely escorted to a meeting room where all the heroes were going over their plan of attack. When I asked why, I was simply told that if they couldn't stop me from attacking the Imperium, they could at least be there to support me. Which is how I found myself being bored to near tears as the Martian Manhunter droned on and on and on. Yeah, it was soothing at first. But after a while, soothing shifts into boring. Especially when the speaker doesn't emphasize anything and monologues in the same dull tone. Even the black green lantern guy looked like he was having trouble staying awake. Located in the main structure. This room has an advanced crystal that is responsible for creating the ionized gas terraforming the planet to suit the Imperium's needs. Oh sweet Oozuru. He's still talking. Should the crystal be destroyed, the Imperium will be limited to operating at night. This will be to our advantage as while they are psychically nearly on par with Martians, they cannot stand direct sunlight for more than a few seconds at most. This is how my people were able to stall their advance for centuries. Could we destroy the it with a bombing run or artillery strike? One of the army people asked. No, there is a shield surrounding the structure that your weapons will not be able to penetrate. We will need to approach from the ground and make our way into the structure from there. I bet I could break it. Then we will continue focusing on surrounding the structure and supporting the strike team. Someone whose name I forgot, 
but remembered being introduced as a general spoke up, looking at the six heroes surrounding the table in turn. I didn't mind not being included in the count. I wasn't a hero after all, and now that there was a plan in place I could go back to doing my own thing. And where do you think you're going? Hawkey called out when I tried slipping out of the room while they were talking. I turned back to her glaring at me like, well, a hawk. Nowhere special. I'm just going to go poke at the Imperium. You got your plan, right? So I don't have to hang around anymore. It would be better if we waited. Manhunter said. That will allow the sun more time to rise. But the clouds will take some time to go away, right? So why not get the cloud machine out of the way now? All the heroes gave each other a few looks before nodding. Looks like they agreed. Ooh. I glared at the lumpy black gray and red structure in the distance as once again my key sense showed no signs of Batman being in the area. But I already knew that didn't mean much. I was vaguely aware of the heroes splitting off in random directions. Each of them splitting up so they could distract the Imperium guarding the structure and find a way inside. All except for Wonder Woman who decided to stand next to me for some reason. Shouldn't you be going to help them? I couldn't help but ask. I will soon, she said assuringly. But I wanted to see what you would do. According to the others, you have great strength yourself. Perhaps I wanted to see it in action for myself. I shrugged. I would have thought an Amazon warrior princess would have wanted to be at the front of the assault. But if she wanted to see me put on a show, I wasn't going to stop her. Suit yourself. Though you might want to move to the side a bit. I warned her. Oh, why is that? Wonder Woman asked, even as she took a few steps away. I planted my feet and cupped my hands at my side. Because I'm going to go right through their front door. K-M-E-E. -E. I paid no attention to the humans that were suddenly startled by the ball of blue key forming in my hands. Instead, I focused on dredging up every scrap of energy I could and focusing it into one point. Hey Mimi, -E -E. Unlike the time I had done this in the arena, there was no real rush to fire my technique. There was no one rushing to stop me, no one forcing me to hurry up. Just me, a glowing ball of weaponized life energy, and a target. And that target was about to disappear. Hi, Aya. -ia. A four foot thick beam of cerulean light lit up the area and launched towards the Imperium structure. Thanks to the invaders building on top of a rocky, mountainous area, there was nothing in between them and my attack that I needed to worry about. Nothing beyond the shield manhunter warned us about. Too bad for them it held for all of half a second before the beam attack tore right through it and into the structure it was protecting. I kept the Kamehameha going as long as I could until I sensed it punching out the back of the structure before I stopped pouring in key and let the attack sputter out. Ah, ah, ah. For several seconds the only sound was my panting breaths. Everyone was just standing still, looking at either me or the hole I put in the Imperium base. Man, that took a lot out of me. Great Hera. Wonder Woman breathed eventually. But there was no time for everyone to stand around basking in how awesome I was. The heroes were all converging on the hole I blew open. If I didn't hurry, they would beat the alien leader before I could do it myself. I kicked off the ground and started floating towards the alien structure. Okay, last one there is a bald tail. I shouted back to the still stunned humans, making up a suitably insulting scion saying, Sainji, on the spot, and then racing ahead. Ooh. The past several solar cycles had not been particularly pleasant for John Johns. It had started with the Imperium finally breaching the quarantine his people had maintained for centuries, a large group of them smashing through the defenses and making their way towards their neighboring planet, Earth. When it became clear that the various Martian governments were not going to immediately send aid, too busy debating the worth of such an action and how to go about it, John had decided to use his own authority as a manhunter to pursue them. Even if humanity hadn't been judged ready to join the rest of the interstellar community, Mars could not afford to allow the Imperium to flourish by consuming the Earthlings only to return to continue their assault on his people later especially due to their own isolationist habits, keeping them from making allies, willing to assist them in combating the parasites. Of course, it was thanks to those isolationist tendencies that led to him being surprised just how much contact the younger civilization had been exposed to in such a short amount of time. Humanity was very aware they weren't alone in the galaxy and had several other species revealing themselves all over the planet. A few Thanagarians, a Kryptonian, 
and some others he was passingly familiar with. Even a few races he had not heard of before such as the newest arrival, a scion. They even somehow had three active Green Lanterns. John had been hopeful that the presence of so many defenders would lead to a swift defeat of the Imperium. He had not anticipated that the Parasites had already infiltrated the Earthlings and sabotaged any coordinated defense. Thanks to that, and the humans' tribal nature, Earth was doing its best to repel the attackers. But the response was disorganized. Scattered. That was why he had called out to several of the heroes and crafted a plan to strike at the most vulnerable point of the Imperium, the source of the putrid smoke that protected them from the light and allowed them to thrive outside their subterranean dwellings. He could honestly say he had not counted on the Scion Girl nearly revealing his trump card ahead of schedule, or her pushing the schedule forward by vaporizing a significant portion of the Imperium's defenses with a single energy attack, but if there was one word that could be ascribed to Martians, it was that they were adaptable. He led the Superman, the Flash, the Hawkwoman, and a Green Lantern through the remaining hallways towards the central chamber, using strength, shape-shifting, and psychic feedback caused by phasing through others to incapacitate as many of the Imperium soldiers as possible while still moving forward. It was a careful dance, trying to advance while not overextending and allowing themselves to be overwhelmed once again like they had in their initial assault. But with only one previous confrontation working together, the comrades he had gathered were showing a remarkable improvement in teamwork and cooperation. Gone were many of the little hesitations, the accidental interference, and independent actions. And as such, the five of them ran over the opposition like a carefully directed rock slide, which only became more effective when the Wonder Woman burst through a wall and assisted in destroying a couple walkers, keeping them from their goal. The Imperium fell before their combined might and soon John stood not only within feet of the ionization crystal that was the target of this assault, but also before the supreme leader of the Imperium, the purple and black ball of flesh invoking revulsion in the Manhunter. Joan and John's, it has been a long time. The leader projected telepathically. We should have known you would follow us to this world. You have stubbornly defied us for centuries. And I will continue to defy you and any of your kind. You will never be welcome in this solar system, John replied, preparing himself for the confrontation as he felt the beginnings of a mental attack from the bulbous creature before him. You cannot stop us. Even against one of the great destroyers, the Imperium will prevail. A mental spike briefly dazed John even as the creature's tendrils reached out to grab him. At the same time, hundreds of Imperium soldiers rushed in from the few undamaged passageways and engaged the rest of his comrades, preventing them from coming to John's assistance. No matter, John was fully prepared to wrestle with the parasite himself. He just had to hold on until, you're hiding something. The parasite accused, mental tendrils scraping at the walls of his mind, as physical ones tried ravaging his flesh. A secret deep eye in the recesses of your mind. Is this another of your Martian tricks? Do I sense fear? The leader focused all of its attention on John, trying to breach his defenses. What are you hiding? Just according to plan. Now, John roared over the sound of combat. The presence of the human he had mentally shielded from everyone had finally managed to get into position, unnoticed by everyone and everything in the room. An explosion destroyed the protective casing of the ionic crystal, allowing the Batman access to place the necessary device onto the crystal itself. Red lines faded to blue as the technology took effect. What have you done? The parasite screeched in dismay as the blue coloration began to spread through the structure. Reverse the ion charge. The Batman explained simply. Kill him. Destroy the crystal. Every remaining soldier aimed their weapons at the human, and for a second John was worried the human wouldn't survive, but a small shape flew next to the Batman a moment before they fired and carried him off. The ground where he had been standing was pockmarked with laser blasts, but the crystal remained untouched as the anionic charge being produced by it created a shielding effect from the Imperium's weapons. Hi guys, sorry I'm late. I got a little lost. The Scion, Califa, said exuberantly. And Batman, I knew you were alive. No way these Imperium creeps were enough to take you down. Even as John wrestled with the Imperium leader, he couldn't help but grin that the young girl hadn't lost her mentor. 
It had pained him to deceive her, having seen too many young children receive news that a family member had fallen to the Imperium, but it had been necessary that no one knew of the plan in advance, lest they risk it being discovered too early. In an ironic twist, the energy of the reversed crystal caused a bright blue beam to pierce the clouds in a very similar manner to the Scion Girl's earlier attack. The energy burned away at the cover, allowing the rays of the morning sun to shine through the holes in the building. The parasites began to flee as the light landed on them and began to burn them away. The soldiers died in seconds. The leader was stronger, but it began to boil and scream in agony just the same. Damn you, Joan and Johns. Damn you. Nengi Yea. What's the matter? Does this burn your pale, putrid skin? John said savagely as he gripped the parasite by as many of its tendrils he could grasp, even the ones embedded in his own body. This isn't over. Even if I am destroyed, the Imperium survives. And you have unleashed a far more destructive force upon this world. The Great Destroyer leaves only death and empty worlds in its wake. The leader wailed even as its cellular structure was finally destroyed by the sunlight. John ignored the parasite's final words and focused on keeping it as illuminated as possible until nothing remained of the creature that had started a nightmare on his home planet. One that was finally over. So, uh, good news is we won. But what was that about a great destroyer? John looked up to see that his six companions had joined in a circle around him while the child, Califa, was hovering protectively behind the Batman. I do not know. John answered the flash. In the many years the Martians have fought the Imperium, they have never mentioned such a thing. Perhaps it was merely a deception to allow it time to escape from the sunlight. If it was, it sure didn't work out. The dark-skinned Green Lantern commented. Still, after all that time under those clouds, I know I'm going to enjoy a nice sunrise. Yeah, you and me both. The Flash added, It's certainly a welcome sight. The Wonder Woman agreed. Humph, as long as the skies are clear I don't care if it's the sun or the moon. I'm just glad they're gone. The Hawkwoman scowled, drawing John and the others' attention to Earth's natural satellite as it began to make its journey towards the horizon, still fully visible in the early dawn hours. Oh shit, that's not good. All eyes turned to the scion child at the sudden foul language and worried tone. The Superman began to ask what was wrong, but Califa seemed almost hypnotized by the sight of the moon. Then she began to change. Growing Pains, Chapter 17 The seven heroes could only watch in stunned disbelief as the small scion child transformed into a five-story tall ape-like creature in the span of seconds. Interestingly, her black bodysuit and armor grew to match her new height while her whole body was covered in a coarse layer of brown fur even her normally black hair shifting to match. The only indication of her normal hairstyle was the slight mane of longer fur falling around her shoulders. Her arms and legs thickened into massively powerful limbs that effortlessly smashed through the walls of the Imperium outpost. And most disconcerting, her eyes, normally filled with mischievous playfulness or curiosity, shifted to pure red orbs of malice. Semi-freed from the confines of the outpost, the great ape roared its fury for the world to hear before raising both arms into the air and smashing them down on the increasingly ruined building. Not content with a single attack, the huge figure began to thrash mindlessly around, causing an impressive amount of destruction in a short amount of time. Guess we know what that thing meant by Great Destroyer now, huh? Flash commented as the rest of them regrouped nearby. Despite being surprised by the transformation, all of them were quick to move when it became clear Califa's change could bring the roof collapsing down on all of them. So, uh, did anyone know she could do this? Cause the giant monkey form is a surprise to me. There was a chorus of no's with the noticeable exception of Batman. When I questioned her about her background, she mentioned a planet full of giant lizards she beat by waiting until she grew big enough to take them. I assumed she meant waiting until she was older, but if she meant this... The Dark Knight trailed off. Oh cool, did she mention how to snap her out of it by any chance? Manhunter closed his eyes and put his hands to his temples in concentration. Her mind is full of rage. Until she calms down, I will not be able to communicate with her. No chance you can just put her to sleep or something? Hawkwoman asked. No, her emotions are too powerful for me to influence in her current condition. 
he said. We will need to find some other way to deal with her. Hawkwoman looked back at the rampaging giant and palmed her mace. Think we can knock her out before she wanders off then? We aren't that far away from a city. If she makes it there before we stop her. No one needed to imagine the damage a 50-foot giant monkey could do to the place. We might not need to go that far. Superman offered. All she's done is wreck the outpost. We could just keep her here until she calms down, or we find a way to change her back. It's far enough that we wouldn't need to worry about civilians. Wonder Woman agreed. With the beginnings of a plan in place Batman, turned to Green Lantern. Any chance there's something in the non-restricted section of your ring about Scions transforming? Or how to change them back? Green Lantern raised an eyebrow at him. And why do you know Scions have a restriction on their information? Never mind. From what I can see here, Scions can transform into that form by being exposed to cosmic radiation reflected off celestial bodies. The only ways listed for them to change back is for them to tire out or for the source of the radiation to disappear. There is also one other way, but I don't think we want to do anything permanent. A few of them realized he was talking about putting her down for good and understandably balked at the thought of killing a child, especially those who had interacted with her frequently. So what? We have to somehow blow up the moon? Hawkwoman questioned. Whoa, wait a second. Flash threw up his hands. I'm pretty sure blowing up the moon is a bad idea. For like, a few reasons. No one is blowing up the moon. Wonder Woman put her foot down on that particular idea. If all we need to do is remove the source, then we just need to keep her here until the moon sets. We just need to make sure nothing catches her attention or for her to wander off. As if despite those words, several explosions bloomed on and around the giant monkey, causing it to roar in pain and anger and start looking for the source of the attack. What was that? Where did it come from? Manhunter was the first one to find the cause of the commotion. It's the army. They think she is a last resort by the Imperium. Tell them to call off the attacks. Batman demanded. The city is right behind them. They'll lure her towards it. It's too late. She's already noticed them. Sure enough, the great ape had turned back to the military forces that had been firing on her. Before any of the heroes could react, a bright yellow light erupted from her maw and utterly destroyed several of the artillery platforms there, sending the army soldiers scrambling for cover. To make things even worse, Califa hadn't lost interest after destroying the platforms. She was slowly breaking her way out of the now thoroughly ruined outpost and was heading towards the army group. Superman was the first to speak up. We have to distract her. Keep her from hurting anyone until she changes back. Right? Distract King Kong from breaking everything. Anyone know where we can find a pretty blonde in a white dress? Flash quipped before taking off in a streak of red, the other heroes not far behind. Ooh. As it turned out, Distracting the giant monkey from going after the army was easier said than done, Clark noted before refocusing on the task in front of him. Superman made a note of Flash and Green Lantern taking off towards the soldiers to start evacuating them out of the area and stop any more mouth blasts from destroying the area while he and the rest of the group made for the transformed Scion. He and Wonder Woman were the first ones there and did their best to get her attention by flying directly in front of her face. Califa, stop. The fight's over you need to? Ever since he decided to become Superman, he had fought a few creatures of similar size to what the Scion Child had changed into, but none of them were as fast as she was. He barely had time to notice the instant between when she pulled her arm back again and to when he was swatted into the ground like an annoying insect. Groaning, Superman began to pull himself out of the destroyed rocks that partially buried him. Califa certainly hit harder in this form too. If this was the power science could bring to bear when they didn't care about individually overcoming a planet's champions, then he was going to have to rethink how annoying it was the alien child kept challenging him one-on-one. -on -one. Superman. He looked up just in time to see another mouth laser being charged and fired. Just before the yellow beam hit, he threw up his hands in an attempt to block it, but the energy smashed into him and sent him tunneling through the rock and into the Earth's crust. When the beam finally cut out, the tunnel also collapsed and left him battered and in darkness. Ooh, Superman. Unfortunately for the princess of Themyscira, Diana's warning came too late and Superman was blasted under a mountainside. 
It seemed that in her current state the young warrior couldn't recognize the people she had just been working with or didn't care and fought them anyway. She hoped it wasn't the latter. She had faced berserkers before and their battle lust often made them unpredictable, but when the haze cleared and they were able to think for themselves again they were usually affected with feelings of guilt. She may have only met the young scion for a short time, but Diana didn't want the spark of life she had seen in the girl snuffed out because of an accident made in an altered mindset. With that in mind, she realized the best thing to do would be to end the now unavoidable fight as quickly as possible, so as few people as possible ended up hurt. She flew under a massive backhand and slammed her fists into the jaw of the giant creature. Hard. The force snapped the ape's head back and caused a roar of pain, but there was little actual damage done. By the gods, how much more powerful was the girl in this form? Diana dodged over a grasping hand and saw both Hawkwoman and the Martian Manhunter land powerful blows of their own, successfully splitting the ape's attention between the three of them, but again doing very little to actually damage it. Hawkwoman was the next of them to be targeted, probably because she was a larger, flashier target between the wings and electrically charged mace. Another mouth beam shot at the winged hero, who managed to dodge it, but when Diana and Manhunter found out the ape didn't need her eyes to keep track of her opponents. Manhunter was able to phase through the tail before it slammed into him, but Diana ended up trapped as the ape tried to crush her by clapping its hands together. She managed to catch them before they slammed together, but that just caused the ape to put its effort into crushing her gradually. Alrighty. With the mouth beam no longer focused on her, Hawkwoman went for the ape's head from above in an attempt to knock it out. But in another surprising feat, the 50-foot ape was able to twist out of the way at the last moment. Caught off guard by the movement, Diana watched as a massive foot came up and smashed the winged woman into the ground and pinned her in place. At least she was still alive if the pained screaming and curses were an indication. Diana wasn't able to focus on the other hero's condition too long though, as the pressure surrounding her redoubled and she saw the beginnings of another mouth blast charging up. She braced herself as best she could, but before the attack could be released, two explosions erupted near the ape's eyes causing it to flail in shock and pain. Diana took advantage of the momentary distraction to free herself as a dark, bat-themed jet screamed past them. Ooh, Batman watched from above as the others regrouped again a short ways away from the great ape as he fired another missile at it. Flash and Green Lantern had rejoined them and Flash had even managed to secure Hawkwoman from where she had been pinned. The only one missing was Superman. Batman hoped he managed to regroup with them soon. His plan wouldn't work without him. Can everyone hear me? He asked once he figured he had given Manhunter enough time to retrieve the earbuds he had provided and hand them out to the group. A small voice in the back of his head told him it would be faster and easier to have Martian Manhunter let them all speak telepathically but he was not comfortable with letting someone into his head. No matter that he had done so before in order to trick the Imperium. No doubt others would have reservations as well. No, mass telepathy like that required a trust that simply didn't exist between them in the short time they were working together. A technological solution would work just fine for now. Yeah, we hear you, Bats. Flash spoke up. You have some kind of plan for this one? Cause we're stopping her, but we aren't slowing her down much. And that was the issue, wasn't it? Yes, all of them working together could keep the transformed scion in one place. But injuries and fatigue were starting to pile up. Soon someone would make a mistake that would take them out of the fight and it could spell disaster. Ido. Although you are all going to have to work together for this to work. He went on to explain his plan. All the while doing his best to distract the raging giant with the diminishing amount of missiles aboard the Batjet and dodging the key beams being shot from the Scion's mouth or the occasional rock thrown his way. I've noticed while sparring with Califa there is a kind of scruffing reflex whenever someone manages to grab her tail. Probably how adult Scions keep their offspring under control. She's been training herself out of the reaction, but hasn't managed it last time we met. Green Lantern, can you create a construct to secure her tail and hold it long enough for the moon to set? If she doesn't move, probably. Green Lantern replied. The problem is I'm running out of charge, and if she struggles, I won't be able to hold her. Batman nodded. I figured as much. The rest of us will have to secure her long enough for Lantern to hold her in place by tying her limbs down so she can't move. Wonder Woman, 
Manhunter, Hawkwoman, can the three of you handle her arms? My lasso should be enough for one of them at least. Wonder Woman confirmed. It'll be awkward, but I think between me and the Martian, we can handle the other. Hawkwoman added. Okay, great. Flash said. We got the arms and the tail handled, but how are we going to stop her from blasting us with a mouth laser or just walking off while we're trying this? Flash, you and I will handle the mouth. Batman said. There's a tow cable attached to my jet. I'll make a distraction. You will have to bind her mouth closed before she can fire off a blast. Oh great. If I get eaten, you can expect a strongly worded letter in the mail. Flash whined. That doesn't stop her from walking off though. I'm guessing that's my job then? The voice Batman was waiting for asked. The caped crusader allowed himself a small smile. Yes, you will have to pin her in place once the others finish their part of the plan. Superman sighed. I never thought dealing with kids could be this high maintenance. He finished with a smile in his voice. Ignoring the Man of Steel's joking tone, Batman looked out the cockpit to see the giant ape had lost interest in him and was now moving towards the city lights visible in the distance. We're out of time. Stick to the plan. Ooh. The heroes didn't start going for the ape's limbs immediately. Not only had she shown that even in a rage-fueled state Califa still possessed some form of animal cunning, if any of them failed to subdue her at the same time they risked her freeing one of her other limbs and making the effort useless. Instead they re-engaged the fight by having Superman attempt to blindside her with a punch to the head, but once again the great ape seemed to detect him without using her eyes. This time, however, when the scion went to focus on Superman, Wonder Woman managed to get her lasso around the ape's right wrist. Go now. Following the Amazon's cry, Martian Manhunter, in the form of a long serpentine creature, phased up through the ground and wrapped himself around the giant ape's legs as Hawkwoman dived bombed it from above. With a characteristic war cry, Hawkwoman smashed the ape's head with her mace three times before the ape tried to bat her away with its remaining hand. The second it did so, Wonder Woman pulled on the lasso as hard as she could while an emerald beam slammed into the ape's back. Off balance and unable to move thanks to the Martian Manhunter, the combined force of Wonder Woman and Green Lantern was enough to cause the great ape to fall to its hands and knees. Hawkwoman circled back around and smashed her mace into its left wrist, driving the ape even further off balance and finally crashing to the ground with Superman landing on its back and pushing hard enough that the ground under the ape began to crack and give way. Manhunter, flash, now. Batman ordered as one end of the tow cable was fired into the ground near the ape's snout and anchored itself there. Flash covered the open ground in a blink of an eye while carrying the other end of the cable and tightly wrapping it so the scion was unable to open her mouth. Martian Manhunter moved from the ape's legs to the left arm and pulled together with Wonder Woman to force them both straight. Finally, Green Lantern grabbed the scion's tail with his ring and held on tight. They had managed to hold down the giant ape, but just as they had feared simply grabbing hold of its tail wasn't enough to knock the fight out of it. The ape might have greatly weakened, but it was still struggling and trying to free itself. We can't hold her like this forever. Hawkwoman snarled as she added her own strength to the effort of keeping the left arm immobile. Keep it up as long as you can, Batman ordered. Even if we can't stop her, we can buy ourselves time. She's struggling too much. Wonder Woman cried as she strained against the force pulling on her lasso. She's going to escape any second. Flash, get out of there. The Flash ignored the warnings. Instead, he zipped around until he was directly in front of the great ape's face and waved to get its attention. Hey, Califa! He called out and managed to resist flinching as both giant rage-filled red eyes locked onto him with laser focus. Hey! Don't worry, kid. Fight's over. Why don't you just calm down and take a nap? We'll grab a bite to eat when you wake up. Sounds good? He said in the most calming voice he could. If the ape's mouth hadn't been firmly tied, Shut it might have tried to bite the Scarlet Speedster, but fortunately, it was so the ape had to settle for a great big huff of air instead. Although the struggling was starting to diminish, Flash had to brace himself against the gust of warm, moist wind, giant monkey snot, ayuk, but recovered quickly and continued speaking in the same tone of voice. Yeah, we can try out that barbecue place I was telling you about. 
Maybe finally introduce you to Kid Flash so he can't whine about missing you all the time. The more Flash talked, the more the great ape relaxed. Eventually its eyes began to drift closed and it began to breathe deeply. The struggle stopped completely and the heroes were able to stop trying to restrain it. She is sleeping. Manhunter confirmed for all of them after shifting back to a more humanoid appearance. As long as she remains undisturbed, I believe I can keep her from awakening before the moon is set. Good. I don't want to have to do that all over again. Hawkwoman exclaimed, rubbing at a stiff spot on her shoulders. Yeah, me either. Flash added, trying to wipe some of the stuff off himself with little success. I'm already going to need a long shower after this. Then let's do a quick check to make sure nothing nearby is going to wake her up again. Superman suggested. But other than that, good work everyone. We made a good team. Batman watched as the other heroes split off to take care of whatever they felt needed to be done at the moment. But last thing Superman said stuck in his mind. A good team. Huh? Maybe we'll need more of that. Growing Pains, Chapter 18 The world had changed after the Imperium. Sure, there had been alien invasions in the past, but all of those had been relatively short affairs that ended quickly. The Imperium had infiltrated and sabotaged Earth for years before launching their main attack, and it had taken a collective effort of several of the greatest heroes the world had seen working together in a way not seen since World War II to push them back. And now people wanted assurances that it wasn't going to simply happen again. Thankfully, they didn't have to wait long. Ooh, a man spoke on a podium while several brightly costumed figures stood behind him. To many this was the first time that they had seen several heroes standing together without some major crisis getting in the way. That proved attractive enough that the normally dull UN press conference was drawing in record numbers with the public across the world. And when we needed them most, the heroes behind me and many more that could not be here today stepped forward to protect our world. We cannot thank them enough, but today I am proud to offer these heroes a medal of valor for their actions and a symbolic one for each and every person that stood against the Imperium. The man stepped back and after a brief award ceremony, Superman stepped forward. Ladies and gentlemen of the United Nations, the most iconic superhero in the world began. A few weeks ago, we faced a threat unlike one we had ever encountered. A hostile force that had not only set their sights on conquering our planet, but draining it dry of everything it could offer. A threat that did not come boldly from the stars, but one that hid among us and waited until they were too widespread for one hero to deal with. I'm proud to say that when faced with such a massive and overwhelming threat the residents of this world, common and powered alike, joined forces to protect our home. But despite our success, this event was an eye-opener. There will be some things that are too big for one person, one hero, even me, to handle. When those times come we will look to each other for help, and when that isn't enough, you can look to us. Superman turned slightly and held out a hand to the heroes standing with him. Wonder Woman, Batman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Hawkwoman, and Martian Manhunter all stood tall and proud. For times when one hero isn't enough, more will come. Members of the United Nations, it is my great pleasure to announce the formation of the Justice League. The Man of Steel might have wanted to say more, but anything else was drowned out by the thunderous applause in the assembly hall. Ooh, not everyone was interested in watching superheroes make announcements though. Some of them just wanted things to hurry up and get back to normal, even if they felt they needed some additional help to move things along. Ooh, so... I looked between the shady guy in sunglasses and the blacked-out silhouette on the monitor, who was definitely, totally, not Luther, in his hands. You're saying you will pay me $100,000 to guard a crate until someone else comes to pick it up. Correct. We have some footage from the invasion and we're impressed with your abilities. Totally not, Luther explained. We thought this would be a good test run before we reach out for a more long-term partnership. You do know I'm trying to take over the planet, right? You know, the one you're on right now? I felt compelled to point out. I think you'll find humanity is quite flexible when it chooses to work with others, even about being under others. As long as you and the beings you represent are reasonable, I don't see why we can't do business together. Wow, if I didn't know for a fact that Luther would never settle for being second fiddle to anyone I might have been convinced he was serious about a partnership. 
It also gave away how little he knew about science since we weren't exactly reasonable all the time. Or even most of the time. I guess that's fine. What's in the box, though? I asked. The United Nations and this new Justice League are doing their best to mop everything up, but there are plenty of scientists and organizations that are very interested in alien technology and its potential uses and are willing to use some less-than-legal methods to get them. I just happen to know several who would be very happy to get a large amount of such technology under the radar. Okay, alien super tech and not a doomsday device or something like that. And you want me to? What? Just hang around and make sure no one runs off with it? That and stop any costumed annoyances that decide to poke their noses into things. I know you're very busy preparing for your future challenges, so I won't even have you escort it to the final delivery site. Just wait until my courier service arrives and handles it. Ah ha ha ha, yeah busy, that's me all right. I shifted awkwardly. I don't think I did anything besides train and browse the internet for interesting places to eat since I found out the Metropolis mayoral election was delayed due to the invasion. Thankfully, totally not. Luther said nothing about that. So, Miss Califa, do we have a deal? Sure. When do I start? My assistant will provide you with the details. I hope this marks the beginnings of a wonderful partnership. Somehow I doubted that. Ooh. And while villains and heroes prepared for the future, some of the younger names in the game were left unsupervised. Ooh. So what brings you guys out to Star City? Speedy asked as he leaned back and took a sip of his soda. I mean, yeah, I like hanging out with you guys, but isn't it kind of far from home? Robin huffed, swiping one of the fry containers before Kid Flash inhaled them all. Nah, I got dragged here for some charity things to help deal with some of the damages. I figured at least the two of us could meet up for a bit, and Star City is like a few hours away from me. Kid Flash added, thankfully without a mouthful of food. Let me guess, your mentors say it's too busy to risk going out right now, so they're keeping you busy with training instead of any real hero work? Speedy asked. Yeah. Yup. The other two responded. Yeah, GA is the same. Can't really blame him cause things got messed up and everything, and I hear he was invited to something about joining the Justice League. But I kinda wanna go out and do something, you know? What? Like try finding a robbery to stop or something? Kid Flash polished off his third cheeseburger and reached for another. As cool as that would be, I'd be in so much trouble for that. Speedy shook his head. Yeah, no. I'd get benched for a month if I did that too. I mean, why don't we head to the docks and do some parkour off the stuff there? Looking to get up staged again? Robin taunted the slightly older kid. You wish, short stuff. I'd know. Flips and stuff aren't really my thing. Kid Flash didn't sound so enthused. I have a new camera. You could get some neat shots with super speed? Okay. I'm up for that. Cool. Then let's go after, hey. Who ate my fries? Ooh. I was regretting accepting totally not. Luther's job. This was so freaking boring. The whole thing practically screamed it was the kind of thing that would have someone poking their nose into. I mean, seriously, smuggled alien tech? Batman? Or one of the other detective-like heroes should have been swarming all over something like this? Was this going to be one of those annoyingly well-planned things that went off without a hitch? I closed my eyes and paid attention to my key sense. There had to be something interesting going on nearby. Most of what I got back was just some of the wildlife big enough to be noticeable. A few dogs, a pair of seals in the water, and a few that were too small for me to recognize, and the humans that worked on the dock. But there were three signatures that were moving around in a more active way that suggested a lot of physical activity. I wonder what that was about. Looking back at the crate I was supposed to be guarding I gave it a whole three seconds of thought before shrugging and floating off towards the three. The crate would be fine if I took a quick peek. Ooh. Huh, not what I was expecting, I said, announcing my arrival to the three kids below me. Three sidekicks doing parkour in the middle of nowhere wasn't on my list of potential things that I could find checking out the key signatures, but that's what I found. Causing the redhead with the bow to slip and almost fall off the table he was standing on, as opposed to the redhead with a camera that nearly jumped a foot in the air, was worth any disappointment from it not being a local hero poking into things. Too bad Robin was used to people coming from nowhere and barely reacted. So what you doing, Birdbrain? Also, aren't you on the wrong side of the country? I asked. Batman has something to talk with Green Arrow about, 
and doesn't want me running around Gotham on my own. So I'm here babysitting Speedy and Kid Flash Dash, hey, slash liar. The bigger question is what are you doing here, stupid monkey? Robin shot back, crossing his arms over his chest. I shrugged, looking for something to do. Saw you idiots jumping around and decided to drop by. Speedy scowled. We were doing parkour, not jumping around. It's something that takes actual skill instead of just flying everywhere. That sounded like a challenge. Yeah? Then let's prove it. I scowled right back. Oh, it's on. Let's see how cocky you are without the powers. Ooh. A few hours later the sidekicks got calls from their various mentors and had to head back, which was a shame because once we got past the mandatory young teen grandstanding the various parkour challenges we set for each other were really fun. I couldn't help feeling like I forgot something though. The crate. I rushed back to the post I was supposed to be guarding and did a quick once over just to make sure nothing had happened, but it seemed that even with three deputy heroes cleverly drawing me away, at least that was the story I was going to stick with, nothing had happened. When a random minion came by a few minutes later to pick it up and give me the rest of my payment I chalked the whole thing down as an easy win and moved on towards the cave I called home. I guess not everything I do has to end in a giant battle. Not that if they did that would be a bad thing. Growing Pains Chapter 19 I panted heavily as sweat poured down my forehead. Water crashed back together as the last of my key beam fizzled out. I had nothing left to sustain it. I watched it until the last traces vanished and the only thing left was a few gentle waves washing up to shore. With one final sigh I forced myself to relax and flopped backwards onto the sand. Key training was hard. At first I had simply tried to recreate a bunch of techniques all at once and quickly found out aside from simpler energy attacks, I was actually pretty bad at it. I had no idea how to do tricks like the multiform, spirit bomb, kaioken, instant transmission, or anything like that. It really drove home how hard creating techniques that weren't just huge beams of energy was. So instead of wasting time trying to figure those out, I was training my control. To an outsider it looked like I was just firing key blasts out into the ocean, but I was constantly forcing the beam to be certain sizes, certain intensities, and moving it around once I fired it. Then once I was getting low on stamina, I would focus on drawing more out, both increasing the amount of key I could comfortably use and making sure I could put up a fight even when I was exhausted. I'd like to think I made some really great progress. There was just one problem. I'm so bored. I whined. Yep, after a while, even shooting giant death lasers got boring. I tried coming up with different games, setting goals, and just about everything I could think of to stay motivated, but it obviously wasn't working. The worst part was that I couldn't just go find someone to fight anymore. With the Justice League so new, the heroes were busy coordinating and working with governments about stuff and getting their headquarters modernized. Several of the times I went looking for them, it turned out they simply weren't in the area anymore and all the villains I'd be interested in were hiding out until they could figure out how the League would function. Sure, there were still criminals and disasters getting cleaned up by different heroes, but the story of Donald Oz, the most unfortunate thief in history, had most of them spooked. Donald had been in the middle of stealing some jewel when he found out that not only had he tripped an alarm, every single member of the Justice League had just so happened to be in the nearby Mount Justice, getting the old World War II hang out of the Justice Society refitted, and decided to take a break to deal with him. It was obviously hilarious overkill for a normal human, but the people that regularly tried facing off against demigods now realized that there was a chance they could wind up facing their own particular demigod and potentially some friends. And since most villains were cowards, they decided to lay low. At this point I realized if I wanted to fight someone more challenging than a SWAT team, I would need to go looking for them specifically or force them to come to me. And I knew just the person that could help me with that. Ooh. Finding who I was after turned out to be a bit harder than I thought. Especially because it turned out I missed her by a day when I decided to check out her workplace. Only a lucky overheard conversation between a pair of secretaries let me know when she was expected at a specific airport with a layover allowed me to catch up and start looking. Even then I almost missed her and her partner because rather than go to a hotel like a normal person, Lois Lane jumped into a car and immediately headed out into the desert and the weapons demonstration field out there with her photographer in tow. The demonstration was actually pretty cool and I was glad I decided to see what Lois was doing before I went about meeting her in person. 
It featured some kind of remote control android thing that was supposed to allow the military to respond to issues where normal humans would be wiped out. I guess it made sense the government would still want a way to deal with another alien invasion themselves, even with the Justice League stepping up. The whole thing was interesting enough, I didn't feel the need to interrupt and so I planned on simply flying down to meet Lois after the show, but then she and her friend followed some military guy into a bunker, and I could feel my already generous patience running out. Ooh. To the passive AI system, the IR, zero-in system slowly adapts to improve the wearer's reaction speed and movements. I overheard the military guy saying after I snuck into the bunker, while I wasn't exactly trained in stealth by Batman, you pick a few things up if you watch him long enough. That's great and all, Lieutenant, but what about the concerns that this will create similar problems as LexCorp series Alpha Battlesuit? Lois Lane asked skeptically. I actually remembered reading about that. LexCorp made a really neat RoboCop thing that was supposed to give police similar capabilities to Superman, but the guy wearing the prototype was driven insane by it, and the whole thing was scrapped. I guess the military decided to pick up where they left off. We've taken precautions against that. The wearer has less direct integration than with the series Alpha, and since the drone is remote-controlled, there is less physiological dependence on the abilities provided by the IR, zero-end system. Military guy reassured her. The effective range is drastically cut down until more advancements can be made, but to the wearer it's just like getting in a car rather than putting on a suit. Doesn't seem that much different to me if you decided to call them wearers rather than pilots or something. Haha, <laughs> sorry but the name started out as part of a joke. Here, see for yourself. Another man walked in from an adjoining room. Rather than a military uniform, he was in some kind of high-tech bodysuit with a bunch of rings surrounding his limbs like halos except for his legs where the rings got wider the further down they went. This is Specialist Michael Rhodes, one of our dress wearers to use the full term. For some reason the boys don't like being called that so it got shortened to wearer pretty quick. Ah, cause it looked like a hoop dress. Couldn't tell you, LT. Rhodes said jokingly. I think dress wearers fits just fine. Helps I know I pull it off damn fine. Well, at least one of you boys has an ego not made out of glass. Lois commented even as she wrote down some notes. Do you mind if? She asked leadingly, motioning to her photographer. Not at all, so long as he gets my good side. You don't have a good side, Rhodes. I'd know. He looks kinda cool from above. I announced my presence as I hovered down towards the ground. The four humans jumped simultaneously at the unexpected noise and all reacted differently. Military guy, I should probably figure out his name, went for a sidearm that wasn't there. Specialist Rhodes jumped away from the group and flicked his eyes between me and the door he walked out from, probably where the drone thingy's pilot seat was. And Lois grabbed her photographer friend and immediately pulled him behind her and started edging away. Good reaction speeds on all of them. The only one that I saw do something stupid was the photographer since his first reaction to an unknown voice in a secure military bunker was to point his camera at me and take a picture. Was the flash really necessary? I complained. Saudi. Who are you? How did you get in here? Wow, he seemed stressed. E, Im Khalifa. I snuck in. I answered casually. The alien that attacked Metropolis. Are you here for the IR, zero end system? It won't do you any good. The control system is too big for you to move anywhere. Military guy growled. You mean the robot thing? Yeah, it was cool, but I'm not here for that. I pointed at Lois. I'm here for her. I see. Specialist Rhodes, take Mississippi Lane to the back and get plugged in. Military guy said gravely. I'll buy you some time. Lieutenant? I'm not about to let a hostile alien kidnap a citizen of the U.S. right in front of me. Now get moving. Sir. Let's go, you two. I watched as the three ran out of the room but made no move to stop them, even when the security door slammed into place and locked with a loud hiss of hydraulics. While I waited for the robot to get here I turned my attention back to military guy. I was really curious what he was going to do to buy time, but after several seconds he still hadn't made a move. I fidgeted awkwardly and moved around trying to get him to do something, but he just kept standing there watching me. So aren't you going to do something? I am doing something. He said back calmly. I waited a bit more trying to figure out what he could be doing and came to a boring conclusion. You're just stalling, aren't you? Military guy laughed. 
You went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the most powerful people on the planet. What did you expect a normal human to do? If you just wanted to wait until the robot got here, you could have said so. I scowled and sat down on the floor. I got excited for nothing. Lame. That's it? I admit I was expecting you to blast past me once you realized my bluff. I raised an eyebrow at him. Yeah, but if I did that, I wouldn't be able to fight your robot. Besides, I could sense Lois wasn't going anywhere. So there was no reason not to leave her in the secured room while I played with stress, tested their robot. The bunker rumbled a bit as a tall mechanical form crashed through a concrete wall and looked around the room, arm raised to blast something. I couldn't help but laugh privately when the machine paused and looked back and forth between military guy and me, clearly not expecting to see his boss unharmed and me just waiting for him to show up. I didn't give him time to think the situation over though. In a second I rolled to my feet and leapt at the robot, punching it back through the hole it made and even creating a new one in the roof. I wanted him to go all out. No holding back because he was scared of bringing the bunker down on him and the others. Okay. Now we can really cut loose. I grinned as I watched the robot recover from being punched through a building, floating on some kind of jet boots and looking barely scratched from the impact. You're kind of a brat, aren't you? Came the slightly modulated voice of Rhodes, but he settled into a more aggressive stance anyway. Growing Pains, Chapter 20 Since my opponent was a robot not capable of facial expressions, there was no particular signal I could use to start the fight. So I just decided to go when it looked like he was ready. Deciding to test the robot out before I got too serious, I rushed straight in, fist raised for an obvious right cross. But rather than move to meet me, the robot flew to the side and shot an energy beam of some kind at me. I countered with a quick key blast of my own and flew up and over the resulting smoke of the two attacks exploding. I was fast enough to get above Rhodes and get close enough to drop an axe kick down on his head that he only just managed to block with an upraised arm. I could have tried to power through the block, but I decided to backflip off it instead and blast the robot in the chest with a key attack. That turned out to be a mistake because when I tried getting closer again, Rhodes just flew backwards while peppering me with energy beams. Get back here and fight me. You just dented a combat-rated metal armor plate with a kick. I'm not going to let you trash a multi-million dollar weapons platform that easily, monkey girl. I snarled and blocked another energy blast with one of my own. The fight was quickly turning into a stalemate of the two of us, shooting down the other's attacks with me, trying to get closer, and Rhodes trying to get further away. One of us was going to need to try something new, or this would be an endurance contest to see who ran out of energy first. And since Rhodes seemed content to just blast away, it was up to me to do it. I fired a key beam far to the right, but rather than just letting the attack do its own thing, I focused on it moving. Thankfully, the hours of practicing my key manipulation meant the beam curved, just like I wanted it to, and slammed into the side of the robot and exploded. You can curve those things? Rhodes exclaimed as he quickly flew out of the explosion, trailing smoke but not super damaged from what I could see. You bet I can. I shouted back shooting another two beams to prevent him from getting away. Rhodes dodged them, but since he had to make sure one of them wasn't going to swerve into him at the last second, he was too slow to stop me from getting close enough to punch him. Once again he blocked with an upraised arm, the same one from earlier, but this time he didn't move to escape. This time he actually punched back. As happy as I was he was finally fighting back properly, I wasn't going to just let him punch me in the face which turned out to be a good idea since I felt something tingle across my skin when I dodged and I felt the hairs on my head stand up a little more. Wait, do you have shock fists? TCH, smart kid. Yeah, the IR, zero in suit, had taser gauntlets for subduing tougher targets. Don't suppose you want to throw in the towel now? I practically vibrated with excitement and charged again. Are you kidding? This is just getting cooler and cooler. What else do you have? Making this real hard on me, brat. I ducked under a quick jab and grabbed the robot by the forearm. Unlike the fists, it didn't seem like the arm itself was electrified, so I twisted and threw the robot down to the ground where it cratered into a field. I seriously doubted that was going to finish it though if a kick only dented it, so I rushed down after it. Sure enough, the robot staggered out of the crater just in time for me to throw another punch at its head. This time, rather than blocking, Rhodes took the punch just to let him land a hit of his own. 
I wasn't just expecting him to let me wail on him though and blocked it. I yelped as the electricity coursed through my arm and decided straight up blocking was a last resort. I darted around the grounded robot like a hummingbird, not willing to let Rhodes get an opening to try flying off again, while trading punches and kicks with the robot's own electrified punches. And to my excitement, Rhodes was actually pretty good. Even though I was trying my best to dodge or redirect his attacks, a few managed to hit me and I was feeling a numb, tingly feeling in my arms when he forced me to block. You've gotta be kidding me. These tasers were designed to incapacitate an elephant with a single punch. Rhodes complained after I missed a block and he got a solid punch on my face. Yeah, it hurt but my adrenaline was racing and I wasn't going to get taken down by a single punch. It's gonna take more than that. I exclaimed and shot forward again. You're right. Sorry about this in advance. A panel on the robot's shoulder popped open and before I could react a blinding white light seared my eyes. I almost thought it was a flash bomb, but there was no sound. Did he just blind me with a flashlight? And they stole the concept behind the solar flare. How dare the military steal my stolen technique? I'll sue. Putting thoughts of legal action aside until after the fight, I tried opening my eyes only to snap them shut again when everything was way too bright. Okay, so I was temporarily blind. I could just track Rhodes' key to Rhodes was piloting a remote control robot. There was no key to sense. This might be an issue. Still, I wasn't about to let something as small as having no idea where my opponent was stop me from beating them. Might want to give dash. I spun towards the noise and unleashed a double-handed key blast. Up before you get hurt. Damn kid, you're pretty vicious. Rhodes' voice finished from a completely different location. I fired a blast towards that spot too. But you lose this one. His voice changed location again. I figured he was probably using speakers or something like that, but I blasted it anyway. Huh. You think this is enough to beat me? I already said it takes more than that. I said, straining my senses to the limit. Now that I was paying attention, I could hear a low humming sound somewhere up and to my right. So Rhodes was flying again. Now I just had to figure out where he was exactly. A barely perceptible whomp sound came from the general area. I figured Rhodes was followed by a more audible thump on the ground behind me. Seriously, give up. Alien invader, or not I didn't sign up to beat up kids. A toothy smile formed on my face. Good for you cause you aren't beating me anyway. I raised my hand to where I pictured the robot was hovering and released a blast as fast as I could. Rhodes' sudden shout of dismay confirmed for me that I at least hit him. I heard something crash to the ground, but it sounded too small to be the whole robot. I tried opening my eyes again to see what happened, but had to shut them almost immediately again. Still too sensitive. But I did see what I thought was a dismembered arm on the ground. Definitely hit him then. So what now? You going to keep talking at me while I take shots at you? Think next time I can get a leg? I taunted. You asked for it. Rhodes growled and I heard the humming sound get more intense. Relying on my instincts I dodged to the left and felt a whoosh of air pass by harmlessly. I followed after it with a punch and when that was deflected, spun and kicked where I imagined the robot's head was. How are you fighting better when you can't see? Rhodes demanded. I'm awesome like that. A metal limb uppercut me in the chin making my head snap back. I dove to the side and felt an energy blast cut through the space I was just in. Rhodes was finally going all out, which was perfect because I was finally starting to see again. Everything was blurry, but that was good enough. After getting hit multiple times, the robot was now pretty scuffed up. The worst of the damage was definitely the missing arm. I think I had gotten lucky and hit the thing in the elbow joint with enough power to cut it right off because the remaining part of the arm seemed mostly fine. Hopefully the army guys fix that for next time. All right then, I'm ready to kick this up a notch. What else you got? Road sighed. You were going easy on me? The brass isn't going to like that. And sorry kid, these suits were fitted for a demonstration, not live combat. I've hit you with everything I've got on this thing. Oh, seriously? He had nothing else? Meh, fine then. I wasn't expecting a fight anyway, and this was at least fun. I'd stop by later once they fixed the robot up, and hopefully by then it would have some new tricks for me. I'm just gonna finish this up then. Don't think I'll make it easy for you. And to give credit where it was due, Rhodes didn't. Even down half an arm and knowing he was going to lose, 
the guy did his best to beat me. We ended up flying all over the test range trading punches, kicks, and energy blasts. The army pilot got several good hits in and I was looking pretty beat up, but it was practically all surface level stuff while the robot was taking a much more thorough beating. The fight took a solid turn in my favor when I ended up catching a kick to the side, but managed to hold onto the leg instead. I let out a victorious yell as I drove my elbow down on the vulnerable knee joint and tore the lower half of the leg right off. Down an arm and a leg. Rhodes couldn't stop me from eventually tearing off the rest of his limbs until all that remained was a stumpy torso with a head lying on the ground. Well shit. Rhodes cursed, robotic head looking at what was left of his limbs. We'll call it a draw? I smirked and held a hand up to the featureless faceplate. Nah, I win. Better luck next time. Then I blasted the head off the robot and turned back towards the bunker. More key signatures had shown up, but they all seemed around the level of normal humans. Sure, there could be some kind of super tech there, but if they had that, why hadn't they sent it out here to help Rhodes fight? No, I was pretty sure it was just going to be normal soldiers. Oh well, time to stop playing and actually get what I came here for. Ooh, Lois watched nervously as the feed from the IR, zero in suit, flashed a bright yellow before cutting to black. You didn't have to be a genius to figure out that probably meant the suit had been destroyed, but Specialist Rhodes cursing and quickly disconnecting from the cradle pretty much confirmed it. Sorry, Lieutenant Ross. I did my best, but the IR, zero in prototype is Kia. I couldn't stop her. You did your best. Ross scowled. Lois could sympathize. This wasn't the first time she had seen one of these examples of cutting-edge military tech be praised as an unstoppable titan only for it to be taken apart by an alien using nothing more than their bare hands. Granted the last time this happened, she was pretty happy the tech lost because it was stolen by mercenaries. It wasn't so great when it was supposed to be the thing protecting her. Sounds of fighting crackled over a console near Lieutenant Ross. The man looked at a video feed before helplessly cutting it off and picking up a handgun he had retrieved once the Scion had run off to fight a military robot. Well, our intruder has destroyed our best defense and just took out our reinforcements. I'd like to say there's no way she could get inside here, but... The inches-thick metal security door exploded interrupting the man, when the dust cleared a scuffed and bloodied, but happily grinning Califa practically skipped through the wreckage. Lois was practically resigned to being kidnapped at this point and was ready to give herself up. Hopefully Califa would just take her and leave because the army sure couldn't handle her. Hi there. The little destroyer chirped and made her way over, shooting one of those little yellow orbs at the lieutenant's gun and turning it to scrap in the process. Hello. Lois knew Califa was definitely more dangerous than any thug or criminal that had kidnapped her in the past. But her pride wasn't going to let her get hysterical when faced with a pre-teen when she didn't crack to those guys. So, you wanted me for something? Yep, I wanted to ask you a question. Everyone in the room froze. A question? Lois couldn't believe her ears. Did this insane little kid break into a secure military base, fight a cutting-edge robot, blast through several squads of soldiers? All to ask her a question? Yeah, so... I've been trying to get a hold of Superman for another rematch, but I can't seem to get his attention. But you always seem to get him to come running when you need him. So how do you do it? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, you this. Good fight. Let me know when your suit gets fixed up and we can go for round two. Wait, you didn't come here to kidnap Mississippi Lane? Lieutenant Ross demanded. Califa tilted her head. Would that help me get Superman's attention? It happens enough. So probably. Lois gave Jimmy a death glare he had the decency to flinch away from. Unless everyone managed to get out of this unharmed, she was going to have him go gophering meetings for a year before he even got the chance to get behind a camera again. So I could have just grabbed her at the airport? Oh well, I got a decent fight out of it so that's fine. And I guess I'm going to kidnap Lois now? The Scion had been following them that long? And no one noticed. Do you think we'll just let you? Lois had to give it to Ross and Rhodes. They certainly weren't the types to give up. Unfortunately. Well, unless you have another robot or something lying around. You can't exactly stop me. A terrifyingly sharp toothy grin stretched across the Scion's face. But just as quickly as it came, it vanished back into a cheerful smirk. Then Lois found herself scooped up into a princess carry 
and floating away as the alien child proved no one there could. Oh, and photo guy, make sure you got my good side. Lois hoped someone got word to the heroes fast. She wasn't the best with kids and spending time alone with a super-powered preteen sounded like a nightmare. But she did agree with the tiny menace on one thing. Jimmy had better have gotten some good shots of that fight. If it got out that she was getting captured by children now, without evidence not even the army could stop them her reputation would never recover. Growing Pains, Chapter 21 I have come to the unfortunate conclusion that I might be an impulsive idiot. How did I discover this? Because I couldn't follow my own stupid plan when distracted by a shiny robot and a combat high. I was supposed to find Lois Lane, ask her how to find her boyfriend, and then leave. I wasn't supposed to kidnap her off of any army base because everyone told me to. Kidnappings are serious business. I wasn't ready to kidnap someone yet. I didn't have a slow-moving, easily disabled death trap or a cage suspended over a lava pit or a bomb with a giant countdown timer or anything. Heck, I didn't even have a warehouse to put her in. Lois was going to think I was a total amateur when all I could do was ask her not to wander off because humans were stupidly fragile, usually, and I couldn't just tie her up and leave her in my cave. That was just asking her to get eaten by a bear because I wasn't going to babysit her the whole time. Hey, how far are you taking me? We've been flying for hours. Oh yeah. And then there was Lois herself. I really hoped I would figure out what to do with her soon. Ooh. Lois looked around the place I had made my home, and I could tell she wasn't impressed. Yeah, the space pod in the back was probably pretty cool, but that didn't really matter when everything else looked like it would have fit in on an episode of the Flintstones. But it wasn't like I really needed furniture, and I was durable enough that rocks weren't all that uncomfortable. So you've been living here since you landed on Earth? Lois asked, politely ignoring how unprepared I was having a human here. More or less. Sorry if it's not what you were expecting. I'm still getting a hang of the whole villain thing and haven't really focused on living spaces or lairs. At least that was the story I was going to stick to. Peer pressured into kidnapping Superman's girlfriend? Who, me? No, I was just a novice that didn't have a convenient underground base just yet. Of course that still meant I was stuck with Lois for a while. I'm guessing you don't exactly have some master plan if you just brought me to your home. The reporter accurately guessed. And I'm guessing you aren't going to let me leave until Superman shows up? I have a plan. I quickly interjected. It's... I trailed off. Was there any point in futilely trying to pretend I knew what I was doing? Well, my pride. But that was going to take a beating anyway because it was obvious I wasn't fooling Lois. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a plan. I admit it. But it's not my fault, okay? I wasn't expecting everyone to assume I was kidnapping you. What else were they going to do after you broke into a military base only to focus on me? Lois's eye was twitching. Yeah, she was annoyed. Not tell me to kidnap you. I suggested but that only made the twitching worse and decided to switch tracks. Um, do you want something to drink? Or maybe a snack as an apology? I can't let you go until Superman shows up and I don't have somewhere to put you, but I have a bunch of stuff from the last time I went out for food. Lois stared at me for a few seconds before eventually sighing and making her way over to the stone chair I had carved out of a boulder I liked. Do you have a cushion for this or something? She waved a hand at it. And while I didn't, I did keep several pillows and blankets in the attack ball she could use instead. Well, if I'm stuck here, do you mind giving an interview? Lois asked once she was comfortable. At least that way I'll get something out of this cluster of mess. Lois took out her notepad and a pen while I thought about it. There wasn't much of a reason to do an interview, but at the same time there wasn't much of one not to. And it would help pass the time while we waited. Sure, what do you want to know? Why don't we start off easy with the Scion race? What is your culture like? Oh, that was an easy one. We're the greatest warrior race in the galaxy. Really? What would the Thanagarians say about that? Who cares? Yeah, they're strong, but a scion is always getting stronger. We don't need fancy nth metal weapons to do awesome things. We just use our fists. So scions don't use tools often? I mean, some of them do. I replied, thinking of Trunks and his sword or Goku and his power pole. But most of the time we're stronger than whatever you make the weapon out of. And the strongest of us can blow up a planet with just our key. So why bother with a weapon? That's not... 
exactly what I had in mind. Lois said hesitantly, I meant machines or vehicles. Can you really blow up a planet by yourself? Oh, I mean we use spaceships, obviously. I said, looking at my attack ball. And I think we have some other stuff on Vegeta to help carry things. Not really sure about that because I wasn't allowed to explore a lot before I got a new mission. And for the planet thing, not yet, but I'm training really hard. I'll get there one day. I changed my mind. I need a drink, Lois said, and then patiently waited while I got her a bottled water. You mentioned Vegeta. Is that the name of your homeworld? I nodded. Yeah, it's also the name of our king. And the prince actually. I think. I knew we had a king thanks to old me's memories, but Jerk Dad never mentioned his name or if he had a son. But it's not like Lois had a way to check, right? And unless another scion came after me for some reason, no one was going to correct me. A dynasty name then? Loi Muzed. Is he a good king at least? No idea. I chirped. I'm only a low class and I was constantly sent on missions to prove my strength. I don't think I've spent even a full earth year on Vegeta. And most of that was either being stuck in a healing pod or fighting my dad. Great. The child alien invader is an abuse victim. Just perfect. Lois muttered, though I don't think I was supposed to hear that part. What's a low class? It's how the warriors are split out. You have low class, which is most of the normal warriors. Mid class, which is above that. Usually that's the leaders and stuff. And then you have the scion elite. Those guys are usually born at a certain power level and are like 20 times stronger than a low class. It was a bit more complicated than that, but talking about classes was boring. It also didn't help that I was planning on leaving the elite class in the dust eventually, which meant I really didn't bother remembering the differences between them all that much. That wasn't the end of it though. Lois was doing a really good job of asking about all aspects of Scion society, and if she had an expert, she could have written a book about the ins and outs of our culture. Too bad all she had was me. I did my best, but in the end it was just about as effective as asking a normal middle schooler how America worked, who the senators of each state were, and what was the government's five-year plan. My best explanation about how the Scion government worked boiled down to, we have a king, the strongest do what they want, and everyone else falls in line. My explanation of our economy was actually worse. Did science have an economy? Was it just a barter system? Were we actually enslaved by the trade organization? I had no idea. I also made sure to keep the trade organization out of our conversation, not out of any loyalty to them or anything. I just didn't want to answer a billion more questions about an organization I knew nothing about and may or may not exist. I had found the manual for the attack balls radio and set it to receive only and had gotten nothing on the listed trade organization frequencies. It could just mean I was out of range or the radio was broken. It could also mean whatever caused me to crash on earth had sent me to another dimension and they didn't exist. Either way, I didn't want to talk about them. She asked about what we tended to eat and I told her we were omnivores, capital O, but meat was preferred. She asked if we had schools and I told her that generally newborns spend a few years in an incubation pod where they learn basic knowledge before getting taught by someone else. Usually an older or retired scion, but not always like in my case where I got to deal with jerk dad. Lois seemed to get really uncomfortable with the topic for some reason, and eventually the question circled back to what I said about scions. About us being the greatest warrior race in the galaxy. I realize Earth is a bit of a backwater to the rest of the galaxy, but how can you call yourselves the greatest warrior race next to empires like the Thanagarians, Tamaranian, and other martial races? We've even heard some stories about Imperial Kryptonians, but we've never heard about science before you. I shrugged. Don't know why you haven't heard of us, but the reason we're the greatest is we don't need tricks like the others. Take away the sun for a Kryptonian or weapons from a Thanagarian, and they're not that tough. But you can't ever weaken a scion like that. I might be wrong but I don't think you can weaken a Tamaranian either, and they have a very prestigious warrior culture. Lois pointed out, that was fair, and there were probably a ton of other alien races out there that were strong on their own, but they have a limit. I replied smugly, scions never stop growing stronger as long as we push ourselves, and that's for normal scions. Normal scions? Lois asked, ah crap, I didn't mean to let that slip. Oh well, it's not like it needed to be a secret, or the full truth. Yeah, 
If Scions are the greatest warrior race, then the legendary Super Scion is the greatest warrior. The best. End of story. I thought about the first time I had seen the Namek Saga in the lead up to Goku's transformation. Vegeta had thought the Super Scion was a being of uncontrollable power and rage. Someone that would literally destroy solar systems because his power was so vast and in some ways he was right. A natural-born Super Scion like Broly was exactly that. An undirected engine of destruction that few could stand against. But that wasn't the legendary Super Scion in my mind. A golden figure standing on a shattered planet. A being that refused to give up no matter what. Someone that never lost not because they were the strongest, but because when they were defeated they would get up, push past their own limits and try again. That was the legend in my mind. The one I was chasing. The one I would pursue step by step until the next time someone talked about the legendary Super Scion, they would be talking about me. Ooh. Lois did her best not to shiver at the look in the tiny alien terror's eyes when she spoke about her people's legendary warrior. She had met her share of religious people during her job, the kind who just know something is true and would never be persuaded otherwise. That was the same look in Califa's eyes when she talked about the Super Scion. Califa would probably follow such a being into hell if they simply asked. Not necessarily a bad thing. But if the other Scions were as cruel and destructive as the girl's answers hinted at, Lois couldn't imagine what kind of monster a Super Scion would be like. She really hoped someone was looking for her and got here soon. She had a lot of information Superman and the Justice League would need to know about Califa. Earth had gotten lucky the prepubescent Scion Conqueror had a pretty good heart despite the childhood she had. They might not be so lucky with the next Scion. Growing Pains, Chapter 22 So how long do you think it will take before Superman comes to get you? I asked during one of the breaks Lois asked for so she could organize her notes. The reporter just paused her writing and raised an eyebrow at me. How would I know? It's not like I have a way of calling him. You don't? I asked, genuinely surprised. I thought she would. What about something that lets him track you? Or Batman track you, I guess. I'm sure he would help out Superman if the jerk needed it. Why would I have something like that? Besides, I was forced to leave all electronic devices at the security gate back on the base. So how is he supposed to know where to come get you? This was such a bad idea. I should never have listened to Photo Guy about kidnapping his boss. You tell me. I'm the victim here, remember? I ignored the annoyed reporter and thought over what this meant. No signal and nothing for Batman to magically track meant it could be days before someone came to pick up Lois. Days that I would have to put up with her asking questions about every little thing she could think of and I would have to listen to because I couldn't leave her to go train without risking her crossing a bear or something. Yeah, that wasn't happening. Time for improvised kidnapping plan B. Eloi, Wanna go on a trip? Ooh. A few hours of flying later the two of us touched down in the first major city I could find. I would have liked to head to a city I recognized or even back to Metropolis, but flying with Lois screaming in my ear that I was going too fast got old real quick, so I just picked one close by. Then. After dropping Lois off on a rooftop, I looked down at the humans rushing around on the ground. It was time to begin the next phase of my plan. My plan B was basically the exact opposite of plan A. If going to the middle of nowhere and waiting for Superman to come to me wasn't going to work, I would just have to make myself so noticeable people would send him to me instead. And what better way to get his attention than making the government be the ones screaming at him to do something? Attention government agency goons. I called down to the black and yellow outfitted group, trying to both guard a perimeter and break back into a lab that looked like it had been attacked by another villain. Though points to them for bringing fancier looking guns than normal. I'm here to challenge your champions for the fate of the planet again. Call out Superman. Uh, Califa. I don't think those people work for the government. Lois commented before ducking away from the edge of the building. What do you mean? I think that's a HIV logo on the van. They're a Lois was cut off as the goons down below started shooting at me. So not government agents according to Lois. Why did HIV sound familiar? Were they like the Metropolis Special Police or the Star Lab security teams? Or some kind of discount shield that I forgot about? Meh. As long as they called Superman I didn't really care. A blue laser beam missed me by inches and I decided to give the goons my full attention. I shot a key beam into one of the SUVs the goons were hiding behind. 
turning it into a burning wreck of twisted metal, and sent them scurrying for cover, and then very obviously toying with them by shooting several weaker beams that barely dented the other forms of cover they were using. Despite being fancier, most of the guns I could safely ignore. Sure bullets stung a bit when they hit me and really scuffed up my armor pretty good, but I would take those every time rather than the unknown laser guns they had with them. Something that was quickly picked up on by the humans down below, and eventually we were in a fun game of tag where they would try to herd me into position with the more standard guns before trying to hit me with the laser guns while I did my best to dodge. That didn't mean I was just going to let them shoot at me though, that would get boring fast. So, every five laser shots they missed I would blow up one of the cars. Cars they were quickly running out of given how trigger-happy some of them were. If Superman didn't show up soon, the goons were going to have to walk back to whatever base they called home. Come on guys, either step up your game or get someone who can keep up. This is getting him bare hack. My snarky banter is interrupted by an SUV smacking me in the face. Considering I was still hovering over 20 feet in the air, that could only mean one thing. Someone fun had just shown up. Better. Now you're getting it. I exclaimed as I shoved the car off of me and looked where it had come from, eager to see who showed up. It was a giant man walking out of the lab followed by another squad in the same black and yellow colors as the goons, but missing the chest armor and the sleeves on the upper part to let the man's ridiculously huge muscled arms move freely. He was also missing the almost insectal helmets I had seen on the others too, showing off his wild red hair. I approved. He almost looked like a scion with that outfit. He was missing the tail though, so no chance of that. This runt is the one giving you so much trouble? He growled, making the goons flinch. Mammoth, sir. Shut up. We have what we came for. I'll deal with the brat. Mammoth. Huh? The name was familiar and I kinda remembered him being part of a team. The something five? So a fantastic four stand-in? Although if he was here with just some goons then I guess the team hadn't formed yet. Meh. I'll think about that later. For now. Deal with me. Huh? You're pretty cocky. Hope you're a good enough warm-up for when Superman gets here. I smirked at the giant and kicked off the ground before Mammoth could say anything else. I wasn't expecting someone looking like him to be a fast opponent but the muscular giant was quicker than I expected. He snapped up one arm just in time to use his forearm as a shield, and the only reaction I got was a small grunt. I felt the muscles in his arm tense and kicked away from him before he could retaliate. And even then the wind pressure from his backhanded swing blew my hair back. Okay, quick, but probably not fast and very strong. How durable was he though? The second my feet hit the pavement again I rushed him. Mammoth was again quick enough to raise his arms in defense when I went for his face, but he seemed content to let my slowly strengthening punches and kicks rain down on him. That tickles. He grunted, and that was the only warning I got before he tried slapping at me again. I jumped over it and using his arm as a springboard, kicked him in the face. Yeah. How about that one? Growling. Mammoth didn't verbally respond beyond growling and charging me in turn. I lightly jumped backwards as he repeatedly attempted to use his massive fists to hammer me into the pavement, taunting him the whole way and dishing out some counterattacks that didn't faze him much, only for him to snag another SUV as we passed by and use it as a baseball bat to smash me into another car and then through a building. Okay, I probably deserve that. I mumbled, pushing myself out of the wreckage. But that means no more holding back. My key aura flared a pale white as I powered up and I shot out of the ruined building and straight into Mammoth's stomach. This time my punch folded him in half and sent him flying into the second or third story of the building across the street. I didn't even get time to grin before the few goons hanging around opened up on me again. And this time I was just annoyed by it. Take a hint already and get lost. I snapped and fired off several key beams. This time I wasn't playing around and exploded all the cars I hit. That was enough to finally send all of them scurrying away. Seriously, didn't they figure out I was just playing with them earlier? The slight distraction was enough for Mammoth to jump back down to street level and glare at me. From the look of it my punch might have hurt, but it didn't seem to have done much damage. I'm going to crush you for that. I rolled my eyes. There was no point in a warm-up getting so dramatic. Mammoth didn't like that though and smashed both hands to the ground causing a shockwave that knocked me off balance long enough for him to get close enough that he was in punching range. 
and considering he was like three feet taller than I was, it meant he was able to punch at me while I still had to get closer to do anything. We traded punches as the fight moved down the street, the occasional car or light post getting used as an improvised weapon, and I realized eventually that Mammoth was wearing me down faster than I was doing to him. And by that I mean I missed blocking a punch, and winced when I felt a bone in my arm crack under the pressure. Arm hanging uselessly to not aggravate it. I switched things up so I was flying around the giant faster than he could track and occasionally knocking him around with a key blast. I didn't bother with those too much though, because the standard blasts only seemed to push him around and make him mad. That's it you annoying little fly. I've had enough of you. Mammoth raged after I got inside his guard and blasted him in the face, also incidentally proving my point. The red-headed giant lifted his foot and brought it down on the cracked and cratered streets with enough force to cause a localized earthquake. From the savage smirk on his face, he was pretty confident this move was going to deal with me. I looked around at the devastated surroundings and had to admit it was pretty impressive. There was just one teensy tiny problem. So, uh, you know that didn't do anything, right? I asked hesitantly. Cause I'm flying right now? Going by the way his smirk collapsed? No. No, he hadn't realized that. Mammoth was kind of a moron, wasn't he? Oh well, like I said he was only a warm-up. I should probably try to end this now. My key flared even higher and I sped past his guard again. This time I landed an uppercut that lifted him a couple inches off the ground, but I wasn't done. Before he could react, I twisted Midair into a kick that broke his nose and sent him flying down the street. Naturally, I flew after him and spun into an axe kick, slamming him headfirst into the pavement and leaving me hovering just over the resulting crater, a key attack charging in my hand. Mammoth groaned, still not actually unconscious, and looked up at me with a dazed expression. I grinned down at him, smile for the birdie, and unleashed my attack. Once the smoke cleared I saw Mammoth was finally out for the count and in no shape to keep fighting. With that out of the way I flew back up to the rooftop I left Lois at and waved at her. So, government agency dealt with. Their superhero backup is taking a nap for a while. And the guy who attacked the building before we got here is probably going to get away. You think that's enough to get Superman's attention soon? Lois gave me a long look before she started rubbing at her forehead. If you had listened earlier, I would have told you those were HIV agents. They're a terrorist group, not someone working for the government. They were the ones attacking the lab. I froze. So they were villains? Yes, yes they were. And while I'm sure someone will be glad you stopped them, did you have to destroy a city block in the process? I'm not supposed to stop villains. I protested. I'm supposed to be beating the heroes and taking over the world. I slouched in Madeira even my tail drooping down. Do you at least think this got Superman's attention? Despite looking like she had a headache, Lois looked at something behind me and smirked. I think you got a little more than that, kid. I turned. Flying silently a little above me with his arms crossed in front of his chest was Superman, along with Wonder Woman just off to the right of him, and Green Lantern just off to his left. This, this wasn't part of the plan. Growing Pains Chapter 23 My current situation sounded like the beginnings of a bad joke. A Kryptonian, a demigoddess, and a super space cop versus a pre-teen one-armed monkey girl. Who would win? Obviously not the monkey girl. Anyone who thought otherwise was lying to themselves. Well, I guess that also depended on exactly which pre-teen monkey girl you were talking about. There were probably a few out there that could pull off a win, but I knew for certain I couldn't. Not at my level anyway. Was I a bit bitter? Yes, yes I was. Because unlike all other times I got in over my head, there was no winning this one. Or even winning like the last few times. No, this was an instant go to jail card. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Maybe literally actually. I did just attack the army yesterday and just helped demolish a good section of a city block. Someone was probably pissed about that. Although... Escaping from a super jail did sound kinda interesting. No. Stay focused. Think of plans to break out of a jail when I wasn't being stared down by three superheroes that could beat me with one arm tied behind their back. One on one I could potentially do something unless they got serious. But against all three? Unless I got insanely lucky. Yeah. It wasn't happening. Was this what it was like to be Vegeta? 
where you beat one guy and feel all good about yourself, only for a bunch of people stronger to instantly pop up and you have no chance of winning. Because if this is what it feels like to be him, I completely understand why he was so pissed off all the time. Still, that didn't mean I was just going to just give up. I just had to buy myself some time by doing what I've been doing since I landed in Metropolis. Take refuge in audacity. Hey guys, Wadash, are you alright, child? I'm sorry we didn't arrive before the end of the fight. You seem wounded. Do you need to see a healer? And Wonder Woman cut me off before I could begin. Here I was desperately trying to figure out how to get one over three opponents I had no chance of beating, and yet Wonder Woman just saw an injured child that had just finished fighting what I now knew was a villain and wanted to make sure she was okay. I wasn't even a threat she needed to be wary of right now. Ouch, my pride. I deflated Medair, even my tail drooping down despondently. Yeah, my arm is broken. I most certainly did not pout. The shoulder might also be dislocated. Because now that the adrenaline was wearing off, I realized I couldn't move it very well. Well, your shoulder is definitely dislocated. But it looks like you only cracked the bone. Superman spoke up, and I realized he must have checked it out with his x-ray vision. Why don't we get that looked at while we talk? We actually needed to dash. Hey, before you go off and do your superhero stuff, can one of you get me off this roof? Lois yelled at us, as if the heroes didn't already notice her. Loi? What are you doing here? I turned and stared at a visibly surprised Superman. Did, did he really not notice her? That gremlin decided to kidnap me. Kidnap you? What for? W.H. Wa? Wonder Woman and Superman made questioning sounds at Lois's revelation. Green Lantern, on the other hand, was a bit more calm about the whole thing. Why don't we all head down to the streets and get the girl's injuries looked at? Then we can talk? He stated reasonably. Ooh. Watching the three heroes help with the aftermath of my fight was interesting. Batman never hung around the scene longer than to make sure the police showed up and the bad guy was in cuffs. And he certainly never talked to anyone unless he had to. Flash was kind of the opposite of that. He would happily chat with the responders, the bystanders, and even the guys he caught for as long as they wanted. It was a good thing he was so stupidly fast. He'd never get anything else done otherwise. Superman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern didn't work like that. Green Lantern sternly moved from place to place using his ring to move piles of rubble, clear paths, and shuffle people around as needed. And while he did talk to people, he seemed to say as little as possible to explain what he was doing and preferred talking to the responders. Superman, after he made sure no one was trapped by the rubble, was hanging out by the ambulances, either assisting the EMTs with his supervision or simply calming people down. And while those two had handled the cleanup, Wonder Woman took me to get my arm looked at and helped reset my shoulder before she moved away to deal with the reporters that seemed to have crawled out of the walls considering how many there were. At least she was until I tried slipping away. I got maybe 20 feet away before I was dragged back by my tail. Not literally. She actually used her lasso. Then she turned herself into my personal babysitter while answering a few more questions from the crowd. Lois looked far too smug about the whole thing. Anyway, once things got to a point the regular professionals could handle the rest, the three heroes grabbed me and Lois and moved us to a fairly deserted park so we could talk like they wanted. So what are you doing here, Lois? Superman began. And what was that about a kidnapping? I was in Nevada for a demonstration when this one dash, Lois took advantage of the fact I was still tied up to pat me on the head and ruffle my hair. Eclairte here. I'll bite. Decided to invade the base looking for me and a way to get in contact with you, she said, looking at Superman and completely ignoring my threat. No one thought the little gremlin would do all that just to ask a question, so we all assumed I was the target. Jimmy made a mistimed statement, and I got taken on an unexpected flight as a result. She scowled at me for the last part, and then went on to explain exactly what happened at the military base. I was unrepentant. Yes, it was stupid to kidnap her when I wasn't prepared to. No, I would not apologize. I had no idea. Superman sounded stunned. I had no idea why. I doubted anyone in charge of the army would have been happy admitting losing to a single alien and probably kept the whole thing a secret. And without someone telling him, how was he supposed to know? Wait, didn't that make my plan even stupider? They must never know. 
While I was shoving the memories of my kidnapping plan into the deepest, darkest hole I could, telepaths are a thing. Superman and Lois went back and forth a bit about getting her something to immediately let him know if something like that happened again with Lois vehemently refusing to wear a leash because the world could be dangerous. Thankfully, the other two heroes stepped in before things could get too awkward and brought up the reason the three of them were here in the first place. They needed to talk to me. Sure, I guess. What do you need? And could someone untie me? I asked reasonably, but was ignored. Two things, really. Green Lantern said. We finally got word back from Lantern Jordan a little while ago. He's on OA because when he asked about your species, he ran into an information block. Okay. I was confused and more than a little surprised. The Lanterns knew about other science? There was an info block on us? I won't bore you with too many of the details. Hey, hold on. I wanted those details. But we discovered the sector your people live in is actually under a severe quarantine after they almost depopulated five sectors and basically declared war on the universe. No one in or out without good reason. Of course we miss a few now and then, but they are usually found quickly and written off as pirates so we don't have another sector-wide war on our hands. Which made us wonder how you got all the way to Earth with no one noticing. Lantern Gardener backtracked your pod's trail and found traces of bleed radiation. Green Lantern loomed over me. What we need to know is, do the Scions have access to bleed tech? Can your pod open a portal? Not that I know of, and my pod uses a gravitic engine. I replied immediately, which surprised me. Until I glanced down and remembered what I was wrapped in. The lasso of truth. Ah, were you the only one sent out for your mission? Is anyone waiting to hear from you? I was the only one sent to this planet, but I was just one of a bunch of us being sent out all at once. I said, and even though I really wanted to stop there, my mouth kept moving. And no, Scions sent out on suicide missions don't have anyone listening for them. We either complete the mission or are forgotten about. Suicide mission? Thankfully, Superman's outburst was taken as a rhetorical statement, so I didn't have to answer him. The heroes shared another round of glances before Green Lantern finally nodded and backed away. Wonder Woman waved her hand, and the lasso magically loosened and fell away. I quickly hopped away from the magic rope and made a note to do everything I could to avoid getting caught by it again. So was that it? No, that was just the first thing. Wonder Woman said apologetically. The second, which seems even more necessary after hearing about your latest stunt and your mission, is that we need to do something about your law-breaking. Oh crap, was I actually going to go to prison? There was no real way to properly deal with you before the formation of the League, since very few heroes could give you an environment to help you integrate with Earth, but we believe that's changed. Between myself, Manhunter, and the other members of the League when time allows them, we can teach you more about man's world, if you will let us. So not prison. But were they seriously asking what I think they were? Or, are you asking me to be your sidekick? No. But since it would be a mistake to try sending you back to your sector, we are hoping to help make Earth your new home. Superman explained. And none of us think the normal programs will work for you. I've been training with Batman and Flash. I tried objecting, but was quickly overruled by Wonder Woman. Yes, you have been training, she emphasized. But both of them agree that's not enough for a childhood or healthy mental development. I scoffed. I've been doing fine so far. Picking a fight with the army and getting pressured into kidnapping doesn't sound fine to me. Green Lantern grumbled and I tried not to blush. You don't have to be a villain, Califa. Wonder Woman continued. Come with me to Themyscira. Give up the mission you were sent on and we can teach you to be better than that. I had to stop myself from laughing at that. It was hilarious that they thought I cared about my mission for as long as they did. Especially because the Green Lantern should have been able to tell I made the whole thing up by now if they had records of other scions. Other than that, I was actually a little torn about the offer. On the one hand, I really liked running around doing my own thing and occasionally dropping in to find a sparring partner somewhere. I'd probably be giving up a lot of my ability to do things like that. But since the formation of the Justice League, it wasn't guaranteed that a hero would be in any one city anymore and most of the villains were still in hiding. Not to mention training on my own was getting boring. On the other hand, I'd get to visit a magical island filled with immortal warrior women that have been training for dozens of years at least. Themyscira was also one of two places I wanted to explore the most, 
with the other being Atlantis, even if I did have to listen to their rules or get kicked off. Which meant if I got bored of Themyscira, I could make them let me leave at any time. I guess I wasn't all that torn about an answer after all. Okay then, when do we leave? Growing Pains, Chapter 24 So you're going to be training with the Amazons? Robin asked from his perch. Stupid bird brain always seemed to be trying to get above me whenever he could. For a bit. Seems like it will be fun. I replied as I swiped one of Kid Flash's nuggets. Hey. Head too slow. Apparently there were still some things Wonder Woman needed to take care of before we could leave, but I didn't really want to sit and do nothing until that happened. So I snuck off at the first opportunity to pester Flash into another race after a quick detour. Too bad for me he was busy somewhere else. I did find the psychic squad instead, so it wasn't all that bad. I dealt with Birdbrain enough to tolerate him, and Kid Flash was just a less cool Flash. Aqualad was a new addition since the King of Atlantis joined the Justice League, but he was quiet enough that sometimes I barely noticed him. I could have done without Speedy being there, though. He was a hot-headed idiot. I guess that means we won't need to put up with you for a while. Robin had an edge in his voice I couldn't quite place. It'll be nice to get back to one-on-one -on -one training, without you slowing me down going over the basics. What was that? Better train fast then. Cause when I come to visit I plan to kick your ass across the city. I bristled. Come to visit? What? Gonna say I can't. I scoffed. You don't own Gotham. Even if you did, I don't have to listen to your stupid human rules. I think Robin was just confused that you mentioned returning. Aqualad cut in. If Themyscira is anything like Atlantis, travel to the outside world is difficult. You made it sound like you would be gone for years. I rolled my eyes at him. If you can't fly, maybe. For me it's just getting on and off the island, and then flying for a couple hours. Hear that, Robin? Speedy laughed annoyingly. Your girlfriend is saying she'll still come to visit. He looked between us and pouted when neither of us had much of a reaction. Nothing? Seriously? Robin shrugged. I'm eleven. He said like that explained everything. Which it kinda did. I, on the other hand, saw a perfect opportunity to mess with the archer. Was that supposed to be funny somehow? What's a girlfriend? Ah, Speedy trailed off. But I wasn't the only one that smelled blood in the water. Yeah, Speedy. Explain to the class what a girlfriend is. Kid Flash jumped in. Something you'll never have, KF. I grinned and sat back to enjoy watching the sparks fly as the two redheads started trading insults, which eventually spread to include Birdbrain because he couldn't control his mouth and Aqualad futilely trying to calm things down. Unity among the heroes was broken, chaos reigned, and I was victorious. All was right with the world. I don't know what I'll be doing. I threw my hands in the air after they started rapid-firing questions. They didn't give me a list or anything. Heh, the struggle of sidekicks continues. Speedy laughed. Guess you aren't immune to the mushroom treatment either. Mushroom treatment? Calder asked. He was pretty good with surface expressions, but every once in a while he got stumped. I guess that one didn't translate well. Being kept in the dark and fed bullcrap. Kid Flash explained and then frowned at the archer. And you really think our mentors do that? Nah, but it feels that way sometimes. Speedy waved him off. I'm sure the monkey will learn. Okay, I needed to stop a misunderstanding. You guys know I'm not gonna be a sidekick, right? I stated bluntly, and based on the surprised expressions on all of them, no. No, they didn't know that. Huh. I thought you said Wonder Woman was going to be training you? Kid Flash looked at me in shock. Yeah, so? That doesn't mean I have to be a hero. I do not believe Wonder Woman or the League would allow you to continue any criminal activities either. Aqualad pointed out. I slumped at that. Yeah, probably not. It was bad enough when I just had Batman's rules. But since I can't just have fun after tomorrow? Robin rolled his eyes. You only listened to half of those anyway. I rolled mine right back. He was just jealous. I decided to end tonight with a bang. A classic crime any self-respecting villain has pulled off at least once, a jewel heist. The kitty heroes all stiffened and looked at me. You know, we can't just let you rob a store, right? Kid Flash said slowly. You'd be pretty bad heroes if you did. I agreed. And now that you admitted to planning a crime, we aren't going to just let you take off. Speedy adjusted the grip on his bow. 
I mean, you can't stop me from just flying away. A smirk split my face. Cutter stood and pulled out the hilts to his magic water weapon things. You wouldn't have told us your plans if you were just going to run away. You want us to try and stop you. I tried to rein in the feelings of excitement and started shaking out my arms and legs. If you want a handicap, I can stay on the ground. No way you could stop me, though. For V1, Callie, Kid Flash pointed out. Pretty good odds, I'd say. My grin widened and Robin groaned. You already stole something, didn't you? Stupid monkey. That man really was an amazing teacher. He even managed to get Birdbrain to stop being completely stupid. I pulled a clear gem the size of my fist from behind my back and waved it tauntingly. Yep. And not one of you noticed. Better luck next time. Then, just because I could, I backflipped off the roof and cackled the whole way down as I listened to them scramble to chase after me. Ooh, well the kids are getting along. I was worried news of Califa going to Themyscira would make some of them pull away. Superman commented as they watched the quartet of sidekicks chase after the Scion girl. She has a way of pulling you into her pace. Once she got them to sit down and talk it was unlikely any of them could ignore her. Batman pointed out. And I've never seen her hold much of a grudge for long. Makes me wonder what you did that she dislikes you so much. Ahem. Er. Yeah, who knows? Superman coughed and deliberately turned away. It's good for her to have ties to others her age. Wonder Woman commented. The main point of taking her under our wing was to give her a safe place to learn to integrate with man's world. Not isolate her on Themyscira. That was something that had worried all three heroes. Califa wasn't the kind of person to stay in one place for very long. Her jaunts across North America made that obvious. And while she had met and somewhat befriended several heroes in that time, she had also made contact with criminal organizations that wouldn't hesitate to take advantage of her thrill-seeking personality for their own gain, as seen by her involvement with an underground fight ring. Batman had already confirmed Lex Luthor was interested in the young scion. And if Luthor was involved, that no doubt meant several others were looking to exploit the girl as well, some of which might be attached to various governments. Even though the U.S. Army had tried to keep the incident quiet, Many other organizations had heard about the destroyed prototype. A few people were using that incident to secure more funding for their own projects, while others were using it to call for harsher responses to alien threats. Not to mention that several news outlets were starting to float anti-alien rhetoric as fronts for groups like Humanity First, Cadmus, Blue Cosmos, and others like them. It was lucky that Califa had almost immediately taken down a HIV cell which took a lot of wind out of the sails of many of the more aggressive of them, but it still highlighted the need to teach the Scion at least how to identify the common sense others expected from her. Your mother didn't have an issue with allowing Califa to leave the island? Batman already knew the answer, but Themyscira had been heavily isolationist for hundreds of years. It didn't hurt to clarify. Wonder Woman shook her head. Mother has decided we cannot shut ourselves away from the rest of the world anymore. I doubt many of my sisters will be interested in leaving for quite some time, but Califa will be free to come and go, provided she listens to her teachers, of course. Considering the martial nature of the Amazons, Califa would either be the best student they ever had, or would be too busy challenging her teachers to fights to learn anything. Well, give me a heads up when she does leave. It'll be nice to have some warning before she demands a rematch for once. Superman joked before looking back in the direction of the kids. Though, don't you think we should step in? A jewelry heist right before she leaves won't be a good look. It's fake, Batman said bluntly, pulling out a small screen. On it was footage from a security camera at a themed mini golf course. Large glass decorations made to look like gemstones dotted the walls. Suddenly a familiar monkey-tailed girl entered the frame and plucked one of the decorations out of the wall before flying off. I'll take care of the damages. Oh, all right then. Wonder Woman frowned. Are you sure? Even if the gym is fake, Califa doesn't have much regard for property damage. It could get out of hand. Califa tends to limit herself to match whoever she is fighting. Batman disagreed. As long as the sidekicks control themselves, there won't be an issue. Superman nodded. You're right. They're young, but all of them have a good head on their shoulders. Maybe we... At that precise moment, several explosions rang out in the background. The three heroes exchanged looks. 
Batman silently turned on a heel and power walked towards the edge of the building, pulling a grapple gun on the way. On second thought, they are all children. We should check on them and make sure they don't level the city. Superman and Wonder Woman chuckled, but rushed after the Cape Crusader just the same. Growing Pains, Chapter 25 I was kind of surprised that Wonder Woman insisted on using a plane to fly to Themyscira rather than just flying ourselves. But once we started passing through the magical hurricane barrier that separated the island from the rest of the world, I fully understood why. Flying through rain sucked. Flying through magical rain for over 20 minutes would have been terrible. Even if it didn't do anything, it would have been cold, wet, and annoying. Putting the hull of the VTOL plane thing Batman loaned us, while I demolished and investigated the snack cabinet, was a much better way to travel. It also meant that we would be meeting the small welcome party without being soaking wet, which was nice. The ramp dropped and Wonder Woman and I made our way off the ship while one of the Amazons walked forward with her arms spread open. Diana, welcome home, daughter. I hope the journey was a pleasant one. Thank you, mother. And yes, but it's good to be home, Wonder Woman replied, stepping into the hug. While those two were talking, I took the chance to look around at the surroundings, which were pretty much what I expected for an isolated tropical island. Clean, white beaches, crystal clear ocean, and a thick forest that blocked the rest of the island from view. Pretty, but not what I was interested in. No, my focus was on the six Amazons that had been waiting with Wonder Woman's mom. Wonder Mom? Probably shouldn't say that out loud, though. That were either looking at the surroundings, watching me, or glancing at the hugging pair. They didn't exactly look like I was expecting. The armor they had on was more similar to Wonder Woman's outfit than the classical Greek stuff I had seen. A lot less metal protection than I was expecting, though maybe they didn't need it. But enough of that for now, we are being rude to our guest. Wonder Mom interrupted my thoughts and walked over to me. Welcome to Themyscira, Califa of the Scions. I am Queen Hippolyta, Despite looking like Wonder Woman's older sister, Wonder Mom really nailed the mom tone. Calm, patient, and just the slightest hint of an iron will of control hiding under the surface. She was pretty cool. I'm sure you are itching to explore the island and meet your teachers, she continued. But first I would like to learn more about you and the circumstances regarding your stay on my island. To that end, we've prepared a feast. Her welcoming speech was interrupted when my stomach decided to announce itself. Loudly. Hee hee, sorry. I awkwardly rubbed at my traitorous midsection. I'm still a little hungry. How? You ate enough emergency rations for three people on the flight over. Wonder Woman muttered, drawing some interested looks from the guards. The queen just smiled. Well then, let's not waste time. We can continue our discussion after we eat. Ooh. I had to give the Amazons one thing. Their cooks certainly knew what they were doing. The goat was soft and juicy and the sauce matched it perfectly. I needed some more of that. The bread was nice and fluffy with a crunchy exterior, and a bunch of things baked into it that made it more interesting than just being flour. There was some kind of leaf thing that was stuffed with meat that was pretty tasty, too small though. I had to eat two or three at a time to really enjoy them. But that was fine. It went really well with a salad that was basically just rough-cut veggies and cheese. Good cheese too. Though it didn't mix super well with the fish thing they brought out. Oh, they had a lamb dish too. And a whole cow. Man, I should have come to Themyscira earlier. They really knew how to welcome someone. And the food just kept coming. Dear gods, where does she even put it all? I have no idea. Her stomach is like a bottomless pit. Does she have no manners at all? I hope the kitchens can keep up with her. Stop standing around and get the next course. There was some muttering from where some of the servants were huddling but I wasn't really paying attention to them. Unless they decided to talk to me directly, I was just going to focus on my food. Ah, I am Khalifa. Though I should probably listen to what Wonder Mom wanted. I take it you are enjoying the food? Uh-huh. I energetically nodded before making sure to swallow everything. It's really good. It's like when I eat with the flash, but this stuff is way better. She smiled while Wonder Woman was mumbling something next to her, looking annoyed. I'm glad, but perhaps we should have that discussion now. I'd planned to have it after you finished, but her eyes shifted to the pile of empty plates next to me that was slowly being taken away by a servant. I think we might be waiting longer than anticipated if we did that. Sure. I shrugged. 
It didn't really matter to me one way or the other. I just went back to picking at the food in front of me. The queen nodded. Has my daughter explained what you will be doing here yet? Not really. She mentioned learning how to fit in on earth better, but that was kind of it. That will be one aspect of your time, but you will also be learning from us about several subjects. History, mathematics, languages just to name a few as well as continuing your martial training since Diana mentioned you were studying under a mentor before. I groaned. School. Wonder Woman tricked me into going to a magical island just for school. First Superman, now her. Was the entire Justice League just filled with people that were secretly evil? I better keep a real close eye on Batman. Things usually get really bad when he turns evil. Ooh. The next few days were torture as all my new teachers tried to find out where I stood in their respective subject. Some of them, like math oddly enough and a few sciences, weren't terrible because one or both sets of memories remembered enough to get by or the information was burned into my brain by either a scion gestation pod or the public school system. I might not know how to calculate the derivative of X, but mitochondria was the powerhouse of a cell. None of that mattered though because it was finally time for the one class I was actually excited to attend. Combat class. I was actually excited enough that I was already in the open-aired classroom, already changed into the new outfit the Amazons gave me. Basically the same thing everyone else was wearing, but smaller, without anyone needing to drag me there. And I was actually early for once because no one was there to meet me. Oh well, might as well get some stretches done. Alright this is getting boring. Where the heck is she? Another few minutes pass by before the dark-haired Amazon I assume is my teacher finally decided to show up, looking both surprised and annoyed that I was still here. Well guess what? The feeling is mutual. You're still here. Well I suppose I should at least introduce myself. The Amazon sighed. I am Melanope, and I have nothing to teach an outsider like you. Now leave. What? No seriously, what? She couldn't do that. I put up with all the boring stuff just for this class. She couldn't just tell me to leave and expect me to listen. Your queen said you had to. My queen is so twisted around her daughter's finger that she is blinded to the fact that interacting with the outside world will just lead us to ruin. Melanope snorted. I spent years training Diana to be a protector for this island. Not for her to abandon her duties and run around playing. What were they called? Ah, uh, yes, superhero with a bunch of savages. Oh great. Melly Dash, Melana Dash. Mel was the same person to train Wonder Woman. Yeah, I wasn't going to let her dangle that bit of information in front of me and then just walk away. Okay, then how about a bet? I pointed at the circular ring not too far from us. First one to knock the other out of that ring wins. I win. You have to teach me. You win. And I'll leave the island. Mel raised an eyebrow. You expect me to fall for such a cheap trick? Why would I bother when I told you I have no intention of teaching you anything? I shrugged. I mean, if Wonder Woman had to leave just to find something better to do you can't be all that good. But Wonder Mom has been pretty nice, so I figured I'd give you a chance to not be a weakling before I go find someone worth my time. Maybe I could see if Atlantis has anyone decent? This will be worth it just to beat some manners into you. Mel growled before walking over to the ring. I didn't waste time flying over across from her. Begin. There was no countdown, no tell that she was going to move. It was only by instinct and luck that I managed to dodge her first attack and then start blocking the next. Not that I managed it that well. Mel was like a slightly stronger, faster Batman. Definitely superhuman, but not by a huge amount. But she made up for that with pure skill. She knew exactly how to move to control the pace of the fight. And she wanted it to end fast, but also to make it hurt. Unless I wanted to cheat and just start moving faster than her. I was going to keep getting pummeled without being able to do anything back. She was going to be so much fun to fight later, but first I had a bet to win. I dove out of the way of a grapple and turned to see Mel standing there with a smug look on her face. That was fine, I thought, settling into a stance. I already won. What's the matter? Running away won't help, G-U-H. Mel's taunt was cut off when my key flared up into a visible aura. The ground shook lightly, and the sudden wind made her stumble half a step. Then I pushed my key higher. A little wind won't be enough, Mel shouted, slowly stepping closer and raising an arm to shield her eyes and stop her hair from whipping her face. I said nothing. 
I just focused on collapsing all my ki into a little point centered on my chest and then with a mighty yell, forced it all out again in a bright flash that caught Mel by surprise, and more importantly, sent her flying out of the ring. Victory! Now to get her to teach me how to move like that. Ooh. From a distant lookout, Queen Hippolyta and Diana watched as the Scion girl began to pester Melanope until the Amazon gave up and started showing her and correcting a handful of strikes and stances she had used in the brief fight. It seems that matter is settled then. Hippolyta murmured. I don't understand why you assigned Melanope as Caliphus teacher if she was so against it. Diana commented. There were plenty of others that were willing to take her as a student. The queen hummed. There were others, yes. But aside from Melanope being as good or better than all of them, there was another reason. Another reason? There is a small but very vocal group of Amazons that feel that we should remain isolated from man's world. Melanope is one of them. Isn't that all the more reason another should teach Califa? Diana frowned. I wouldn't want a small part of our sisters to drive her off. Hippolyta chuckled. I'd be rather surprised if an unwelcoming attitude was enough to drive the girl off. In fact, I believe Melanope may have done the opposite and will have to spend a considerable amount of effort avoiding or distracting her new student. Diana thought about the reports Bruce had made about Califa's determination to have him train her and her own few interactions with the young scion. And she had to admit her mother probably had a point. Still, that can't have been your only reason. She pressed, getting a nod in return. Indeed. I'm hoping that by interacting with the girl, some of those vocal dissenters will realize something very important. Hippolyta said seriously, causing Diana to look at her in alarm and confusion. Mother? You know what I speak of, daughter. You and your friends dealt with it not long ago. There were several things Diana had written or spoken to her mother of, but only one that stood out recently. The invasion? Hippolyta nodded. Yes, a horde of invaders from beyond the stars. One that infiltrated, suborned, sabotaged, and almost flat-out conquered man's world in a week once they revealed themselves. She paused and watched as Melanippe corrected some flaw in the Scion Girl's technique. If it had not been for you and the others, only the gods know what might have happened. And we knew nothing about it until it was all over. The Imperium was crafty. It's no surprise they managed to hide so well. Diana offered, but her mother waved it off. That wasn't my point. She denied. The world is changing again, Diana. Califa is by her own admission young and weak for her species, yet she wields strength similar to a lesser demigod in the old days. If an army of her manages to find its way to Themyscira, we would fall. I won't let that happen. Of course not, if you knew about it. Hippolyta agreed. But that is the key of it, is it not? If we remain isolated, hidden from the rest of the world, who will we call for aid when the next invaders come for us? How will we know to prepare for war at the gates if the invaders land elsewhere? She sighed. No, we cannot remain isolated as we have been. I just hope the more stubborn of our sisters realize that before it is too late. Diana had nothing to say to that, since she also wanted more interaction between her home and man's world. In the end, the mother-daughter pair simply watched the training below in silence, contemplating what the future could hold for them. Growing Pains, Chapter 26 It was another perfect day in Themyscira. The skies were clear, the water was calm, the kangaroos were frolicking in the fields, and several women could be seen trading at some street stall dotting the city of Amazons. It was the very picture of paradise. Find her. Sisters. And tell that brat when I get my hands on her, she'll be polishing the floors till her arms fall off. An enraged shout shattered the idyllic atmosphere. Over a dozen Amazons in full armor could be seen running through the streets, hunting down the focus of their leader's ire. Yet despite the armed warriors prowling the city and inspecting every nook and cranny, none of the bystanders seemed nervous about the behavior. In fact, some of them seemed greatly entertained by the whole thing. What do you think it is this time? One of the shop vendors asked her customer. None of this batch have bows with them, but they still have their quivers. My guess is that some weaponry has been relocated for training purposes. Idmaro wouldn't be so angry if that was the case. The vendor countered. My guess is another artwork was accidentally destroyed after a history lesson ran too long. Hmm, it has been a while since that happened. But no, 
If something was destroyed, Edmuro wouldn't be threatening polishing the floors. She would be keeping the girl as far from anything fragile as possible. The other woman mused. Or perhaps not. I think we would all prefer if there was never another horse slash kangaroo war. It took forever to get the hoof prints off the walls. Several Amazons listening in on the conversation shivered at the reminder of that particular incident. Any further speculation was put on hold as one of the armored seekers jogged up to the stand. Excuse me, sisters, have any of you seen the outsider recently? She asked, either oblivious to or deliberately ignoring the several disapproving frowns that formed in the gathering crowd. Not recently. Why, what's she done this time? The seeker looked mad enough to spit. The outsider convinced the queen to put on one of those recorded plays from Man's World, some drivel by someone named Disney, to show us how the rest of the outsiders remember our history. She explained. It was the most ridiculous, inaccurate, and downright insulting bit of theater I have ever witnessed. Hardly any of the gods were depicted accurately. The tone was all over the place. Mighty trials, feats and deeds passed over as mere footnotes and they even managed to get Heracles's name wrong. She shifted awkwardly. The music was decent, however. But that wasn't all the outsider did. While we were distracted, she broke into the pantheon and painted the visages of the Olympians to match the play. Lord Zeus is orange. Great Hera is reddish pink. Several Amazons sucked in a breath and looked nervously to the skies, half expecting to see thick thunderclouds rolling across the skies but there was no such thing in sight. Many of them decided the king of the gods was either not offended by what had happened, or more likely had determined the Amazons themselves would have to deal with the matter. I see, the vendor said slowly as she moved to close down her stall. Well, in that case, perhaps it would be best if we all lended a hand to find our troublemaker and make sure she is properly punished for what she's done. Ooh, there was a large crash as an Amazon kicked in a door. The assailant swiftly strode into the room, spotted the single occupant, and pointed a sword at her. Where is she, Melanope? Captain Idmoro, was that truly necessary? The other woman sighed. I believe so. You've been growing closer to the outsider despite our sister's warnings. Obviously your judgment has been impaired. Idmoro sniffed. The girl has been here for two years. You can say her name by now, Melanope said, rolling her eyes. I think it's become very clear Califa does not care if we consider her part of our community or not. We can have this debate later. We've already wasted enough time. Now tell me where she is hiding. I think you're misunderstanding our relationship. I'm her teacher, not her minder. Melanope huffed. Our faction allowed you to teach the outsider specifically, so you would be her minder. Idmoro snapped. Have you abandoned your loyalty to your sisters because of one girl? There was a sudden blur of motion a clang of metal, and Idmoro's sword was ripped from her hand. Melanope's own blade rested lightly on the guard captain's cuirass. Mind your tongue, captain. Melanope whispered dangerously. It's true I had similar feelings about the outside world as you and your circle, but it was the queen that gave me my orders. Not any of you. T that may be, but we still need to find the outsider. Idmoro stuttered. She's gone too far this time and has to face the main temple. We cannot allow her to escape punishment. The combat instructor was stunned into silence. While Melanope was no longer willing to alienate Califa simply because of her background or because of internal politics, that in no way translated into allowing the young scion to have free reign on the island. Well, that is important enough to go find her, Melanope eventually said, moving about the room and gathering up her armor. You said that no one knows where she is? No one. The guard captain confirmed. Not since before the incident. God's damn it all. That means she has something else planned. Melanope cursed. Califa has never hidden away from one of her stunts. She must be using the chaos of the guards searching for her as a distraction for something. Ooh. It wasn't long before most of the island heard about what Califa had done and either joined in the hunt for the scion or went on alert for the next act of chaos the girl had planned. But as the day went on and there was no sign of the girl or what she had planned, many of the Amazons were beginning to grow paranoid. Subtle was not a word that could often be associated with the tailed menace. So when they didn't find her cackling in an open field daring the guards to fight her like she had when she had stolen Hippolyta's crown, 
Most of the island realized whatever she had planned was going to be big. Horse slash kangaroo were big. And at the thought of that, efforts to find the scion and stop her redoubled. Themyscira moved almost to war footing in an attempt to find and stop whatever was going to happen, but no one could find any sign of her. Hunting parties formed and started scouring the forests and countryside. Guards started poking through vaults and storage rooms that had been undisturbed for years, and several Amazons debated interrupting the queen's personal time with her daughter to ask Diana to assist them in the search. Because while they found evidence that several malicious artifacts had been moved or started influencing their surroundings, a small cabal of Amazons conspiring with a coven of witches to engineer a plague targeting only men, and even a demonic summoning circle hidden in some of the more secluded areas of the island, there still was no sign of the scion. Ooh. Eventually a group of guards conceded defeat and decided that admitting they were not good enough to track down a teenager was more important than letting whatever scheme she was in the middle of take them by surprise. Lots were drawn, and not long after one of them was chosen as the sacrificial goat, and left waiting for her queen in a secure room. Unfortunately for the poor guard, she was left on her own for several minutes stewing in her own thoughts while the queen finished whatever she was just doing. Hello, Seda. I've managed to clear some time for this. Queen Hippolyta greeted the guard. What emergency are we dealing with? It's the girl, Califa. Your Majesty. Seta repliet. I don't suppose you've heard about her latest stunt? The movie she wanted to show everyone? Hippolyta asked. Yes, I approved it even though I'm sure some of our stauncher traditionalists are foaming at the decision. Seta vince. I'm sure they are not pleased, but compared to what she did afterward, I don't think many will mention it. What she did afterward? Seta described what Califa had done to the statues of their gods and the ongoing hunt for the Scion teen. She also brought up Melanope's theory that that was just a distraction for some other disaster and the guard's inability to find her anywhere. So that's why I found her outside the temple. Hippolyta sighed and rubbed her brow. I suppose it was too much to hope for that she was actually behaving for once. I'd hope Diana's presence would influence her some more, but it seems she is still acting like a child. Seda very carefully did not mention that the queen seemed abnormally tolerant of Califa, and that her behavior towards the girl had caused rumors that Wonder Mom was looking for a second child. Instead, she tried to move the conversation back to safer topics. None of the priestesses have reported anything amiss, but if what she did angered the gods, Hippolyta huffed. Considering I caught Califa with who I am now, certain was Lord Hermes I doubt the gods will be angry. I assume the temple's caretakers are already removing what she's done? Oh, when I get my hands on that girl. You know where she is? Seda exclaimed, interrupting the queen's building tirade. I just said farewell to both her and my daughter not ten minutes ago. Both of them are heading back to the outside world for some time. The queen confirmed, which makes the letter Califa left behind suddenly feel much more foreboding. A letter? Yes, for her combat instructor apparently since she did not tell her she was leaving the island. Normally I'd call Melanope here, but if Califa really does have something brewing, she trailed off as she unfolded the paper. Hey Mel, I'm catching a ride back to the States with Wonder Woman, planning on dropping in on the psychic squad for a bit, so I won't be around for lessons. Sorry for not giving you a heads up, but it was kinda last minute. P.S. Enjoy the surprise I left you. I was told both of them go really well together. Both Queen and Royal Guard sighed at the confirmation that there was a surprise waiting for them one that apparently didn't need Califi there in person to set off. And with the culprit having already made her escape, they had no clues to go on. They just had to hope they stumbled across whatever surprise she had left behind before it was too late. Ooh. I idly hummed a song from the Hercules movie soundtrack as the javelin left Themyscira behind us. I had forgotten how catchy some of those were. You seem like you're in a good mood. Wonder Woman commented from where she was piloting the ship. Eager to meet up with the others? A little bit. I shrugged. It had been a while since the last time I visited the sidekicks, but honestly I was more excited to put all my time training to the test. I had improved a lot over the past two years. I couldn't wait to see where I stood now. I was so excited in fact that I had decided to only pull a minor prank on the Amazons before I left. Painting the gods to match the color scheme they had in the movie would annoy a few of them for sure, but they could clean it up pretty quickly. 
I just hoped that Mel enjoyed the two fish I had left in her kitchen before I left. Apparently they tasted really good but were hard to find. I'd have to snag a couple for myself the next time I visited to see if they were really that good. Growing Pains, Chapter 27 I really missed this. I sighed as I took another bite of my El Fuego Inferno Fireburger. Amazon cooking was great, but they had a severe lack of certain spices I had taken a liking to. So, every time I left the island, I made a point to stop at Central City and visit a local burger joint the Flash had taken me to a couple times. They also didn't really do fried foods very often, or even all that well. I blamed the lack of potatoes. Hey kid, back from your tropical island vacation house. A red blur whooshed into the other side of the booth which, unsurprisingly, turned out to be the Flash, who immediately stole one of my fries. Hey, those are mine. I protested, doing my best to simultaneously cram the rest of my burger in my mouth, guard my fries, and glare at the evil speedster. Seriously, why were all the members of the Justice League secretly evil? Didn't see your name on it. Flash said smugly, casually stealing another fry and ignoring my glare. Ha! Serves you right for stealing my food all the time. His sidekick sniped from the side as he zipped over with two other platters of food. Shut up, Speedy. It's Kid Flash. Kid. Flash. Why is that so hard to remember? The redhead complained, but I just rolled my eyes at him. It was his fault for picking such a dumb name. Whatever. So what's up? Unless you just came by to steal my food. I directed my attention back to the Flash. What? I can't just swing by to say hello. What happened to the cute little alien girl that just wanted to play tag with me all day? Flash faked a sniffle. I just grumbled under my breath about cheating speedsters and their unfair amount of stamina. Yes, I was much faster thanks to my workouts with the Flash and his sidekick, but that didn't mean I was any closer to matching his speed without flying and even then he left me in the dust. Anyway, the Scarlet Speedster continued slightly more seriously. We were on our way to grab a bite and I saw you in the window. You split with Wonder Woman for the day? I shrugged, casually scratching at my shins. They had been really bugging me lately along with some other places. She has some sort of meeting between ambassadors going on, so I decided to explore by myself for a few weeks. A few weeks? Wait, does that mean you aren't going back to Themyscira for a while? Kid Flash jumped in. Wasn't planning on it. Not that I actually had much planned for my trip away from the island. And most of the things I did have planned boiled down to go to X-City and poke around for something interesting to do. Cool. Rob's been waiting to surprise you for weeks. Let me know when you head to Gotham because I have to see the look on your face. Kid Flash said excitedly. Bird Brain had a surprise for me? That was ominous. But before I could interrogate ask him about that, Flash raised a hand to his ear as some kind of alert came in on what I assumed was an earbud under his mask. In less than a blink of an eye Flash had gathered up his food and was out of his seat. Sorry kids, there's a chemical fire on the other side of town. I've got to run. Whoa, hold up. Kid Flash cried. What about me? I'll come too. No way. Flash shook his head. This is too dangerous to take kids into. Your parents would kill me. But hey, if you're looking for something to do, a silent alarm just went off in a jewelry store on 4th and Jefferson. Think you can handle that? Yes? Cool. I'll meet up with you later. Catch you later, short stuff. And just like that he was gone. I watched with amusement as Kid Flash slouched on the table and used super speed just so he could keep pouting without taking a long time to finish his food. Once he was done, he grabbed all the trash and started leaving. All right, I've got to run. Bad guys to catch and all that. I'll see you around, Callie. Ah, uh, wait. I called after him, gathering up my own stuff. I want to play with you when you're done. For some reason, he started moving faster when I said that. In the end it didn't matter if Kid Flash ran off on me. I knew where he was going and I could fly while he had to run around buildings and cars and stuff. I ended up meeting him just as he showed up with a smug smile plastered on my face. I whyin. I taunted even as he ignored me and pretended to focus on the store. Looks like just one robber and no hostages. He said, mostly to himself. Guess that means I'll have this taken care of in a flash. Boo. I complained at Kid Flash's pawn. He tried ignoring me again and threw open the door to the store. All right, hold it right there. 
Kid Flash cut off and I floated over his shoulder to see why. Instead of a normal thief like either of us was probably expecting, there was a man in a weird green and orange suit. And I say weird because the orange parts were somehow translucent, so you could see the shadows of the green parts right through him. Mirror Master. KF finished, shifting position so he was ready to move in any direction. Well now, if it isn't the psychic and the alien girl. Mirror Master drawled. Is Flash running late? Ha, huh, I'm more than enough to take you down. Kid Flash boasted. Besides, a jewelry store? Seems a little low end for you, Mirror Master. But I guess crime doesn't pay as well as it used to. I'm just tagging along, I added, not really paying attention to the whole thing. While Flash was fun to hang around, most of his villains tended to be on the techie and clever side of things. They usually had some neat stuff, but a solid hit would put them down for the count like what happened with Captain Popsicle. Since then I'd seen Flash fight the Trickster and Australia Man, and neither one of them changed my mind about that. They had cool gadgets and skills, but were still just human. Crime pays very well, actually. Mirror Master replied to KF. But every once in a while, you just have to respect the classics. Ah, another villain who paid attention to the type of job they did instead of something stupid like how big a payday they would get or how useful it was to them and I could respect that. Of course I can never get enough diamond focusing lenses. So, two birds, one stone. Ah, never mind then. Mirror Master took a step to the side and suddenly there were two of him. Then those took a step and there were four. I blinked as the store was suddenly flooded with copies of the villain. That was actually pretty cool. I wished I could do that, wait. The multiform technique was a thing. I could do that. The only question was how. Sorry kids, I don't have time to play around. But hey, I'm a fair guy. I'll give you a chance to hit the real me. What do you say? Kid Flash shifted to a more aggressive stance. I say bring it on. And then he rushed the first group of clones. Predictably his fist went through all of them before they faded to nothing. Oh, sorry sidekick. Tough luck. Maybe next time. Now it's my turn. Every clone said at once and pulled out a pair of high-tech looking pistols. Since Mirror Master's whole thing seemed to be holograms and stuff, I was only expecting the two guns the real one had to actually do anything, but as I watched Kid Flash duck and dive through an onslaught of laser beams, I was surprised to see every single beam did damage to what they hit. Remembering the lessons Mel beat into me every chance she got, I made sure to dodge any beams that looked like they were going to hit me even though I was pretty sure I'd be fine even if they did and watched KF flail around at all the clones. None of the Mirror Masters seemed concerned about what he was doing at all so I guessed he wasn't close to hitting the real one. Need to do better than that, sidekick. Mirror Master taunted as Kid Flash punched another clone. He must have been getting frustrated, cause he overcommit to the punch and left himself open to a shot that hit him in the side, knocking him over and practically through a display stand. You okay, KF? I couldn't help but call out. Yeah, he was a little annoying but I didn't want him dead or something. Yeah, gonna feel that one in the morning, the redhead called back, flinching and holding his side as he tried to get back on his feet. A little help? Oh, is it the alien girl's turn now? The Mirror Masters all turned to face me. Think you can find the real one when your friend couldn't? I shrugged. Don't have to find the real one if I just hit all of them. I cupped my hands together in front of me and focused. A sphere of key formed and before any of the clones could react, I started shooting smaller key blasts at each of them like a machine gun. How's that? I cheered as the dust settled. None of the blasts were all that powerful, but that many had to have hit the real one. Huh. I looked around at the empty store in confusion. I definitely hit all of them so how come? That was dangerous. My head snapped towards the side of the store where I saw Mirror Master casually sitting on what was left of a counter. Considering he looked completely fine and not even a little nervous about the fact I had shot a few hundred key blasts at him, I was pretty sure this was another clone. Still, it was better than what your friend tried. But I'm afraid I don't have time to play with you kids anymore. Who knows? Maybe next time you'll be good enough to play with the big leagues. I cut him off with another key blast through the chest, and just like I thought it went right through him. I snarled as more clones appeared and began shooting at not only me, but Kid Flash as well. Kid Flash was able to zip around dozens of lasers and punch out a few clones before running back to my side. 
I managed to dodge most of them but got hit with a couple when I slowed down to fire back at the copies. They didn't do much beyond burning some holes in my clothes, which was sure to get me in trouble with Wonder Woman later. I didn't have too many spares that weren't my armor, and she preferred me to wear the outfits the Amazons gave me when out in public. Whatever. I'd deal with that later. This guy is a serious pain in the tail. Another three copies faded to nothing, only to be replaced seconds later. Yeah, this would be a whole lot easier if we could just sense where the real one was. KF complained as he ducked another laser. I froze in midair after he said that. A few more lasers hit me, but I didn't react to them. I was too busy facepalming with embarrassment. Stupid. Wah. I ignored Kid Flash's shout of surprise and focused on my key since that I hadn't been paying attention to like an idiot. Unsurprisingly, there were a bunch of people in the area even though the fight had been going on for a few minutes now. I could ignore the ones in the surrounding buildings or too far away, but there were two key signatures nearby, and one of them was Kid Flash. The other one was right behind me, and even though I couldn't see anything I trusted my key sense and shot a blast at the seemingly empty area. The little yellow orb exploded on something, and another mirror master was thrown to the ground. It didn't take a genius to figure out this was the real one. It just took a stupid scion that literally forgot she could sense people. Ugh, if anyone knew about this, I'd never live it down. Whoa, you got him? KF exclaimed. How'd you know he was there? I don't want to talk about it. I grumped. Come on, let's tie him up and get going. You owe me a game of tag. You can't just leave me hanging like that, Callie. Come on, tell me. Callie? Callie. Growing Pains, Chapter 28 Even several days after splitting up with the flashes, I was still annoyed that Mirror Master almost slipped by me. I knew part of it was because I wasn't really taking him seriously, but most of it was because I had gotten used to only paying attention to my key sense when I was training with it or specifically thinking about it. Probably a bad habit I should break before I messed up with someone more threatening than a guy that used illusions to rob jewelry stores. Which meant I needed to find a way of training myself to think of key sense just like my sight or hearing including how to react to what that sense was telling me in combat. Which meant I couldn't know someone was coming to fight me or it'd defeat the purpose. Like learning to fight in the dark by waiting until your eyes adjusted and then training. I mean yeah, eventually you would learn how to do it but you'd waste so much time. And it wouldn't even train you for sudden changes like if someone turned the lights off suddenly. And I've spent way too much time thinking about that metaphor. What was worse is that I couldn't really figure out a way for any of the heroes I knew to help with that part of my training. None of them would have the free time to ambush me randomly throughout the day to make sure I was paying attention, and that was assuming that they agreed to do that in the first place. That left either villains or normal thugs. And coming up with a way to make them come to me first. Actually, that gave me an idea. Ooh, Miss Califa, this is a surprise. I hadn't expected to hear from you after losing contact for a couple years. The distorted voice of totally not, Luther said through a screen. I heard a rumor that you were joining the more heroic side. He let the question hang, clearly expecting a response. Wonder Woman agreed to train me and teach me a couple things. I shrugged. And she is okay with you searching for this kind of work? I mean, I'm not allowed to go looking for anything villainous anymore, I pouted said. But she never said anything about honest mercenary work. Kinda an oversight on her part, but I wasn't complaining. Much. I see. If her restrictions bother you that much I'm sure that we could find some alternate trainers that meet your needs. I raised an eyebrow. You can find someone as strong and skilled as Wonder Woman and an island full of Amazons. Amazonians? And just as willing to teach me as much as I want? No. Totally not, Luther said reluctantly. But I'm sure we could arrange something in the future if it comes to it. Now then, you were interested in some other work? Sure. I was looking for something where people would come to fight me. I explained. But not in a way where it's super obvious they're going to fight me. That's not really a job we could offer. Or that anyone offers as far as I'm aware. Totally not. Luther sounded perplexed. But perhaps guard detail on some merchandise that has a high likelihood of being stolen? It would fit your restriction of keeping to less, unsavory activity, and is something you have done for us before. I shrugged again. Sure, that'll work. Excellent. We will contact you in a moment once we have a job. Totally not, Luther said. Keep in mind, 
We will be expecting some cooperation on your end in the future if you want more of these special considerations. Yeah, that's fine. I could always just ignore them if they asked me to do something I didn't want to. Ooh, I had to give Luther, or the team he had that actually ran the mercenary work, some credit. They actually did manage to find a way to get me what I wanted. Usually it meant guarding some kind of crate or warehouse in really run-down areas where the local gangs were willing to try stealing whatever I was protecting despite me just hanging out in the open. On a related note, I was getting really good at dodging when someone tried shooting me in the back of the head. Of course that couldn't last forever, and after like a week, I started getting a reputation so less people tried stealing the stuff I was looking after, which meant I moved on to slightly bigger, more valuable things. Pretty sure at one point I was ambushed by the Russian mafia, though that was mostly because they tried to hit me with a Molotov cocktail and shot at me with a bunch of AK-47s. Now I was back on the west coast sitting on a crate full of chemicals in what I was sure was a triad-controlled dock, waiting to see if they were actually going to try something this time instead of just poking around and running off when I caught them looking. I was tempted to just leave and wait for them to actually try something before coming back to beat them because I had mostly gotten the hang of using my key sense but not paying attention to it and I was getting bored doing the same thing over and over again. Maybe it was time to. This is who has my men running scared? Some little girl? A heavily accented voice cut through my musing. I looked over to see a pretty short guy in a suit, walking up with two more goons at his back. Besides the scar over one eye, he looked like a lot of the triad guys I had chased off lately. Slicked back hair, super gaudy shirt opened, so you could see his chest and walked like he was being held up by one shoulder. The aviator glasses were kinda cool though. When my boys told me this stash was being watched by some kinda super I was expecting, someone like the archer, but you're just a brat, ain't ya? Um, can I help you? He nodded in an overly exaggerated way. You could move out of the way and let my boys through. Do that, and we won't have problems. Or you can try and stop us, and I'll have to rough you up. Well today had been pretty boring anyway. Counteroffer, if you can beat me, you can take whatever you want. I said as a smile started to grow on my face. I beat you. Your goons leave this stuff alone until my job's done. The guy laughed, followed by the two following him. Ho, oh, you think you can take on Tatsu, the immortal dragon, all by yourself? You've got guts, if nothing else, kid. Thanks. I replied, settling into a stance. I was pretty sure this guy was just a normal human, though. So I wasn't going to get my hopes up. Huh. Tatsu roared and rushed me. He wasn't bad. Very aggressive, but not sloppy about it. I ducked one punch and had to block another, then I had to jump over a foot sweep and catch a roundhouse punch follow up with the back of my forearm. I swapped the block to a grab and used that to pull myself close enough that I could springboard off his chest and gain some distance. He staggered a bit, but recovered easily. She stopped Tatsu's dragon rush. Unbelievable. One of the goons whispered in a way that everyone on the street heard him anyway. It doesn't matter. Tatsu has more than that up his sleeve, his friend replied. Heh, not bad, kid. You have skills. Tatsu smirked. But I have more than that up my sleeve. I sighed. Did he not hear his buddy already say that? If you say so. But now it's my turn. I kicked off the ground and ran towards his left side before sliding under a kick that would have caught me in the face. Tatsu was already moving to recover from the miss when I heard him make a sound of confusion. I grinned. He wasn't expecting me to hook his leg with my tail and use it to pull myself back to where I started. Now I was at his back and he must be thinking I had just disappeared. Up until I jumped up and kicked him in the back of the head. Anyway, boss. Tatsu's two goons cried out as he hit the pavement. Well, that was fun. I said, brushing off my hands and looking at the other gangsters. Now take him and get out of here and don't come back, kay? Shoo shoo. Heh. Celebrating your victory a little early ain't ya, brat? Boss. I'm not called the immortal dragon for nothing. Gonna take more than a love tap to take me out. I turned back to Tatsu. Actually a little impressed he was still conscious after that hit. The fact that he managed to stand up without swaying was even more amazing. Huh, you're not bad, old man. I complimented him. You gotta respect your elders, brat. Tatsu scowled. And I'm not old. I'm only 27. Really? Huh. I thought he was at least in his 30s. Enough of that, though. He continued. I think we've tested each other enough now. You ready to end it? Sure thing. 
I got back in my stance. And since you made it this far, I'll show you the new technique I just picked up. A new technique? Huh? Alright, let's see it. Both of us stared at each other, waiting for someone to make the first move. One wrong twitch could be the difference between victory and defeat. The asphalt crunched as one of the goons shifted his feet, and both of us took that as the start signal. I tensed and prepared to unleash my new technique as Tatsu fell forward to rush me, and then kept falling as a bright red boxing glove arrow cracked him across the jaw and knocked him out. I used a foot to stop the gangster from sliding into me and looked up just in time to see the two goons get caught in an electrified green bolus arrow that knocked them out too and for another two figures to drop down from one of the nearby crate towers. Yo, Khalifa. The red one called as they walked up. I heard from KF you were back in the States. What are you doing all the way out here? I looked back down to the unconscious gang member I was fighting inside. Not having a fun fight with the local triad member, apparently. What's up, Red Arrow? That's not my name. He scowled. Good. Now he was just as annoyed as I was for having my fight interrupted. I dunno. I kinda like it. His mentor commented, giving his sidekick a nudge with his elbow. It's got a good ring to it if you ever want to rebrand from Speedy. I smirked. See? Arrowman likes it. Yeah, hey. Alright, that was kind of funny. Speedy begrudgingly admitted. But seriously, why are you out here picking fights with triad members? Cause it's fun? I looked at him like he was being stupid. I mean, why else would I pick a fight with normal humans? They usually weren't all that interesting otherwise. Tisk, right. Forgot who I was talking to. And what was that supposed to mean? Whoa, whoa, calm down you two. Green Arrow interrupted before I could do more than bristle at Speedy's comment. We're still on the job here. You two can fight later if you want. Job? I asked. Yeah, someone's been smuggling some nasty chemicals lately, and we got a lead that they might be coming through the docks here. Green Arrow explained. Just need to find the right crate, he said, before walking away looking at the shipping containers as he went, Speedy following after. That's cool. Just stay away from the one marked MedTech. I called after them. Both of them stopped and turned to me. MedTech is the one we're here to investigate. Why are you saying we should stay away from that one? Speedy demanded. I shrugged. Cause I was hired to make sure no one goes through it when they shouldn't. Califa, that container could be smuggling things to make all kinds of illegal drugs. Speedy snapped. Why are you protecting it? Cause I was hired to, stupid. Okay, Speedy. Chill. This is a good thing. Green Arrow tried calming his sidekick down. Califa, right? Mind showing us the container? Are you going to go through it? Well, it'd be hard to tell if they were smuggling things otherwise. Then nope. Can't let you investigate private property without a warrant. I smirked. Speedy groaned and Green Arrow looked flabbergasted that I was stopping them. Wah. Come on, kid. We're heroes. I shrugged. Sorry, job's a job. Wonder Woman told me I needed to take pride in my work. This is because I knocked out that gang member, isn't it? Speedy questioned, dragging a hand down his face. I mean, he wasn't totally wrong. So, what's it going to be? I asked, shaking out my hands and hopping from foot to foot. You going to leave, or are we going to have some fun? The two archers shared a look and simultaneously pulled an arrow from their quivers and aimed at me. I was hoping you'd say that. Growing Pains, Chapter 29 Growing Pains, Chapter 29 You know you guys are going to need to kick it up a notch if you actually want to beat me. I taunted as I flipped over another trick arrow. Of course as soon as I said that a green arrow sparking with electricity almost hit me in the chest and only a quick twitch let me pluck it out of the air and throw it back toward the emerald archer sidekick. Stop doing that. Speedy shouted as he dove out of the way. No. I called back. In order to make the fight more interesting I decided I was only going to use their own arrows to attack. It was actually really fun because I didn't always know what was going to pop out of each arrow. So far I'd seen boxing gloves, bolus, tasers, and some sort of glue arrows, not to mention some more explosive ones. Both of them stopped using the last type pretty quickly after I managed to snag one and almost hit Green Arrow in the face with it. And then there were the trick shots. Sometimes it was something simple like an arrow curving instead of going straight, 
or ricocheting off the ground or a storage container. And then sometimes they got weird. I wasn't even talking about how they sometimes randomly shot straight up and then herded me into its path by predicting my dodges. Those failed spectacularly more times than they worked. I was talking about the times they would ricochet and arrow off three surfaces, so it was coming at me from the opposite side they shot from, and then shoot that with another arrow that had some crazy combination effects. The two-part expanding foam was particularly nasty. The stuff hardened almost instantly and looked really sticky on top of that. They were both lucky I didn't get my tail stuck in it, or I was going to hang them from a flagpole by Thier underwear. Come on, kid. You could be helping the bad guys here. Green Arrow tried again, even as he shot another arrow. I still don't see a warrant, Arrow Man. The judge is so far in everyone's pocket he golfs with the biggest crime names in the area. No way is anyone getting a warrant without tipping everyone off. Sounds like a you problem. She makes it a lot easier to kick her ass when she acts like that, huh? Speedy snarked from the side. I smirked at him. Is that what you're trying to do? Cause you suck at it. Yeah, that wiped that annoying smirk off his face. Good. He reached back for another arrow, only to come up short when it turned out he had nothing left. Guess that means our game was pretty much over. Oh well, it was fun while it lasted. Out of arrows then? Guess that means I win. Better luck next time. Or when you have a warrant, I guess. Speedy scowled harder. I can still hit you with my bow. He said, gripping the weapon like a staff and stomping forward. I was actually tempted to let him try, just to see what would happen when Green Arrow pulled him back by his shoulder. Whoa, hey, calm down, Speedy. The archer waved down his sidekick. Not that the redhead was following his suggestion. Calm down? For all we know, everything we need to prove medtech is smuggling drugs into the city is in that crate. And we're being stonewalled by a muscle-brained IDOT with a tail, he raged. Why aren't you more upset about this? Hey, I mean, if we were trying to get into that crate then, yeah, I'd be upset. Green Arrow shrugged. But, this time we're just the distraction. So it's all good. Wait, what? Wait, what? Both Speedy and I stared at the blonde-haired man with the same thought, even if Speedy was the one to actually blurt it out loud, and then my head snapped over to the shipping container I was supposed to be guarding. At some point during the fight, the door had been opened enough for someone to slip into the container. That by itself was probably enough to make me fail the job. The fact that Batman was standing next to it with a bunch of papers, and what I suspected was a sample of whatever Green Arrow thought they were smuggling? Yeah. I wasn't getting paid for this job. We were a distraction. Why didn't you tell me? Speedy demanded while I was mourning the loss of a paycheck and the trip to a Brazilian steakhouse I had planned for it. All that delicious meat. Lost because I didn't expect the goddamn Batman on the other side of the country working with another hero. Relax, Speedy. Bats was out here getting my reply on joining their little club. When I told him about the drug smuggling issue, he decided to help out. Wait, we're joining the Justice League? Green Arrow rubbed the back of his head awkwardly. I'm joining the League. We talked about it, and everyone agrees. You and your friends are a little too young for that yet. I you. I can't believe this, Speedy snapped. I'm out of here. And on that note, the hot-headed archer stormed off leaving me with the two older heroes. You should go after him, Batman suggested after he stalked over and handed Green Arrow the things he took out of the container. It's fine. He just needs some time to cool off. The archer waved it off. Besides, I need to get these to the right people if we want them to be worth anything, he said, raising the papers a bit before turning to me. Uh, we're not going to have an issue with that, are we? No, you won't. Batman said like it was a fact. And he wasn't exactly wrong. Even if I felt like taking the stuff Green Arrow had back, Batman probably had a copy somewhere anyway. Great. Green Arrow started walking away. Then I'll catch you later, Bats. Oh, and kid, try not taking jobs for the bad guys, okay? Cause the idea of fighting you for real one day is really, really scary. No promises. I quipped. Besides, I want to fight you and Speedy again sometime. I'll count this time as a draw because you got to the container so we'll settle it next time. Green Arrow shuddered. Really? really scary. He repeated and slipped between two containers leaving me alone with Batman. I'm in danger. Right. So I'm just gonna go. Follow me. I slumped forward. 
follow you. Yeah, that. Ooh. I was fully expecting a lecture about what I was doing delivered at the end of a bat glare, but to my surprise, I was quietly herded into the Batmobile instead. Ten silent minutes later, followed by probably the funniest trip through a drive through I've ever seen, we were sitting at a park bench going through a small mountain of food, and Batman still hadn't called me out on what I'd been doing. Weird. This was weird. And for some reason, I really didn't want to ask why he wasn't saying anything. So, not that I mind the food or anything, I finally cracked. But what are you doing? You've been taking security jobs on the black market, he said instead. Damn it. I mean, yeah, I kind of needed it for training, and they were legit jobs. Just, you know, through the black market, I rambled. Batman nodded once. And it's not like I could just... Califa. That one word shut me up. I'm not mad. Oh, great, oh, Ozuru. It's the I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed speech. Why? He's not my dad. You had a problem and found a solution. He continued. And you did so while respecting most of the rules Wonder Woman and I asked you to agree to. Okay. So he wasn't disappointed? Now I'm confused. You're bored. So you're looking for ways to fix that while respecting the boundaries the League decided on. That you chose to do it in a way that didn't hurt innocence and got you what you wanted shows your growth and maturity over the past few years. And now there were compliments? E -o -e -squirmed. In the future, try not to hinder other heroes. If it becomes an issue, contact me. We'll set something up. Okay. I was so freaking lost. Batman just nodded again, stood, and jumped back into the Batmobile, leaving me with a pile of food, a bigger pile of questions, and the feeling that my brain was overheating. Ooh, so you talked to her? Wonder Woman's voice asked over the hum of the Batmobile's powerful engine. I did. And you didn't say anything about her working for criminals? That seems unlike you. Batman scowled. He didn't like that Califa was working with the underworld, even through the mostly harmless gray zone security jobs. Unfortunately, the Green Lantern's info suggested young Scions would nearly always search out ways to test themselves, usually through violence, and trying to restrict those activities when they had no alternative to offer might end up pushing the girl away. The training with the Amazons had obviously done wonders for the Scions' self-control, but while most of them were still clearly more skilled than the young teen, few of them could match her in power. Too many restrictions, too many rules might have her looking at crossing a line none of the heroes wanted for her. She followed the guidelines we set when we asked her to trust us. He deflected, changing them just because she found an interpretation we didn't like and punishing her wouldn't help. I agree, Wonder Woman said unsurprisingly. I just thought you would push her to work with the heroes more. We don't have the infrastructure yet, or the time to set it up. The fact you were letting Califa run around the country while you're doing your ambassador duties, is proof of that. Besides, Batman didn't want Califa to be a hero. If she reigned in her more chaotic, childish side, she would probably be a fantastic one. But this job took a toll. He didn't want to see another child dragged into the fight against crime when they had the chance to live a more normal life. He already felt like a failure for being unable to stop Dick from dedicating his life to the fight. Not after he lost his parents to a gangster, and vowed not to let it happen to anyone else. He didn't want to push another into that hell just because she was powerful. You think it was a mistake? No, she'd have run off on her own anyway. But you think I should have done something? If possible, Batman would have liked her to assign Califa someone who could come with her on her jaunts off the island. It would give the girl someone that could keep up with her. But from what he understood, the list of Amazons that could really push Califa in strength was already small. The list of those willing to leave the island was limited to just Wonder Woman. The watchtower is going to be completed tomorrow. Will you be able to step away from your responsibilities? He changed the subject. Yes, I'll be there. Wonder Woman sighed. Truthfully, I'm a little excited to see what you've been building. It sounds incredibly impressive. She continued with a more upbeat tone. I'm also looking forward to seeing our friends in one place again. It's been a while. Uh-huh. Batman hummed as a notice beeped on his dash. I've got to go. A silent alarm just tripped on a robbery. Of course. I'll see you tomorrow then. There was a small click as the call disconnected. The Batmobile's engine roared louder as the dark night sped through the city streets. It might not be Gotham, but as long as he was nearby, 
criminals would learn they weren't beyond the reach of justice. Growing Pains, Chapter 30 It was just really uncomfortable, you know? Like I kept waiting for some super strict lecture or arguments I wouldn't be able to say anything against, but just never happened. I whispered to Birdbrain from where I was sitting. Didn't want the people nearby overhearing this. NMHMM? Robin hummed, stretching weirdly like he was trying to fly without actually leaving the ground. I mean, that's not a bad thing. I continued. I'd take being told I did a good job over getting yelled at any day of the week. But I, like, spent so much time expecting it that when it didn't happen I actually felt disappointed. Is that weird? Birdbrain kept doing his stretching thing. To the point he was actually looking down his nose at me now. Nah, I get it. You got worked up to defend yourself, and it was all for nothing. Been there before, he said, stepping closer and clearing his throat. Maybe. Still, it beats getting glared at like that guy. I looked over to where Batman was interrogating a man by hanging him one-handed over the side of a building by the man's foot and demanding answers with a really scary look on his face. I shivered. Yeah. I'd prefer awkward and confusing talks over the bat glare. Most things do. Birdbrain shrugged while staring down his nose at me. Okay, this was getting annoying. What are you doing? I finally asked. Cause it looks really weird and you're starting to freak me out. Is this some weird sickness I haven't heard about? Robin glared at me. No, stupid. Look closely. Notice anything different about me? I gave him a quick look over. Besides his weird posture, he looked exactly the same as the last time I saw him a few months ago. But obviously there was something important I was missing if he was bringing it up. You got a new cape? I guessed uncertainly. Seriously? Uh, I mean new belt? Yeah, looks much better than your old one. New haircut? That wasn't the right thing to say either because he slumped in on himself and let out a really long sigh. No you monkey-brained anyway. Since you couldn't tell on your own, I'll just have to clue you in. He straightened up and smiled in a way that immediately made me want to punch him. For your information, I'm now taller than you. Huh. I looked him over again, but it was kind of hard to judge while I was sitting down. So I got up and stood next to him. And yeah, he was now a solid inch, inch and a half taller than me now. Okay. I saw what he was doing now. That's cool, I guess. I replied lightly and tilted my head. So what? I almost ruined the whole thing by bursting into laughter at the sight of Birdbrain trying to figure out if I was being serious about not knowing what he meant, especially because he didn't really seem to know how to explain why I should be mad about it. Totally worth playing dumb for. Best part was, when he tried to explain I just raised an eyebrow and flew a couple inches higher than him, turning him into a spluttering mess and me into a cackling hyena. Flying really does make the whole, I'm taller than you, card completely worthless. An impatient cough from behind me instantly stopped that though. I turned to face Batman, who was apparently done with his interrogation and standing right behind us, and snapped to attention. I was mildly amused to see Birdbrain do the same thing next to me. I have the location. Let's go. Was all he said before turning on a heel and stalking off. Robin scampered after him while I moved a bit slower. The only reason Batman was letting me tag along was because I promised to hang back and not draw attention to myself, which was a bit boring. But on the other hand, I gotta watch him do his whole stealthy ninja thing. It was always fun learning more of that. But anyway, the whole reason for the interrogation was because Batman had heard from one of his league friends that a bunch of thieves had stolen something from an out-of-town museum. Not normally the kind of thing that would be a big deal but apparently the thing the thieves had run off with was actually a magical artifact from somewhere that could rip open dimensional portals or something. You didn't need to be a genius to figure out that letting a bunch of thieves hold on to that was a bad idea at best. Apocalyptic at worst? Literally. I didn't want some random person summoning Darkseid to Earth until I got way away stronger. Ooh. As it turned out, the thieves had holed up in a safe house of one of the local crime bosses, though safe house was stretching it a little. The place was a mansion, and they were definitely expecting trouble because I could sense guards moving all over the place. Of course none of them would be able to stop me, especially since I could just fly up to the roof or a window. Didn't seem to stop Batman much either, because he guided the two of us through their security like it almost wasn't even there. It was actually pretty neat to see because I thought it would all be about sticking to the darkest shadows and stuff, 
but he hid us in places where lights would mess up the guards' night vision, so even if they looked right at us, they couldn't see us. Between that and just generally sneaking around, it took the three of us all of five minutes to find a door and slip inside without anyone knowing we were here. And that included the 30 seconds it took Birdbrain to pick the lock. Once we were inside, it was much less about slipping around unnoticed and more about searching the mansion fast enough that no one could sound the alarm and run. According to Batman's source, there were three places the stolen artifact would probably be. Inside the main office, because the owner had a hidden safe in there, somewhere. The garage, because they could easily move their stuff if needed. Or on the thieves themselves, because they didn't trust the people they were hiding with to not just take the artifact for themselves. My bet was on that last one, but we had to search everywhere anyway. Well, Batman and Robin did. I had no clue how to go around searching for hidden treasure without just blowing the place up and hoping I found it, and randomly blowing up magical things I knew nothing about was probably a bad idea. So I just stayed out of the way while they worked while keeping an eye out for any guards coming to check the areas we were in. Sure enough, while we did find a bunch of stuff, I'm sure Batman was going to enjoy handing over to his police friends later, we didn't find the thing we were here for in the garage or office. So that meant it was up to me to find out which of the people in the mansion were the ones we were after. And turns out, wasn't that hard. All I had to do was point out each group of key signatures not obviously on patrol and check to see if they were who we were looking for. We were three groups down before I realized there was a group hiding in an area that didn't seem to have a door to it. Then it was just a matter of time before Batman found a secret entrance that let us sneak up on them without much trouble. Guys sure it's supposed to glow when you touch this? It's some ancient Greek doodad. Who knows what it's supposed to do? Yeah, for all we know it's Wonder Woman's diary. The important thing is that it's worth millions. As soon as we get a hold of our buyer, we're set for life. While the crime-fighting duo prepared to enter the room, I heard the thieves talking. So they didn't actually know what they stole? That seemed stupid. That's how you ended up getting cursed or releasing sealed-up demons. I dunno, why'd we have to pick Gotham as the handover point anyway? What's gonna happen if the Batman shows up? The nervous one said, and you sure this won't give us, like, super cancer or something? He won't show up, one of the thieves said confidently. The bat is good, but we did this out of town and kept our heads down the whole time. No one's gonna know where we are or what we have until we're long gone. And really? Super cancer? That's not a thing. I grinned at the timing because the looks on their faces when Batman walked around the corner with me and Birdbrain right behind him were priceless. You have something that doesn't belong to you. Even funnier than the we are so screwed faces all of them had were the desperate scrambles by two of the thieves to pull some kind of handgun, only for Batman and Birdbrain to knock it out of their hands immediately with one of their boomerang things. The third guy, the one holding what I assumed was the artifact, was a little smarter because he didn't move when I pointed a finger at him a tiny ball of yellow key sitting menacingly on the tip. No one's gonna know, huh? One of them muttered, rubbing his sore hand. Shut up, Perry. Sorry guys, better luck never. Birdbrain mocked. Now, you wanna give up nice and easy, or do we have to beat you up first? The smart one looked between us, his two buddies, and the artifact. Nah, you got us. Don't really feel like getting my teeth knocked out right now and tossed the artifact to me. He really was the smart one of the bunch. I caught the thing and looked it over. Thanks to all the time on Themyscira, I had a pretty good idea of what their stuff looked like, and this definitely would have fit right in. At first glance, it was a flat bronze disc with some really intricate night-themed carvings on it. Two girls standing under a tree looking up at the night sky. The use of sapphires as stars was also a pretty neat touch too, especially since they seemed to glow on their own. I guess that was what the guy was talking about. Turning it over I saw it was actually a mirror. Of course instead of glass, it looked like someone had taken a bunch of silver and pounded it really flat. Oh hey, this side was glowing tea. Robin POV. Robin's jaw dropped open as he watched the annoying scion girl who had been following them all night get swallowed up by a bright silver beam coming from the face of what was apparently an ancient Greek doom laser masquerading as a mirror. It was only when the beam dissipated and the mirror fell to the ground with a heavy thunk that he broke out of his stupor and rushed to where Califa had been standing. Absolutely nothing remained to show the girl had been there. No soot, blood, 
or even little meat chunks. The mirror was no help either. The small glow he had noticed when it was being tossed over was completely gone, and the only thing being reflected on it was the ceiling. Califa was just gone. Robin hesitantly reached out to touch the mirror, only for the iron-handed grip of his mentor to hold him back. He almost wanted to argue, but one glance at the absolutely intense glare on Brew, Batman's face made the boy wonder keep quiet. Batman gave him an almost imperceptible nod and turned his attention to the three thieves they had cornered. Three thieves that suddenly looked like they wanted to be anywhere else. I want answers. The Dark Knight growled. Talk. Growing Pains. Chapter 31. I blinked as I looked around at my surroundings. One second I was in a hidden safe room with three random thieves, Batman and Birdbrain. Then I get hit in the face with some magic beam out of an old mirror and now I'm somewhere else entirely. Which meant I was either teleported somewhere by a magic mirror, or I was now very dead. Not a whole lot of afterlives that looked like a random forest, I think. So I was going to guess teleported until proven otherwise. Now it was a question of where. I flew straight up to get a better look around, and all I could say was I was definitely in a forest. No real landmarks. Or ones that meant anything to me. No signs of roads or highways, and no mountains as far as I could see. Nothing I could sense either, just some normal wildlife doing normal animal things, like the flock of crows coming right for me. I narrowed my eyes at that. Crows didn't have a reason to come bother me in the middle of the sky. They also weren't the size of small dogs and they usually didn't have glowing red eyes and jagged beaks. I don't think those things were crows. One of them shot forward faster than its friends and tried to swipe me with its claws. I replied by blasting it in the face with a key beam. I think its friends didn't like that, because instead of turning and flying away I found myself getting swarmed by the things. Cut it out. I yelped as one of the birds pulled at my hair while another tried to peck me in the eye. Seriously, you flying idiots, stop? A third bird tried to hit me in the stomach. I punched it in the face. The dumb thing exploded into a cloud of black feathers, but I felt a sharp pain on my hand right after. Huh, I was bleeding. Note to self, don't punch them in the beak. It's really sharp. The good news was that as long as I didn't help them out, the crows were only strong enough to give me some shallow scratches. The bad news was those scratches still hurt. And no matter what I did, blasting them to ash, hitting them hard enough to practically explode, or grabbing them and physically tearing them in half. The crows weren't getting the message to just go away. And now there seemed to be more of them somehow. One more chance to leave, stupid birds, or I'm going to. I had to jerk my head to the side to avoid one of the faster crows, but I still felt three new scratches open up right underneath my left eye. Yeah, I had had enough of these winged pests. You asked for it. I pulled a bunch of my key in the center of my chest, and let it explode out in a single big bang. It didn't matter if there were a bunch of them flying around making it hard to hit one if I just hit all of them. Even better. It worked. The sphere of yellow key winked out and not even a single one of those crow things was left behind. My key sense even confirmed it. No more freaky crow things in the sky. In fact there wasn't anything else besides the one signature rapidly getting closer to me ah. Uh, crap. Something strong. Fast and cyanoid tackled me out of the air and used me as a plow for a few hundred feet on the ground below. I was rattled enough that when a hand grabbed me by the front of my shirt and pulled me out of the dirt, I just stared blankly at my attacker. Shockingly enough, it was an Amazon. I spent enough time on Themyscira to recognize the different clothing they wore. And the girl on top of me was definitely wearing one of their training outfits. Even more shocking, she looked like a younger Wonder Woman. And angry. She also looked very angry. Do you have any idea of how long I waited for you? I waited years, Diana, and you left me here alone. She bellowed in my face before realizing the person she was grabbing wasn't the one she expected. Wait, you're not Diana. Who are you? Really pissed off. I growled in response and did the only rational thing to do in a situation like this. I punched her really hard in the face. The Amazon went flying backwards and through several trees while I pulled myself out of the trench I was in. A quick aura flare knocked most of the dirt off of me, and then I was flying after my attacker. I had to admit, she could take a hit. Even after going through a dozen trees, she was ready for my follow-up and deflected my follow-up punch like a pro. She deflected the next one too and threw a punch of her own. 
I ducked under it and kicked at her head. This time she blocked it, but made the mistake of using the ground to brace herself. The ground cratered underneath her, and she grunted at the effort of fully stopping me from hitting her in the face. She threw another punch, but I surprised her by going even lower, a key ball glowing in my hands. It wasn't a Kamehameha, but the bright yellow beam sent the angry Amazon flying through the air again. It also blew up a good swath of the forest, but that wasn't my fault. It also didn't really do much to my opponent much to my surprise. Like 90% of the Amazons back on the island would at least be a little scuffed up after a hit like that, but she was perfectly fine. A grin broke out on my face. I started this fight pissed off because I got cheap shoated after dealing with those damn birds, but now it looked like I was going to be able to really cut loose against someone who could take it. My aura flared again as I stopped suppressing my key and got ready for a serious fight. Though I should probably introduce missile. Wait, is that a tree? The broken trunk of one of the many trees around us hit me in the chest like a battering ram. It didn't really hurt thanks to the increased key I had running through my body, but the angry Amazon definitely returned the favor of sending me crashing through a few trees of my own before I hit a boulder and stopped dead. Angry Amazon was there in a flash and immediately threw another punch. I caught it in an X-guard and despite my powered-up state, I could feel the bones in my arm grinding from the force of the hit. You done holding back? Angry Amazon asked, less angrily than before. Only if you are. I shot back, mostly rhetorically, because that last hit was definitely going to bruise at least. You haven't seen anything yet? A kick caught me underneath my guard and blasted me though the rock I had my back to. Angry Amazon was back on top of me in half a second, but she overextended and I managed to grapple her before slamming her face first into the ground. She responded with a savage elbow strike that caught me in the teeth and split my lip. I wasn't going to let her get away with that and immediately headbutt her in the face, bloodying her nose. Our fight kept going like that. One of us would get a good shot in and the other would make them pay for it. But those shots were getting fewer and further between as we figured out the other's fighting style. Soon it was just us beating on the other's defenses, hoping to slip something through the wall of blocks, deflections, counterattacks, and dodges. Either that, or one of us would grab a tree to use as a disposable bat real quick. We might be a little rough on the landscape. If Batman or Wonder Woman were here, I was sure to have gotten a pretty long lecture about collateral damage, but they weren't, so it was fine. A while later, I had lost track of time after the third time I was thrown through a rock. Both of us were standing apart from each other on an empty field that looked like it had been a bomb test site instead of a forest, panting and trying to not let the blood and sweat dripping into our eyes break the staring contest we had going on right now. Neither one of us tried to trash talk the other. We were too busy trying not to fall over for that. And honestly, probably the most fun fight I've had ever. Even more than the one I had with hockey because this was against someone who wasn't over a decade older than I was, wasn't relying on some tool or trick, and she could keep up. I felt it deep in my cracked and maybe broken ribs. The next hit would be the decider. Neither of us had anything left. Unlike the dozens of other times we charged each other, the ground didn't collapse under our feet. It didn't crack as we planted a foot and threw one. Last. Punch. I saw stars as angry Amazon's fist hit my face first, her longer arms giving her an advantage. Call it pride, stubbornness, or just being too stupid to quit. I fought to keep conscious as I forced my way past her fist just to return the favor. Her head snapped violently to the side just like mine did, and then we were both on the ground. Everything started going gray, but I couldn't pass out yet. Had one thing I needed to do first. Pulling myself onto my knees felt like someone dropped a mountain on my back. My arms were shaking as they did their noodly best to not let me face plant back onto the ground and I wanted to just stay there for a second, that or just collapse. But I pushed myself up more. One foot shifted forward and I almost fell over, but once again I fought until I was half standing over angry Amazon who was also struggling to stand. E, e vui, e viherk. Koef, koef. I tried to say before I choked on something wet and broke out into coughs. It cost me too, because by the time I stopped I was back on the ground looking up at angry Amazon who had managed to get to her feet in the meantime. I why dash in, she said as smugly as she could with her face being a beaten mess, and immediately passed out and fell forward, right on top of me. So, heavy. 
Growing Pains, Chapter 32 So who are you anyway? Angry Amazon asked once we had both woken up, bandaged ourselves, and settled around a small fire. It felt nice to be warm even if I really wanted something softer than a broken tree to lean against. My everything still felt bruised. Califa, I'm a scion from planet Vegeta. A what from where? All right, ancient Amazon trapped in a mirror long enough that she managed to confuse me for Wonder Woman. Good thing I had experience explaining this to the more secluded Amazons on Themyscira. So you're from beyond the stars then? Angry Amazon said in a suitably odd voice. Which was wrong but close enough I wasn't going to correct her. Yep. Wow. I beat a warrior from the stars. I bet Diana's never done something like that before. She mused, and I was instantly pissed at her again. She didn't beat me. She just won round one. Oh. I'm Donna of Troy, by the way, she added, almost as an afterthought, which wasn't all that surprising to be honest. I was expecting something like that when I saw a younger-looking Wonder Woman, and Donna Troy was known for being her younger sister-slash-clone-slash-playmate. Made sense she was who she was, even if it didn't explain how she still looked like a teenager when Wonder Woman was an adult and had been one for decades. Yet, Donna thought it had only been years. Thoughts for later. I needed to put someone back in their place right now. Wonder Woman helped fight off an alien invasion two years ago. Pretty sure she fought a bunch of aliens before then too. I said smugly, only for Donna to just look confused. Who's Wonder Woman? Right, totally out of touch Amazon. That's Diana's superhero name. A bunch of soldiers started calling her that during the last big war Earth had, and she kept it. She's world famous now. Wait, Diana left the island? She was in a war? When did that happen? I sighed. This was going to take a while. Ooh. A few hours later, I finally had Donna mostly up to speed about things outside Themyscira, even if I didn't go super into detail about most things. She could look them up herself later if she wanted. Although during my little history story time, we did find out something pretty weird. The time difference between where we were and the outside world was all kinds of messed up. Oh. And I also found out I was sucked into some sort of pocket dimension inside the mirror instead of being teleported or something similar. Not the important part. According to Donna, there shouldn't have been any difference between the two, or the mirror dimension should have been a bit faster. Which did put a bit of urgency on getting out of here because if years passed outside while I was stuck in a mirror, I would miss so many things. Invasions, new heroes, team-ups, global takeover plots, I wouldn't be there for any of them. So priority one, figure out how to get out of here. Which raised another problem. There is no way out from the inside. Did you think I'd have waited here for years alone if there was a way out? There has to be something. I demanded. Wonder Woman apparently left and came back. So how did she do it? I don't know. She would just vanish from her bedroom and appear randomly. Well then I know where to start looking. Ooh, see? Nothing here. Donna said grumpily as she leaned against one of the less destroyed parts of the room. And holy cow was the room trashed. I don't think there were more than like two things in it that hadn't been smashed or thrown against a wall. There has to be something. I argued. It doesn't make sense that this is the only room Wonder Woman could leave through and there not be something special about it. Yeah? Well, you're wrong. I've looked this room over hundreds of times. There's nothing in here. Well, that wasn't good. I was kind of banking on a secret portal under the floor or something, but I guess it wasn't going to be that easy. I wasn't giving up just yet though. Okay, you were right. There's nothing here. How big is this place anyway? Any spots you weren't allowed to go or couldn't reach? Hopefully comic book logic applied here, and there'd be a way out somewhere else. Diana said it's about half the size of Themyscira, and no not really. I've looked over every part of the island, except for the inside of the monster den. I perked up. Monster Dean? That sounded super suspicious, and definitely the kind of place someone would hide a portal out of the mirror if they didn't want it to be found. And even if it wasn't, it sounded like an adventure by itself. It was still kinda odd Donna hadn't been inside though. Why not go inside? You had to have wanted to look or been curious at some point. She glared at a piece of rubble. Of course I wanted to, but it's where all of the monsters Diana and I were supposed to train against come from. Both of us working together couldn't get all the way inside. Once she abandoned me in here, there was no way I could do it by myself. Oof. 
not touching that. Well, I'm here now, so let's go check it out. Between the two of us, we should be able to blow through all of them. Donna's glower faded a bit. We probably could. I've gotten past the point Diana and I got stuck at by myself a while ago. But what if there's still no way out? But what if there is? I pointed out. Worst case, we go and beat up a bunch of monsters and keep looking. Sounds awesome to me. I didn't really need an excuse to have fun fighting a bunch of monsters. She gave me an amused glance. You're pretty easy to please, aren't you? Ich grin daher. Yep. Cool adventures, good fights, and great food and I'm a happy scion. She snorted and pushed off the wall. Well, the good news is you'll get a bit of the first two here, but not much of the last one. No real food except what someone from the outside brings in though, unless you want to try eating monsters, and they taste like crap. Don't actually need to eat though which makes it bearable. I stared at her in horror. Screw having fun fighting a bunch of monsters. I want it out of here ASAP even more now. This was definitely some kind of hell dimension. Ooh. There wasn't too much to say while we flew towards the entrance of the monster Din Donna had talked about. It was a short flight and the sights weren't all that interesting. We did run into another flock of murder birds, but neither of us really felt like dealing with them. So I ended up just blasting them with key attacks before they could get close. So then it was just me, my new Amazon friend, and a ruined temple-looking thing with a hole in the ground. Well, more of a staircase, but still. So this is it? Donna nodded. Yep, apparently it's based off the labyrinth of Crete. I wouldn't know. Diana said we'd go explore the real one someday, but we saw how that turned out. She finished darkly. I sighed like I did every time she got like this. Like I told you, the mirror wasn't even on Themyscira anymore. It was stolen by some normal thieves after being who knows where. You don't know if Wonder Woman left you alone on purpose. And that wasn't including the more out there situations like the mirror being from another dimension or something like that. The universe could be a weird place. I existed after all. Wait, no, that came out wrong. I wasn't weird for existing. If we actually do find a way out of here, maybe we'll find out. Donna groused, ignorant of the self-inflicted mental blow I gave myself. But I don't want to talk about her right now. Then why did you bring her up? Let's just focus on getting through this. What are we getting through then? I asked, hopping lightly from foot to foot. I wanted to get going already. Mostly a simple maze. But occasionally there are larger rooms with an opponent we will need to defeat to move forward. If it gets too challenging, we will have to run back through the rooms we already cleared, and new monsters will appear in those eventually. So it was like a video game dungeon. That was neat. Are there hidden traps and chests filled with treasure too? Donna snorted. No? Why would there be? This was a training tool for Diana to practice fighting against monsters. Not some kind of death trap or game. Although she did mention that there was some sort of prize at the end of the labyrinth, but we never found out what it was. That sounded about right. Mel would occasionally give me training like that, where I'd earn the right to own or wear something at the end. Like the time she and a bunch of her friends shot arrows at me, I was only allowed to block with a pair of bracers without moving from a tiny circle. I think it was more an excuse to shoot at me than actual training, but I was allowed to wear a pair of bracers like the rest of the Amazons afterwards. I even got a pair of my own as a gift. I just didn't wear them because they felt weird. Right. Well, let's get going. And then the two of us went down the staircase. Donna didn't seem impressed or excited, which made sense if she'd been down here a lot. But I was looking all over the place and nearly vibrating with excitement. How could I not? It was a fantasy dungeon filled with mythological creatures specifically placed here to help train a young Wonder Woman. I couldn't wait to see what we went up against first. And luckily for me, I didn't have to. Since this wasn't some kind of magical shifting maze, Donna already knew the way forward, and we were outside the first challenge room in minutes. The doors opened and I rushed inside. On the other side were two cyanid figures with furry legs, hooves, and horns poking out of their heads. I recognized those. Satyrs. In my excitement I skipped asking Donna which one of us would be going first and shot forward. Neither one moved much beyond tracking me as I rushed to one side. A yellow key orb appearing in my palm. I stopped once I was far enough to the side that one of them would be forced to move around its partner and pointed my hand at them. The satyr closest to me hunched down in preparation to tank my attack as I fired off a key blast. 
The satyr brought its arms up to block and was instantly vaporized by the simple attack. So was the one behind it. Eh? Donna snorted behind me. The labyrinth was designed for training me and Diana when we were little children. Did you really think that there would be something strong in the first room? Oh, I guess that made sense. Growing Pains, Chapter 33 Trekking through an underground maze filled with monsters trying to kill me was incredibly boring when the monsters died from a random key attack. I mean, it was really cool to see a bunch of different monsters. But it was kind of like expecting to go to the zoo and just walking to different rooms and seeing a model instead. Completely underwhelming and disappointing. Hey, what would happen if I blasted through the floor? Would that speed this up? I asked Donna after another room was easily cleared. The Amazon paused on her way to the other side of the room and scratched at her cheek in thought. I don't actually know. She said eventually. We never considered not just going through the maze. Time to find out then. You might want to stand back a bit. I warned Donna before cupping my hands and focusing. Kayamiyami. Hayami Haraya. Light pooled and burst forward, slamming into the smooth sandstone and drilling straight through. It didn't stay that way though. The further my key beam drilled, the slower it did so. The walls getting tougher and tougher until my attack couldn't push through anymore. Key pooled at the end, building up until it lost cohesion and exploding violently enough I could hear it from where I was. I broke out into a self-satisfied smile at the newly created shortcut even as I cut power to my attack. I didn't cut through the entire labyrinth, but at least we could get to the fun stuff instead of wasting our time on these weaklings now. That worked pretty well. I chirped and started pulling a dazed Donna along by the wrist. Come on, let's go see what's waiting for us. I think I heard something roaring down below. Ayuag, what if the roof collapsed on us? There's a limit to being reckless, you damn monkey. Oh hey, Donna's using the same insult as Birdbrain now. I bet they'd get along pretty well when I introduced them after we got out of here. Honestly, Robin would need the help. His skill at bantering was pretty weak. Ooh, great Hera, that's a manticore. Oh cool, are those tough? They're nearly legends. Only the greatest heroes and demigods lived after encountering one. So they were supposedly really tough. Finally, we might get something interesting to fight. So do you want to go first, or should I? Because I've been hogging all the fights even if they kinda sucked until now. I admit it. Donna looked at me like I was crazy. Go first? Califa, this is a manticore. We'll need to work together to even have a shot at winning. Between the claws and poisonous barbs a single mistake could be disastrous, and we'll probably still have more monsters ahead of us as well. I scowled but she was right. It just wasn't any fun, but then most Amazons trained and worked in teams. Science just preferred to take turns. Stupid poison, making things less fun. Oh well, I'd just demand a spar later to make up for it. Fine. You go left, I'll go re-dash. I was cut off when the manticore decided to remind me talking wasn't a free action and slammed me to the ground. I instinctually caught a clawed limb from tearing open my face and was surprised when I had to put more effort in so it didn't casually overpower me. Strong. Dangerous too. Finally, something exciting. Donna shoulder-checked the manticore into a wall hard enough to crack the stone before either of us could really put any effort into our struggle and knocked the creature back into the room it was supposed to be guarding. You okay? I smiled. Never better. Good because it's coming back for more. Watch out for the tail. It can shoot venomous barbs. Also good to know. Now that it was clear I wasn't just going to blow through this one in a single attack, I took a second to actually look at the monster we were fighting. Big fangs and claws were kind of a given for a monster, and the feline body, draconic wings, and weird scorpion tail covered in a bunch of spines were all good touches, but it was the eyes that got me excited. There was something hungry behind those eyes. This was an opponent that wanted to fight us. Well, we were going to give it one. Donna was the first to fly forward. The manticore roared at her and took a swipe. She ducked under the first paw and caught the second before landing a bone-rattling uppercut on the beast's jaw. Despite that, the monster didn't go flying. It was just forced onto its hind legs for a bit, until Donna punched it in the face again. And again, and again, and again. Despite the assault, the manticore didn't seem all that injured after it managed to swat the Amazon out of the way with a forepaw. 
It did seem mad though, and looked ready to lunge after her. So I did the reasonable thing and blasted it in the face with a key beam. What? Donna said we needed to work together. It didn't even do all that much. The manticore slammed into the walls and stayed pinned there for a few moments while the beam sputtered out. Besides a small burn mark I noticed when it picked itself up and roared, there wasn't even a scratch. Okay, time to take this up a notch. The manticore spun around and a dozen or so spines shot at me. Remembering Donna's warning about poison I flew up over them rather than risk even a tiny cut screwing me over. But the manticore apparently was counting on that because I looked up to see it hovering above me on leathery wings, already clawing towards my head. On instinct I reached out and managed to grab its furry wrist, using that as a lever to pull myself over the swipe and kick the manticore in the head. It was an awesome move, and I'd totally claim I did it on purpose if someone asked. Unfortunately, it didn't do much either. The manticore's head snapped to the side and that was it. So I punched it again. This time I pushed it back just in time for Donna to come screaming in for a big hit of her own. We kind of devolved into a big three-way aerial fur ball at that point, each of us punching, kicking, and clawing at our opponent without the space or time to really put our full strength into any one blow. I ducked around a clawed kick and got a solid hit into the creature's ribs just as Donna punched it across the face. The manticore grunted from both hits but swung its body around to keep momentum. More spikes shot out of its tail and went for my Amazonian partner. I almost panicked and blasted both her and them out of the air, but she kept her head and quickly deflected all of them with her gauntlets. Seeing she was safe, I flared my key higher and slammed into the manticore. This time the manticore was knocked across the room, but once again it seemed fine. This isn't working, I said, during a brief pause in the fight. We keep hitting it, but I don't think we're doing any damage. She glanced at me, and then back to the manticore which was slowly circling us now that we had all figured out just rushing each other was pretty pointless. You're right. We've both hit it hard enough that we should have done something but I don't see any damage. It's like it's impervious to blunt force. Well that's not good. Most of our attacks were blunt force. Any ideas then? We could backtrack and see if one of the previous challenge rooms has a weapon we could steal. Donna proposed. Diana, and I used to do that when we were younger. I gave the still-circling manticore a look. You think this guy would let us wander back through the maze and not follow us? Probably not. If it's like the other monsters, it would try to keep chasing us until we left the labyrinth. She admitted. You have any ideas? Hit it harder? No, that was stupid. Blunt force wasn't working so more blunt force wasn't the answer. We needed to either use a different type of attack or figure out how to target a weak spot. Burying it or strangulation might work. I vaguely remembered Hercules did that to a few of the monsters he fought, but the issue was that the walls were too tough to easily break and our monster had a tail that would wreck us in a moment if we tried to brute force it. Have one person strangle it while the other held off the tail? No, that was too risky. One mistake and the person strangling the manticore would be skewered. Stab it with a keyblade? Possible but I didn't have the best control of that technique yet. I was more likely to burn it rather than stab through its skin. Wait, burn it. I glanced at the manticore's face where the mark from my key blast was still visible, so I could hurt it. Now it was a question of how to exploit that enough to win. Okay, I have an idea. I told her and explained my plan. To say she was thrilled would be, are you absolutely insane? It could work. A complete lie. It could also lose me my hands or my life. I shrugged. She wasn't wrong there. Yeah, but you have any other plans besides run away and hope for the best? She glared at me. No, but this doesn't work. I'm going to kick your butt again. Again for the first time. You mean? I scoffed. And it'll work. I'm like 70% sure it will. S70%? A and go. I flared my key and left a sputtering Donna behind as I shot forward. We needed to catch the manticore off guard if my plan was going to work. That meant luring it into a false sense of confidence we were just going to try beating it to death or just giving it a concussion. Personally, I was fine with either solution. The manticore roared and lunged to meet me, a small shockwave appearing where my forearm clashed against its wrist and the both of us attempted to overpower the other for a bit. I thought I was winning that but it turned out to be a trap when the manticore twisted in a way that made me shoot past it 
and almost get impaled by its tail. I managed to dodge at the last moment, but I actually felt the spines pass through my hair. Too close. A hind leg still caught me in the chest though, and I found myself bouncing off the floor and slamming into a wall not long after. A brief check reassured me that I hadn't been disemboweled by the kick, but my clothes had definitely seen better days by this point. The four new long scratches over my torso were shallow, but still bled enough that it would be a pain to get out. Which sucked because these had been a gift and were really comfy. I'd need to start wearing my armor again. I shook my head to clear my thoughts. I must have hit my head harder than I thought if I was thinking about clothes in the middle of a fight. I glanced over to where Donna was now tangling with the manticore on the ground. I wasn't exactly sure how she managed to force the monster out of the air, but it would make the next part of the plan easier, so good job. Leaving the Amazon to her fight, I started preparing on my end. We'd only had one chance to surprise it, so I had to make it count. Funny enough, Donna was actually doing better now that the both of them weren't flying. She seemed a lot more comfortable getting close and grappling than the constant maneuvering and surging flying combat needed. If the mana core wasn't tough enough that we simply couldn't beat it into submission, I'd have given her pretty good odds she could have beaten it by herself. But as neat as it was to watch my Amazon buddy fight, I was focused and waiting for my opening. I didn't have to wait long. Eventually Donna managed to twist the manticore around enough that she was relatively safe from the poisonous tail and the monster's claws. With no other options the manticore fell back on its one remaining weapon. It tried to bite her. And that was exactly what we were waiting for. Donna immediately dropped everything to shove her hands into the manticore's mouth and forced it open as wide as she could. The beast definitely didn't like that because it tried backing off, but the Amazon held it in place. Califa now? I didn't need her to tell me. As soon as I saw her make her move, I launched forward as fast as I could. The key I had been building without allowing to escape was dumped into the fastest and sloppiest Kamehameha I'd ever done. If it wasn't for the fact I was less than two inches in front of my target, I think the key would have just exploded randomly before I could force it into a beam. But my target was right in front of me, so while I shouted out the name of the technique, I focused on pouring as much power as I could where I needed it to go, right down the throat of the manticore. Neither the manticore or my key really liked that. The manticore for obvious reasons, but my key because it was being constantly compressed in the stomach of the manticore with nowhere to go and I was only adding more. Something had to give, and given that I had actually burned the monster with a basic key blast I was betting the manticore would be first. Its body actually swelled and warped from the amount of energy I was pouring down its throat before it warped and popped like a particularly gruesome piñata. Luckily my key finally managed to burn away the gross bits so most of the manticore was vaporized in a flash of blue light before they got everywhere. Wii U. I let out a big sigh as I collapsed on my, but next to Donna who did the same. That was fun. Can't wait to see what else we get to fight now. Donna gave me a look before barking out a laugh. You're crazy. We just beat a manticore and you already want to fight again? She laughed some more and then gave me a friendly tap on the shoulder. But you know what? That was fun. I forgot how nice it was to fight with a friend by your side. Let's rest for a bit and then continue on. I smiled back at her. We were friends now. She even admitted it. 